printing up uh, an updated speakers list and uh, we'll call to order shortly. Give me one second. Okay, we've got it. Thank you for your patience. Um, we've got a number of items today, and so uh, we'll have a bit of a back and forth, obviously. And uh, okay, let's call this meeting to order. Uh, this is the February 17th, 2021 edition of the Community and Public Services Committee. Um, we'll now do roll call. And uh, I am present. Councillor Zadek. Here. I see you there. Looking very sunshiny. Councillor yep. Matt. Good morning. Good morning. In your chair. Councillor Nickel. Good morning. Good morning. Your image is small, but your presence is large. Okay, so um, Chair uh, Don here just joining you this morning as well. Uh, I see we've got Councillor Iverson, or we've got Mayor Iverson on on deck. No, no, Councillor uh, Iverson is fine. Councillor Iverson uh, may also make an appearance at some point. Uh, we'll, we'll see where the where the tide takes us. Um, I see we've also got Councillor Henderson. Good morning. He's very shy this morning. Okay. And um, I'm just looking through to see if we've got any other councillors joining us. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Councillor McKean. Okay. Hey, good morning to you, Councillor McKean. And I see we've got uh, Councillor Hamilton as well with us. Good morning. Good morning. And looking through my magic mirror, I also see Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Good morning. And I believe that's it. If, I'm, if I've missed anyone's name, please uh, feel free to shout it out. We want to acknowledge you. Okay. So, um, before we begin, I just want to uh, offer a land acknowledgement. And this is right out of our reports from today. It says, uh, the City of Edmonton acknowledges the traditional land on which we reside today that is in Treaty 6 territory. We would like to thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as, and I'm not going to get these pronunciations right without practice, um, the Cree, the Soto, the Nakota Sioux, and the Blackfoot peoples. And uh, the names that I'm re uh, referencing are their own names, which I can give a shot at. The Dene, the Anishinaabe, Nakota Iska, the Nitsitapi, and the, ne the Nehau. And uh, we also acknowledge this as the Métis homeland and the home of the largest communities of Inuit south of the 60th parallel. It is a welcoming place for all peoples who come from around the world to share Edmonton as a home. Together, we call upon all our collective honored traditions and spirits to work in building a great city for today and future generations. Okay. So now uh, we'll move to adoption of the agenda. And uh, this would be a good time to fire up your, your e-scribe if you got it. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I don't see and, any uh, Approval of the minutes. Uh, you might want to vote on that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let's vote on the adoption of the agenda. Uh, I just assume that we're all friendly here. But we need this for record keeping. Uh, Mr. Chair, while, while eScribe is uh, being reset for my password so I can access it, I'll be voting verbally right now. So I'm a yes. Fair enough. We have all the we votes. Have all the okay, please display the vote. 
And that is unanimous. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? Yes, I'll move that we approve the minutes from the February 3rd, 2021 Community and Public Services Committee meeting. Okay, thank you. Now, before we move on to selecting items for debate, uh, I will ask if there are any Mr. protocol Mr. items. Just to vote. So oh, we should vote on the minutes. That's right. We'll get there, folks. Uh, please vote. I'm a yes, Mr. Chair. I take things on the Yes. Thank you. That's all the votes. Okay. Display the vote, please. And that is unanimous. Okay. Now, uh, I don't believe there are any protocol items, but um, I do think that uh, I've heard that we've got an administration statement on the extreme weather protocols, uh, a bit of an update, if you will. And so um, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. So Chair. On, a, on a point of order, it, it would be administration responding verbally to the inquiry. So I think, I think the inquiry needs to be made, um, and then they can respond verbally to it. Okay. That is not how I understood it, but if uh, that's the way we want to go, I uh, have no objections. Um, then we will actually... Uh, We'll move then, uh, perhaps we, let's see, how do we do this in correct order? You know what, let's just keep going. We'll get to that when we get to it. Let's select items for debate, please. Anyone? Oh, go ahead, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll select items uh, six. Uh, let me just make sure we have got all our speakers. So six one, six two, six three. Uh, I'll leave that for Councillor Nickel, who made the inquiry. Um, uh, six seven, seven uh, six eight, and six eleven. Oh, and I actually also need to select item six ten. Uh, I can't click on, Mr. Chairman, uh, so I'll take 6.6 six and 7.1 as they are to be dealt together. Okay, sounds good. Any other takers? Andrew, you got the noise one? Uh, yes, I did. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. So... That is fair enough. Well, uh, I clicked on. Um, oh, go ahead, Councillor Henderson. I, I can't select, but I'm. Um, I, I think the Arts Council have very few touch points with us, and I think they would probably like. I think the six, uh, the six five is important, but I think they would like to present on six four just to bring everybody up to date on the connections and exchanges. I'll select uh, six five for Councillor Henderson. Oh, six four. Oh, sorry, 6-4. Six, 6-5 six, is the grants. It's fine. It's 6-4. I think they were really looking forward to being able to present. Okay. 6-4 for Councillor Henderson. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chair, but a really quick point of privilege. Did 6-2 get selected? I just want to make sure. It did. Thank you so much. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'm happy to move all other items. Thank you. The items have been moved. Please vote. Uh, yes. Okay. One moment, the vote's coming your way. Okay. We're just missing Mayor Iveson. Sorry, the vote dialogue hasn't come up, so verbally, yes. Thank you. That's all the votes. Okay. Please display the vote. And that is unanimous. Carried. So I will now ask for a motion on all other items that were not selected for debate. 
Uh, th that was the motion, I think, Mr. Chair. That was the motion. I am sorry, not selected for debate. That that was that was my motion that I oh. believe we just voted on. Oh, I got you. All right, thank you. Okay, so if the clerk would be so kind as to read back what uh, has just been passed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This morning, Community and Public Services Committee have passed the following items without debate. Item 6.5, 2021 Investments in Organization, Sustain. And Item 6.9, Bylaw 19573 to amend Bylaw 18970 to expand the mandate of the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. Okay, thank you very much. Moving forward, ever forward. Uh, at this point, we now have... Uh, some requests to speak, and it's quite a lengthy list. I don't know if anyone else has got it. If not, I will be happy to move it. Hearing nothing. Okay, this is gonna be a list. So hang on to your hats. So um, I will move that the Community and Public Services Committee hear from the following speakers and panels when appropriate. On item 6.1, City of Edmonton Indigenous Framework, we've got Elder Tom Snow, Elder Joanne Saddleback, Elder Jerry Saddleback, Elder Heather Poitras from Indigenous Services Canada, Danita Large from Braided Journeys at uh, the ECSD, uh, Julie Babiak, Indigenous Framework, Donna Niebush, Emily Riddle from EPL, Chrissy Hodgins from EPL, Don Marie Marchand, Kyra Brown from the IRO Framework Committee, Andrea Levy or Levy from EPS, and uh, Matthew Wood. On item 6.2, we've got uh, for Indigenous housing, Aaron Barner from Métis Nation of Alberta, Dave Ward from Niganan Housing Ventures, Bob Black, and Stevenson from Right at Home Housing Society. Item 6.3, on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls National Inquiry, we've got April Eve Weiberg from the Stolen Sisters and Brothers Action Movement, and Rochelle Venn from the Institute for Advancement of Aboriginal Women. On item 6.7, Vehicle Noise Enforcement Pilot Program, results and next steps, we have Bruce Clark, uh, residents of the Grand and Green Cooperative, Pamela Heichel, Mark Wilson, and David Jenkinson. For item 6.8 on traffic bylaw changes, um, bicycle safety passing protocols, we've got Aaron Schooler from the Alberta Cycling Coalition, Andrew Ritchie, Paths for People, Christopher Chan, Bike Edmonton, Jaden uh, Baudouin. And on item 611, bylaw 91 or 19553, amendments to prohibit the feeding of wildlife, additional options. We've got Alan Picard, uh, Darcia Wasara Broland, Lasha Krejci and Julia Galeli and Charles Richmond, or Charlie as is preferred. And please vote on hearing from those speakers in the appropriate order. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, yes. Okay. And just Mayor Iveson, please. Yes. That's all. Please. Oh, go ahead. If the votes are in, please display the vote. And that is carried unanimously. So we will now move on to a uh, request for time specific on the agenda. But uh, um, do, we need, do we need to vote on that if we've already voted on yeah, the item? I think we do, right? Yes. There's a number of, of time specifics on the agenda that have already been set by Agenda Review Committee, but there is a request for item 6.11 to be made time specific for the second item of business that committee could consider. Okay, so there is a, a request on 6.11 to be time specific as the second item of business. My feeling is that the first item may take us the entire morning. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I was going to move and, and we'll seek guidance of other members of committee, but maybe making that the second item of business at 1.30 since the Art Council's item has no speakers and I expect that would be fairly quick and that would give the speakers more certainty as to when their item would be, be coming up. So I'll move that, that we make it second item at 1.30 unless there's 
concerns from particularly Councillor Hamilton, who I think. Okay. Um, well, those are, yeah. I think that would work. Are there any objections to that? Well, I guess we should vote. We might as well just vote on that. Go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'm a yes. Just, just as a point of clarity. Yep. Uh, it's second item at one. Okay. Yeah. The motion's been updated. Thank you. Yeah. So just to, uh, for those who can't see it, it's a uh, second item at one thirty. So we would proceed with the first item at one thirty, and then, uh, however long that takes, the next item then would be, if, uh, the amendments to bylaw 19553. So please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. And that is carried unanimously. Okay. So I believe we do have uh, an inquiry. It's not a councillor inquiry, but it is a, a mayoral inquiry. I think it's a council inquiry, but we don't need to. Split hairs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, On committee. <laughs> Go ahead. Following the recent cold snap, uh, social media footage has surfaced showing Edmonton police service officers moving vulnerable citizens off city of Edmonton property, including a downtown LRT station, out into extreme cold and unsafe conditions. During these extreme weather conditions, we have procedures that are to be followed to ensure all Edmontonians, including our most vulnerable, are kept safe. And it would appear that these were not followed during these instances. So, uh, would administration please provide information summarizing our extreme weather protocols, including how city employees, including EPS officers, are expected to work with Edmontonians experiencing homelessness and other situations that put them at risk in the cold weather, how these protocols were followed during this recent extreme cold snap, and if there were instances of them not being followed, and how we work with our partners, including EPS and shelters, to communicate the policy, including when and how it will be enacted. All right. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, as a matter of uh, streamlining uh, the agenda, I do believe that uh, at this point we do have an administration statement on extreme weather protocol uh, update item and extraordinary a uh, moment uh, due to extraordinary circumstances. So, uh, administration, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. We do have a prepared verbal statement addressing the events of this past weekend from both the uh, city administration and from Edmonton Police Service. We'll start with Edmonton Police Service. I'll now pass it over to uh, Mr. Enenya Okir, uh, who is the Acting Chief Administrative Officer, uh, Community Safety and Wellbeing Bureau. So pass it over to, to uh, EPS and they can have the first uh, first presentation. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, with me, I actually have um, Acting Chief uh, Al Murphy here, who's going to be reading this statement. So um, we'll start with our statement. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. This past weekend, the Edmonton Police Service escorted members of the homeless community out of a central LRT station into the extreme cold. We should have arranged transportation or helped in accessing the services our partnering agencies have in place to keep our most vulnerable safe and warm. We must do better, and for this we are sorry. There is a public complaint in this matter. Professional Standards Branch has opened an investigation. Incidents like this cause us to reflect and review our processes and our actions. We will be working with our City of Edmonton colleagues to ensure there is a clear understanding of the extreme weather protocols and our mutual responsibilities. This information will be communicated across the service to all our members. This week, we met with various community members and listened to the impacts of our actions. We are committed to doing better for our citizens and delivering the services they expect with compassion and empathy. Thanks very much. And now some comments from uh, city administration. Um, as city administration, 
we certainly share the significant disappointment that so many are feeling today. The pandemic has been very difficult for people experiencing homelessness, and the cold weather multiplies the challenges they face. We certainly do applaud the efforts of Bear Clan, other volunteer-based or outreach initiatives, and the Edmontonians who support them in helping to meet people's needs in these trying times. The situation that unfolded over the weekend at an LRT station is not reflective of our community's values, nor the tireless efforts of many social agencies, Homer Trust, city staff, and the Edmonton Police Service who came together in response to this extreme weather. Collectively, these partners mobilized transportation, essential services, security, and warm shelter space for hundreds of Edmontonians every night over the past two weeks. Winter emergency buses staffed with outreach workers and peace officers ran overnight loops across the north and south sides of the city. Shelters around the city, including the temporary accommodations at Commonwealth Stadium and the Edmonton Convention Center, expanded their capacity. Professionally trained staff provided round-the-clock support to those in need. And our most vulnerable were protected with safe, clean, and secure spaces with food, service, and proper COVID-19 protocols in place. At all times during this activation, there was room in the shelter system for all who sought access to it. An LRT station is no longer used as part of this activation. In our efforts to improve the extreme weather response, we learned that these facilities are certainly not designed to support this kind of service. LRT stations are cold, they are uncomfortable, and they're certainly not designed for sleeping. They do not meet any definition of an acceptable place to use for overnight shelter. We know that the better solution is to instead use transit to ensure that transportation is not a barrier to accessing proper facilities with proper appropriate staffing, resources, protocols, and supports in place. However, we also realize some individuals still seek temporary respite from the cold at these transit centers. While peace officers provided support to outreach workers on emergency winter buses transporting people to shelters across the city, fewer staff were available on the nights in question to cover their other duties. The Edmonton Police Service stepped up and responded to our request for help patrolling transit stations and pedways where social disorder has been steadily increasing over recent weeks. The incident with members of the Bear Clan this past weekend makes it clear that a critically important opportunity exists to clarify our own policies regarding what activities are permitted in city facilities, including transit centers. We will use the mistakes that were made this past weekend as an opportunity to once again improve our collective response. We will start by creating a joint standard operating procedure with EPS that outlines our approach to ensuring the safety of all Edmontonians who access transit stations. The SOP will stress the importance of compassion and, and care in communicating rules and finding solutions while being mindful of the necessary role played by the broader social system in meeting the needs of people experiencing homelessness. Developing this, stan this joint standard operating procedure is currently underway. Administration will also continue its work with Homer Trust and the Government of Alberta to stress the importance of ensuring low barrier shelter options are available to meet people's needs when and where they need it, and the value of housing as a solution that addresses the root cause of many issues, including this one. And finally, this unfortunate incident has shown just how important it is that we continue to improve how we work with our community partners the Government of Alberta and with the Edmonton Police Service to improve the services we provide to all Edmontonians. Thank you and turn it back to the Chair. Thank you for that and when we get to the uh, appropriate items for discussion I believe there will likely be a few questions around that so thank you very much and we do have the uh, Council inquiry on the books. So. We have uh, nothing to share. 
Oh, sorry, if, if I might, uh, just uh, um, Mr. Smythe um, on timing. Yeah. Uh, Good Mayor, idea. Um, we've talked internally um, six weeks. I think we would require six weeks. We talked to police and and we think that's a reasonable time frame to respond back to the motions you've just provided. Okay, that's faster than the normal 12 weeks, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And understanding that the public uh, for six weeks may sound like a long time, but uh, that is definitely an accelerated schedule. So items four and five uh, are not pertinent to our meeting today, so we'll move on. Uh, we now have our first item of the day. Item 6.1, City of Edmonton Indigenous Framework. I understand there is a slide deck. And so we will uh, turn that over to administration and then we will hear from speakers. And Mr. Chair, if I may, we have had one additional speaker. If before we start the item, we could get a motion to add them. Okay. Um, does anyone want to make that motion? And the name is Ron Walker, please. I'll move that. Thank you. Please vote. Yes. 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 The vote screen's coming. We can add your verbal votes. I'm also a yes. There it is. There's the vote screen. And we have all the votes, thank you. Thank you, display the vote, unanimous, all right. Thank you. Uh, administration, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Tunse, a wash day, a titu. Greetings and good morning. Uh, this morning, this will be a bit of a, a team presentation. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here this morning to share the City of Edmonton's Indigenous Framework. The framework as we present it today is a testament to many years of working to understand our relationships and responsibilities as a city and treaty people. By accepting this report for information, you are launching this framework for the City of Edmonton to adopt and to implement. Once it is safe to do so, we will have a ceremony and celebration of this framework and the work behind it. This framework is intended to answer the question, how can the City of Edmonton best support and build strong relationships with Indigenous peoples in Edmonton? This framework is a living document representing our formal and informal relationships with elders, knowledge keepers, Indigenous youth, as well as partners, institutional and agency partners. It also includes the wealth information shared from research and many discussions with municipal and community leaders and members, service providers and academic professionals. I'd like to acknowledge our elders, youth partners, who have gathered with us this morning. Without your guidance and input, this framework would not have been possible. I recently had the privilege of attending along with the executive leadership team and our elders to review the Indigenous framework. There was incredible passion in the room for creating the relationships to fully activate the framework and commitment to a partnership that will make life in Edmonton more equitable and fulfilling. This is the beginning of a journey of discovery, learning and adapting. This is the beginning uh, for this administration that will take an ongoing engagement and empathy and with the framework to guide us, we are ready to build a community in which Indigenous people can see themselves reflected in our spaces, places and programs. I'll now ask Ms. Owen to make some comments. It's now my honour to underscore the land acknowledgement that Councillor Paquette has already made at the onset of this committee meeting. We reference this land acknowledgement at the beginning of our city meetings, not only as a sign of deep respect, but also as a sincere thank you. We are all privileged and honoured to be living in this very special and sacred place, a place which has millennia of history 
and a long-standing welcoming spirit. When I came here in 1984 from the UK, I was welcomed with open arms by every Canadian I came across. And I think they learned that tradition of warmth from the first peoples who welcomed their ancestors to this remarkable piece of geography. As Mr. Kobold mentioned, I have been fortunate to be a part of the ELT discussions with a number of elders, and I have been struck by how much laughter there is when we connect. It has reminded me that while reconciliation is serious work and critical to a healthier city, it can also be infused with joy, learning from one another, being vulnerable, laughing together, leading with heart. That has been and will continue to be a real pleasure. One of the critical lessons that the city received from Indigenous elders along this journey has been the importance of seeking their guidance and their wisdom. When this initiative began, we applied a conventional corporate approach to our planning, as you might expect. But it quickly became evident that we needed to find a balance between following established city processes and applying an indig indigenous approach to this work. In the spirit of applying indigenous approaches, we worked with experts at the U of A, including Dr. Lana Whiskeyjack, who is here with us today. Over to you, Doc Dr. Whiskeyjack. Hi, hi. Dante Kakia Nawagamaganak. Lana Whiskeyjack Natsigasan, Onyx Kopone Kotsinia. Maskwati Oskaigan is where I created my home for my family and I work at the University of Alberta as an assistant professor. I give great gratitude to be here today on this beautiful land that our ancestors signed treaty to share. And I'm grateful to the many servient leaders and support who moved the Indigenous framework to value the guidance of our beloved elders and restore spirit in building and strengthening relations within our ceremonial ways. My esteemed colleague, Dr. Faye Fletcher, and I were invited by the Indigenous Framework team to give guidance and support in moving the Indigenous Framework with an Indigenous ways of knowing and being. I was also one of the four artists who joined the community gather, gatherings, visually responding to the city as witness. I give great gratitude to the lessons of this critical work. As an Iseño Otaski, a human of this land, I have always heard Arquitea our wise, precious knowledge keepers, elders, and leaders say in Nehiawewin, the Cree language, that the land, the languages of this land, that our language is spirit and our words are medicine. And our words carry powerful, lasting impacts of the present and future. This framework grounded in ceremony, language, and the spirit of Kitayayak and Isiniwak, the peoples of this land, is vitally important to one to correct the past wrongs from internal and external racism that have had traumatic lasting impacts on the way Asiniwak have been treated and viewed within our city, and two, to return to the original intentions of the treaty from an Asiniwak worldview, to be a whole human being and sharing and helping one another, abiding by the laws of this land, such as truth, sharing, kindness, and courage, and to build and strengthen Wakotwin, kinship systems, to value one another as relatives, to treat each other as you would your grandparents, your grandchildren, and your little siblings. It made me incredibly grateful to be part of this Edmonton commitment as the team members walked with good intentions, offering protocols to the many Indigenous community organizations, then offering protocol to each of the highly valued elders who sat in circle, generously sharing, reminding, and following with action the beautiful ways and teachings of this land. A name was gifted to this framework in ceremony led by Tom Snow and Teresa Cardinal. This name, Wahichichobi, gave spirit to the framework, animating it with life that must be nurtured and supported to grow and evolve the intention and visions of our Indigenous community and the city of Edmonton. This work began with spirit, igniting the spirit fires of all those involved through our sacred ceremonies, which we don't take for granted of this land so that our Siniwak may also create healthy, warm, loving homes for their families and strengthen our Edmonton community. Hi, hi. Hi, 
Hi, hi, Lana. Thank you very much uh, for working with us and coming with us on this journey together of building good relations with the first peoples of this land. Um, and good morning, everyone. My name is Jamie Miller. I'm the director of the Indigenous Relations Office here at the City of Edmonton. Um, I am Métis through my father's family uh, from Hastings Lake, Alberta, and St. Albert, and of course, I'm Esquatewaska again as well. And so I'm very humbled uh, to be with you today um, to share this Indigenous framework. As part of our uh, development process of building this framework, um, as Lana eloquently um, laid out for us, we needed to create an ethical space for engagement. Traditionally, uh, community decision-making models, Indigenous community decision-making models, are based on the circle process, where everybody has a voice, everyone has gifts to bring to the circle, and that we respect that process of sharing. We focus on consensus building, sharing leadership, and sharing responsibility. And I think, to me, that is the biggest teaching from the elders, is that our relationships also come with our responsibilities to each other as kin. And so we worked closely with elders and knowledge keepers, with youth, um, they're the center of our circle, and we protect them, and they guide us in what our community needs. We also, of course, work closely with our community partners. Um, the city can't act alone in any of this work, and we need to develop those partnerships and those respectful relations with each other to make a difference in people's lives. As Lana shared, our work was guided in ceremony. Uh, Tom Snow and Teresa Cardinal lifted their pipes for us, and Tom shared with us the word wahigi chichobi, or kinship, uh, from the Nakoda language. We also know about wakotoin as well from the Nehio language, um, where we talk about our relationships and our responsibilities, not only to our immediate family, but to all of our family members, all of those people in our community, as well as the plants, the animals, Mother Earth, all of the things that we are in relationship with. And so in that spirit, we try to work with as many partners and stakeholders and people in the community as that we could, because we know that making a difference in people's lives is going to take a collective lift. And so in this timeline you see before you here, um, we held elders gatherings, youth gatherings, um, as well as community engagement gatherings um, over the last while. So why do we need an Indigenous framework? Or why are we trying to change the hearts and minds of 13,000 City of Edmonton staff? Well, I think we have to ask ourselves, why is reconciliation important? Why do this work? And I can tell you about the statistics. I can tell you about issues that we've seen in our community, such as this weekend. I can. Um, give you all kinds of data, I guess, that demonstrate that Indigenous peoples have struggled because of colonization, because of historic trauma, the experience of residential schools in the 60s scoop, poverty, violence, all of these things. But I don't want to focus on those things. I want to focus on the strength and the resilience of the community and that when community is empowered to make a difference in their lives, in the families and the children's lives, it results in better outcomes for everybody. And so I am really committed to working in partnership with Indigenous peoples in this city to make things better in our city, to make it a safe city, a welcoming city, a city where everybody can walk down the street and feel that this is their home. Because I've heard directly from Indigenous peoples, and particularly youth, that that doesn't always feel good here in Edmonton. We also know that there's been some transformational things happening in Canadian society over the last while. The Tr Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry, as well as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so all of these things have coalesced and to me it means that the time is right for the City of Edmonton to reconnect to building positive and respectful relations with Indigenous Peoples. And so when we get into the Indigenous framework, you will see that we outline uh, some general principles, four roles, and seven commitments. And these four roles 
uh, have gone through many different iterations. Um, as you saw from the timeline slide, we had many different sessions where we sat and talked with people one-on-one, -on -one, where we gathered with elders, youth, community members, and the four roles are really were shaped through all of those conversations. And so I'd like to share with you now um, the four roles that we're asking city staff to consider and to take on in their everyday work as city employees. <coughs> So the first role is that of a listener. We listen with open hearts and minds when Indigenous people share their stories and experiences. Being a listener is the first step. It's opening your heart, opening your mind, being quiet and listening, listening to people's truth. A connector, we connect Indigenous peoples to the programs, services, people and resources that enrich the community and foster relationships to create positive change. We know that the city of Edmonton can't do everything. And so we work closely with our community partners, the orders of government, indigenous nations, to provide those services, those programs, and those supports that our people need in Edmonton. Partner, we work in partnership with indigenous peoples on initiatives to improve the physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional well-being of indigenous peoples in Edmonton. Again, the best solutions come from community. They know what's needed, and so we work in partnership together to address these things. And of course, advocate. We stand with Indigenous peoples to create a safe and inclusive city where everybody is treated with dignity and respect. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much for uh, honoring us today. My name is Ian Howitt, and I've had the distinct honor and privilege to co-lead with Jamie on this very important work. Jamie introduced you to the four roles, um, we've also created seven commitments to bring these four roles to life. This work is about changing individuals and the system. The seven commitments are intended to shape the entire organization, programs, services, policies, culture. Each City of Edmonton department will be responsible for creating and implementing an action plan detailing how it will fulfill each of the following corporate-wide commitments. I'm going to spend a few minutes now going over each of these commitments in turn. First, Support the journey of reconciliation by applying the truth and reconciliation calls to action, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls calls for justice, and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a foundation for this Indigenous framework. Two, in partnership with organizations, businesses, academic institutions, other orders of government, and individual citizens, eliminate the systemic racism and discrimination that Indigenous peoples face in Edmonton. Next, identify and implement ways to make city spaces and buildings welcoming and safe for Indigenous peoples and ensure they can see themselves reflected in the city's spaces and places. Number four, support all city staff to build relationships that honour the framework's four roles within their interactions with Indigenous peoples and increase staff's knowledge of Indigenous cultures, traditions and worldviews through education and learning opportunities. Five, Host and participate in events where the City of Edmonton, including Council, senior leadership, and all levels of administration, and Indigenous peoples, can build relationships and celebrate our journey together. Next, identify and remove the systemic barriers that exist for Indigenous peoples in gaining employment with the City of Edmonton, and create career development opportunities for Indigenous employees. And lastly, Ensure Indigenous peoples and city staff are informed and engaged, when appropriate, on actions the City of Edmonton takes in relation to the Indigenous framework. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Smythe. Thanks again. So what does this mean to me as a city employee? As a city, we've been on this journey for a number of years, starting to rebuild trust and understanding. This framework, as has been said, is a starting place. It's really a call to action for all 13,000 of us as public servants at the, at the municipal level to create an integrated corporate-wide understanding of not only what our relationship with Indigenous community needs to look like, but importantly, how we need to demonstrate our accountability. Our actions need to match our desire for reconciliation. The presenters this morning, Andre, Katrin, Lana, Jamie, and Ian, each spoke to the wisdom and guidance we received from elders during the creation of the framework. 
And as both Andre and Catherine have said, members of ELT, as members of ELT, we had the privilege to gather virtually with elders and to be granted time to hear and reflect on their teachings. A bit of personal reflection. This is a journey of both learning and action for all of us who work for the city. From my personal journey, one teaching of the elders that I found very profound is the notion of two-eyed seeing. This is a concept from Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall, where we view our environment and our community from both the indigenous ways of knowing and seeing and through a Western way of knowing and seeing. So my learning journey, I try to think about my work differently and bring a two-eyed seeing approach to everything I do. I'm certainly not there yet. I found this way of knowing and seeing to be a very meaningful gift from the elders. So what we re refer to now as action teams will bring the framework to life through the creation and implementation of department-specific and corporate-wide action plans that activate each of the seven commitments that Ian reviewed. This work will also be supported by a corporate steering committee, which will work with the project sponsors to coordinate the overall corporate-wide implementation of the framework and to align knowledge, resources, and actions accordingly. While I certainly don't have time uh, today to list off all of the names of the folks pictured here, I do want to draw attention to the assembly of faces on the slide. Pictured here are some of the members of our department action teams and project team who are already, who are already starting to live the roles and commitments of the framework. It's critical that we start to show up as allies so that our colleagues and the community know that this work isn't happening behind closed doors. It's worth repeating, our actions need to match our desire for reconciliation. We're not here today to pat ourselves on the back. Today is really just a critical milestone of the journey. I'll pass it back to the city manager to close. Thank you, Rob. So what, what is next? First, each department team will continue to develop their action plans and begin the work on year one priorities. It's very important to me as city manager and to the leadership team that we want to see this framework put into action. And so that's why we're focusing on these action plans immediately. The city will host a gathering, an annual gathering with community partners, Indigenous youth and elders. This will be an opportunity to check in with the Indigenous community members to talk about our collective successes or problems and where improvements in the relationship can be made. We, we want to be keep ourselves honest in this and we want to keep it very genuine. And we'll return to Council in 2022 with an update on the progress. This framework represents the evolution of a long-standing relationship the City of Edmonton has with Indigenous peoples. Implementing what we see as an improved approach will take a united effort amongst our department level teams, the Corporate Steering Committee and our Executive Leadership Team. And for those City employees who may be listening in, I want to emphasize that it's going to be the responsibility of every employee to fulfill the four roles and seven commitments of this framework and so we're going to be talking about what that means a lot here in the city. This is the beginning of a career-long journey for all of us as we continue, continuously learn how to become better listeners, better connectors, advocates and partners. We are pleased to present this framework for Council's review and are committed to the call for action and accountability that entails and the long journey we have ahead. We would be happy to take your questions. Hi, hi. Thank you very much, everyone, for that incredible body of work and the presentation. Um, we will now hear from speakers on this item uh, in, a, in a panel. So um, before I read out the panel, I just want to uh, give you a little bit of a um, primer if you've never been here before. So each speaker will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer. However, those attendees participating virtually, which I believe is everyone, may wish to use a timer at home so you don't get cut off at an, an opportune moment. 
when you were when you were finished speaking, please stay at your seat or online uh, so that because committee may actually have some questions to ask of you. So for those uh, participating virtually, again, all of you, please refrain from using the chat function in Google Meet during the meeting. Additionally, remember to mute your microphone when you are not presenting or answering questions. We may hear some embarrassing domestic comments. Um, at this point, I believe we can just move on to our speaker panel. And let me just pull up the names. Uh, and we will begin with Elder Tom Snow. Hello. These are the greetings in the language of the uh, signatories to Treaty 6. Nakoda, uh, Cree, or Niheo, Dende, and Soro. I think which is Anishinaabe. I am... Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen members of city council and staff and uh, my fellow members of the Edmonton Framework Committee. Um, Tom Snow uh, is my registered name. My actual name is Tatangagan, which loses translation is like, uh, like buffalo, uh, like a buffalo or elusive buffalo or something like that. I'm a Lakota Sioux from Morley, Alberta, west of Calgary. And I'm a member of the uh, uh, Nakoda Sioux living along the eastern slopes of the Rockies and in this area. The term Wahigi Chichobi, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, it's my responsibility here. And so I'll just talk about it with some, uh, with a story and then a little bit of an explanation. And uh, Wahigi Chichobi translated means kinship. It is a medicine. It is one of our primary foundations of our spiritual, social, political, and relationship structures. So as a story, when I was being registered for the residential school, there was an argument between my sister and my father as to what my full name was. The reason for this was that up to that point in my life, I was known in my kinship term. I was a son, other son, nephew, younger brother in male or female, and older brother, male or female term, cousin, other father, and uncle by that, by that age. I was also referred to in other endearment terms as well. This starts while the baby is still in the womb. Shortly after birth, a personal song is made and with kinship term by your mother, or close relation that makes you associate with this person in a loving relationship. When a person sings that song as a baby, it brings you joy and you start dancing or wiggling or jumping depending on your age. My name was rarely spoken and when it was spoken it was usually in a third person with more distant relatives. What this did was it included me together with all my extended family and the community, and there was an automatic inclusion to the family and community instantly. From this came acceptance, belonging, love, nurturing, a responsibility, and a position in the community. It is a way of drawing people close to each other, to get used to each other. Spiritually, it teaches how to show respect for everything. It creates a peaceful pecking order, order per se. It unites people in a sense of camaraderie. When you address somebody by name, you have actually distanced them. It is a way of being kind and courteous to each other. It is to induce positive relationships. What this does is it creates allyship. This is what I think is what we're after in Wahiji Tobi, the Edmonton Framework Endeavor. This would set a structure for us to move forward for a better understanding of each other. With this in mind, we need to learn our, our true history as indigenous peoples and settlers and come to terms with all that has happened. 
It is a way to move forward like an extended family system where we practice inclusion, understanding, human rights and justice, etc. Thanks for listening. I am honored to be here. I'm also humbled to be part of this process. I'm grateful that this is happening. Thank you. Have a great day. Hi, hey, thank you. Uh, we will now move on to Elder Joanne Saddleback. You have five minutes. Machie, Joanne Saddleback. Ogisugo Squell, Nitsiga Sun. I want to tell you that we are very happy to be with you this morning. We've been working on the Indigenous framework, trying to contribute as much as we can for not months now or weeks now, but it's been years now that we've been working with the city of Edmonton. And I want to mention especially uh, Jamie Miller. She is uh, sincere, hardworking, and I doubt if we could have gotten to this place if it weren't for her hard work and that of uh, Emily Skinner. I also wanted to especially mention Chrissy, Chrissy Hodgins and uh, Emily Riddle at the Edmonton Public Library. They are my co-workers and uh, they helped to make the Indigenous space there happen. I also wanted to talk about when last week I was doing a, an interview with the uh, Alberta Art Gallery and the, the artist that I was in a discussion with online. He, uh, he's non-Indigenous, but he was doing an artwork about the territory of, of Treaty 6, delving into the past of it and looking some of the history. And uh, he asked me a question. He said, how do we build that trust? What is it in that kinship relationship? How do we build that? Especially when we're first meeting each other, and it goes with your, your first uh, principle of, of, of listening. And it was, I trust the protocol you give. So many people, they, they don't understand what culture is. Culture is not a product. It is a process. And when you're listening, that means that one of us is talking. And there is a protocol that's involved. I mean, I know that we have a different definition of what protocol is, but for us, protocol is when you are offering that tobacco, when you are offering those gifts that open those doors wide. And what protocol does, it's not about the elder that you're listening to. It's about you. What are you prepared to give as protocol? Because that protocol is medicine. It opens up your mind and your heart so vast that when an elder is speaking, you can not only conceptualize what that elder is saying, you can believe what that elder is saying. So it opens you up and you begin to understand that perspective that we're talking about. You begin to accept, and that's what our old people talk about. What do they want from governments? They want acknowledgement and they want respect. That's what they want. So in this, what Jamie refers to as, we have to be feeding the fire on a constant basis. And she's talking about that protocol. And I know for me, when I was talking, when I was thinking about what is it that solidifies this partnership between the city and the community? And I've been hearing for the past 20 years that the city was going to give over some land. It was Fox Farms at first, and that elders were going to be sort of in trust of it. Then I heard that there was this cultural center, sort of all-encompassing cultural center. And I, I don't know where those things are at, but that's something huge that feeds that fire for a long time, that allows us that place, the one thing that in indigenous people in urban centers need so much is that place to access, to practice their culture, to access elders, to be able to be part of that listening, that listening principle. 
that's what we talked about as well when we were working with your managers, when we've been working with the uh, Indigenous Affairs Office, that this building of listening, it's not only about reconciliation, but it's also about the truth. And the truth is going to take a long time to come out because the more comfortable we feel with you, the more we're going to talk about that truth that exists. And then the more we begin to trust you, the more you can trust us that we are telling you the truth, that we are serious about, about this partnership. Because in that kinship, we understand that we immediately are already related. Our old people call non-Indigenous people cousins, that you are our cousins. So we are immediately related to one another. All we have to do is get to know each other a little bit more. So when you're when you're thinking more about possibly that, that center, that cultural center, we don't think of it, uh, our old people, we don't think about it as uh, an organization running it. We see it as a community running something like this. It's also, a sorry? It's a Nishigos, thank you. Hi, hi. Your time is up. <laughs> and uh, in continuing my my trend of pretending that we don't all know each other. Uh, we'll now move to J older Jerry Saddleback. Thank you very much. <clears throat> in the, as far as this, uh, we're, we're talking in terms, our old people often tell us that uh, you have to sometimes announce the source where you're getting your source of information from due to the, the very uh, nature of uh, orality or oral tradition uh, with us. Uh, with the Plains Cree people, which are, I'm from the Plains Cree, there's two main societies within the Plains Cree society. There's one society within that called the Uitamagoso Society. Uitamagoso Society are the ones that uh, believe that uh, spirits come, spiritual beings come in and talk to them, either through their dark lodges, your black lodges, your shaking tents, and different lodges that they have, but the belief is that the spirits come and tell them these uh, things. And then there's another society they call Anskats Ugenungo Atsimuneok. Those are uh, the, the carriers of the intergenerational carriers of that long story as, the, as what we term today as the history of creation story. Now, this is the uh, uh, area that I've been... Uh, born into that uh, history of creation story. I, I was raised in that society. So whenever I, I speak, I'll be talking in terms from that society. It's uh, uh, how they've maintained, despite of, in spite of all of these things we talk about, that colonization, what have you, that uh, we, due to the stable systems of oral, the many stable systems of oral tradition, we are able to maintain it up to the, mind you, it dwindled in number, but we maintained uh, this oral tradition and what it is today, what it stands, how it stands today. So it's with that, uh, I'd, I'd like to say to you that uh, I'm really grateful to work with you, all of you. And then the understanding when they say, you know, of working together with, with us, uh, it, it's uh, one of the things there is in the treaty itself when the the smoking of that pipe, it's in peace. And uh, when they smoked that pipe, it was in peaceful coexistence together to live in peace and in coexistence together. That's how they smoked that pipe. And, and the very essence of that meaning, the old people uh, talk about some of the, the, the principles behind it. One of the principles behind it, of course, is uh, the, the principle of reciprocity, of how, you know, you you uh, maintain the distinctive beauty nature of your nation, but at the same time you're uh, you're uh, you know agreeing to have a, a reciprocal arrangement from nation to nation in a very equal uh, setting, uh, equal nation to nation, equal to each other, not one nation over the other nation kind of thing. So, but that's part of our society and uh, our societal philosophy that stemmed prior to the, the treaty itself. Being a nomadic people, we were we had a statesman of it within each uh, circular autonomous encampment that were, was able to uh, journey, make journeys uh, throughout this island of uh, North Central America.
in South America, one island. And so we were also created right here, the belief system that we have from our history of creation story from this island. And so we, it's by that, from that, the old people, they tell us that when we, uh, we traveled as when the, our statesmen and uh, the people within the circle and encampment traveled, some of the things they seen it in establishing a single principle of peace that uh, that existed. One single principle was, "Hey, the Creator made everything perfect. Let's leave it as is." And as a nomadic nation, we seen it uh, firsthand by seeing all the tribes, uh, the nations of people, they're absolute one with nature and their ecosystems. So that's what uh, we are. Uh, you know, we uh, we believed in. So that's part of our, uh, you know, the, when we turn, when we say getting along with people from nation to nation, those are some of the things that 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 hit me, like the, the pre-treaty uh, concept of how we associated with each other and, and during the time of the treaty, and then now today that we're struggling with that, you know, to to come to grips with the actual nation to nation understanding of what that meant back in 1876 and prior to that. So with that, I just wanted to say I appreciate uh, uh, you listening to me in that manner. And, uh, and so one of the main concerns, of course, is the language with ours. We're always wanting to find systems in place, how we can, that's one of our stable stabilizers as far as our oral tradition, that if we could get, uh, you know, not buy our language back from you, but, uh, but uh, maintain our language have the assistance to be able to do that and help. Thank you. I really appreciate your uh, lending me your ears today and have a good day. God bless you, all of you. Hi, hi. Thank you. I lend my ears so much that they're starting to not work, but I'll get by. All right. Uh, we will now go to uh, Elder Heather Plotris. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I want to uh, thank the Creator for another day. I want to thank and acknowledge all the elders that have been part of this process. Even from many years ago, a lot of our elders that have passed away. I'm getting emotional because one of them included my uh, late father, Homer Patra. And seeing the place that needed to be more welcoming for Indigenous people, seeing the importance of having a home for the homeless people and inclusion for the youth. My dad was always about the youth. Our youth today are being left behind. They need to feel that they're part of something. They need to have access to education and it's not traditional education they need. Part of those commitments to having access to the culture. When I first started my career with the federal government going, it's gonna be 27 years now. And I guess that's why they're calling me an elder. I'm just old. Um, <laughs> the reality is when I first started there, there wasn't much in the way of a representation for indigenous people. And as a young person that hurt me because growing up with culture with both the First Nation and Métis, I'm really blessed and I acknowledge that. So I spoke from the heart. I would get dreams and visions and I would go to the elders and ask for guidance and help so I was very fortunate to help set up a cultural center in Canada Place. And from there, that developed a lot of relationships with all levels of government. And it was the city that came to me and asked me for help with National Aboriginal Day. At one point, I helped organize events at the legislature grounds for eight years on top of my other jobs. And it's just a commitment I have for my people to make sure we have a place, to make sure we're represented in a good way with culture. So having those sacred sites where our people can go have ceremony is so important. Just like Elder Joanne talked about. And to have this concept of five minutes when our elders are speaking, that's right there is not listening. That's disrespect. These elders are needed to be heard. That's where our knowledge is. Our youth need to be involved. That's where our future is. That concept of having more Indigenous employees hired. I work on national campaigns within the federal government on so many issues I'm asked to be part of. And each time I pray to the Creator, give me guidance to say what I need to say, to help me to make a difference for my people. 
those teachings we have of how I walk, how I talk, how I think, and how I treat others, all the while speaking my truth. Reconciliation is more about learning the truth first, the true history of Canada. That's so important. I provided awareness to your communication staff in the past. I'm more than willing to help with whatever, and that's part of why I'm here today, is that this relationship that I created on my own, with my own efforts, providing awareness, providing connections to community. Many groups come and use our ceremonial room to have pipe ceremony, because there's nowhere else they can have it in the city. And we're at this time and place where we have all this talk, all these things, all these agreements, all these papers that say they're going to improve things. Well, let's do it now. There should be five sacred sites in the city in all the directions so that elders can go there and have pipe. That's what needs to be done. Our connection to the land, our relationship to those ceremonies. People live in fear. Change is hard. But look at today where we're at with technology. Our youth should be given that opportunity to learn this technology. They can help us with these meetings. Your own structures, your own laws, your own meeting here today is evident that you don't even know those rules of passing minutes of what's supposed to be done next. So having more structure, even being how you are with your own orders, will be able to walk the talk together. These rules are man-made and we can change them. We're here today to do that, to let you know as Indigenous people, this is the time. And I speak like this to ministers, to deputy ministers, to ADMs, you name it. When I'm asked to give my opinion or to share what I think, that's what I do. And I learned that from my parents and the ancestry I have from my dad's side, from Big Bear. My own grandfather was one of the first counselors for Sawridge. So being a leader, a natural leader, I don't take it for granted. Given the gift of voice, I don't take it for granted. My truest intention in our prayers is for the next seven generations. I look at my granddaughter who was a gift given to us after my own son was murdered. She has brought love and light to my home. And I just think about what she's going to go through. The racism, the hardships, the difficulties in school, in programs, even at post-secondary levels, to have to endure that. I don't want to have to go through that with my granddaughter, that hurt and pain, that disgust of how people can be so cruel, so mean. My beautiful daughter's being harassed, just trying to walk down the street. The assumption that our women are nothing, worthless, and yet our teachings are from the matriarch, from the woman, from the female power. That balance has to be given back to the females if we really want to truly make change. So I want to acknowledge my spirit name, Standing White Buffalo Girl, and that when I'm asked to be part of things or if I'm encouraged to speak, sometimes I wonder, why me? But again, I just pray on it. So I acknowledge all the community members that are on this call, the elders, all the people that I know personally, that together our voice will help make change. And I've been part of it for a long time and, you know, Creator willing, I'll be here for a long time because I want it to be a better place for our people. When it's a better place for our people, it'll make it better for all citizens, all Canadians, all humans, because we're all part of that circle, that all of us have a place, all of us have gifts, all of us have things we can contribute. So again, my offer there as one person and the work that I do, whatever I can do to help, I'm here and I, I will do all that I can. And again, I give thanks to the Crater and for all that's being done to this point. It's exciting, and I look forward to what we can do together. Aye, aye. Aye, hey, aye. Hey. Thank you. Well said. We'll now move to Donita Large. Donita Large and Estigasan. I am the First Nations Métis Inuit grad coach for the Braided Journeys program at Archbishop O'Leary High School for the Edmonton Catholic School District. I'm honored to speak on behalf of our program and students today. When the Indigenous framework began, Braided Journeys leadership students from across the city were invited to join the initiative to represent the more than 500 Indigenous high school students enrolled in our program. Braided Journeys 
has had the benefit of engaging the City of Edmonton representatives for a number of projects, including Indigenous youth internships, which provided placements in various city departments, and student-facilitated blanket exercise for city staff. As a part of the development for the Indigenous framework, Braided Journey's youth represented, participated in the pipe ceremony, a youth and elder gathering in Rundle Park, provided note-taking for an elder session, and attended a virtual framework youth engagement session. The Indigenous framework has demonstrated a city that cares about the opinions, perspectives, and voices of our Indigenous youth. During the engagement sessions, students share their experience accessing city services, such as transportation, recreational facilities, libraries, and interacting with city staff. The youth felt empowered to participate in the positive experiences provided by the Indigenous framework sessions. During these experiences, the youth shared heartfelt stories of what it is like for them to be young Indigenous Edmontonians. They talked about frightening experiences while using public transportation. They talked about close encounters with danger while walking home from work at night. They talked about the shame and anger they felt when they were targeted for carting, and they talked about being fear just for walking together in a group. The youth shared some of the inner dialogue and fears that challenged their sense of identity and confidence to navigate all that the city has to offer. The students were honored to have the opportunity to provide their voices to the framework as they shared about their desire to educate others on their perspective. As future leaders, they saw their input as helping to create solutions to future problems and create more understanding of their lived experience. The students have felt that it is important to continue to create opportunities for our Indigenous youth. The youth identify that it has helped them gain professional skills and independence, has helped them feel at ease in spaces where they would have otherwise felt unwelcome. The students also really felt it was important to continue the youth and elder engagement work, as many of our youth lack access to elders in an urban environment. I would like to share some of the thoughts on moving forward with the Frameworks Foundation of how city employees can best support and build positive, respectful relationships with Indigenous people. Our students have been educated during a time when Canadians have been learning about reconciliation. When the students have experienced is a city of Edmonton staff who have been willing to learn and be in relationship with Indigenous people. Yet we know that the work has only begun with segments of the staff. In education, in Indigenous PD, the phrase preaching to the converted sometimes comes to mind. Much like a relationship that is broken, the first step of healing is honesty, when space is created for the truth to be spoken from both sides. The second step is to make amends for a broken relationship, which is being called reconciliation. But in relationships, we have to be willing to fix what is broken if we want it to change. Otherwise, we continue just doing what we have always done. The work started with the Indigenous framework is the beginning of the difficult work of making change if the relationship is authentic. This relationship is complex as there are many players. Specific to city staff, what does this look like when city staff are at different places and they're learning about Indigenous people? Some staff may still be at a point of, why is this important? They still haven't experienced truth and the benefits of reconciliation work. For those who have, they realize that they have to unlearn what they thought they knew about us as Indigenous people and relearn our collective history with a different lens. With last year's global experience of the BLM movement, Canadians felt the wave of unease of the Black, Indigenous, People of Colour anti-racism education became suddenly an acute need for addressing sy systemic racism. Are city staff ready to tackle the hard work of anti-racism education and the issues that make Indigenous youth and all Indigenous people unsafe within our city? The youth are ready. Ikse. Hey, hey. Tapui. Hey, hey. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to Julia Babia. Mr. Chair, we've been informed that Julia won't be speaking today. Fair enough. Uh, we will now go to Donna Niebush. There you are. Good morning. Good morning, elders. My name is Donna Kniebush, and I've been working with the City of Edmonton for 14 years. 
I have worked on a number of Indigenous priorities over the years, such as creating Edmonton's Indigenous Employees Resource Network, known as EARN, and the Indigenous Awareness Training, with over 8,000 employees trained. I am also a representative for Employee Services on the Corporate Steering Committee. I'm very passionate about my work, and many of you here today, today know that about me. I have been asked to speak from this very unique position, and sometimes that means conflict for me because I live in two worlds. First, I'm a First Nations woman living in the city of Edmonton. Second, I'm in, an Indigenous employee of the city of Edmonton. I will share with you from this unique perspective that I have seen a lot, I have heard a lot, and I have personally experienced a lot. There are so many Indigenous people that are in this very same position. And because of my close working relationships with Indigenous staff, I am aware of some of the struggles of our Indigenous employees who still in 2021 do not feel welcome or safe working for the city of Edmonton or living in the city of Edmonton. Today, however, we have been given an opportunity to make a commitment to the Indigenous staff and the Indigenous community with the launch of the framework. We must listen. We must hear Indigenous people and we have to respect their unique experiences so we can learn to work together towards a beautiful future for all. Today, the Indigenous framework gives us that opportunity to make this commitment. All of us need to commit to this. Now is the time. Will we make mistakes? Yes. Yes, we will. However, the best thing about making mistakes is the learning that comes from the mistakes. Trust me, I have made my share of mistakes. As you have heard, it has taken us years to get where we are today with the Indigenous framework. This has been a long journey. The Indigenous Framework sets the expectations for all City of Edmonton employees as they enter into a relationship with the Indigenous community. This is a priority. We can create a path together for tomorrow. The path forward will need to include working collaboratively and respectfully with the Indigenous people, both internally at the City and externally in the community. The Indigenous community has been waiting for a long time to be included, recognized, respected, honoured, and being given priority. The only way we can be successful is by involving all city staff, including the Indigenous community. This is an opportunity to take our internal experts on a journey with our Indigenous experts in the community. Together we can learn listen and work towards a future that is inclusive. Let me share a teaching with you that's been shared with me to keep me focused on tomorrow. My elder has always said, remember who you work for. Today you will have impact for many generations to come. Always be mindful of who you are working for. The children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and those yet to come. In this work, we will learn and listen. We will nurture and elevate those relationships that we have and work on creating new relationships. We will work together. We will listen and have conversations so that we can share the stories and celebrate success together. As department teams, we have spent a lot of time on this work and we understand the commitment we have entered into we will all be held responsible for this work and we need to understand our current realities and honor our commitment to the Indigenous community by being agile and flexible. We're all in this together. And as a corporation, we have just started on this journey. We're not done. We have a long way to go. A relationship takes time, patience, respect, and nurturing. And so too will this relationship a future state that we can all work towards, the City of Edmonton as a partner to the Indigenous community and Indigenous businesses. A city that is inclusive to Indigenous people. 
and an employer of choice for Indigenous people. Hi, hi. Thank you. Hi, hi. Thank you. We'll now move on to Chrissy Hodge. Oh, Emily Riddle. Let's not skip. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Riddle. I'm Nehio from the Alexander First Nation. Um, I grew up in Edmonton in Ward 8, which will soon be called Ward Papaseo. And I come to you from Ward 6, soon to be Ward O'Damon, near the site where my ancestors appeared in 26, where the Alberta legislature now sounds. And I note this because it's appropriate this framework is about kinship since we took on each other as family through this living agreement of treaty and that should guide how we live together here. So I am here today as the Senior Advisor Indigenous Relations for the Edmonton Public Library with Chrissy Hodgins who will speak next who is the Director of Branch Services and Community Engagement. I have been on the steering committee for the Indigenous Framework since August 2019 and have immensely enjoyed working with a group of dedicated Indigenous and non-Indigenous people uh, who are all passionate about making the city a more equitable place and are open to learning more about history from our perspective and ceremonial practices. So the framework since I have been involved has been based in ceremony and centered on elders and youth, and you've heard from some of these elders today. Indigenous people are very used to navigating non-Indigenous organizations and processes and honoring what Chi 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 Tobi and Makotawin requires us to think, work, and live in new ways, and to challenge systemic racism that Indigenous people continue to face on our own land. The Edmonton Public Library endorses the Indigenous framework and looks forward to working with the city and our staff to embody the four roles of listener, connector, advocate, and partner, in recognition of the unique context of public libraries. I believe that EPL is um, already one of the best connectors in the city. So this work to ensure Indigenous people and Indigenous ways of knowing are appropriately honoured in the city is ongoing. One of the seven commitments in the framework speaks to ensuring Indigenous people feel welcome and safe in city spaces and buildings. In fall 2020, we opened a revitalized Stanley A. Milner Library with a pipe ceremony with elders Joanne and Jerry Saddleback and received a name for the, a public ceremony space called Piasu Waskaigan. This ongoing work to ensure that urban Indigenous people have access to ceremony and that libraries honour um, Indigenous knowledges is ongoing. Another one of the commitments in the framework is to host and participate in events where the cities, where Edmonton staff, representatives and Indigenous peoples can build relationships and celebrate together, something that we desperately miss right now. The library has been hosting Indigenous and reconciliation focused events for many years, and they are some of our best attended programs, even when they have been moved online since the pandemic. Ultimately, the library is a gathering place for ideas and people, which honors Amasquatchee's origins as a place of trade and gathering. I look forward to see, seeing how EPL and the city can move together with this initiative into a time when we can gather again in person. Aye, hi, Xie Pitama, which is the Nehio way to sort of say thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you very much. And uh, to continue with uh, representatives from the Edmonton Public Library, we'll go to Christy Hodgins. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Good morning. I am Chrissy Hodgins, Director of Branch Services and Community Engagement at Edmonton Public Library, and I'm here to speak on the behalf of EPL and our CEO, Pilar Martinez. As you have heard from my colleague, Emily Riddle, EPL endorses the, the City of Edmonton Indigenous Framework. Emily and I, as well as a number of our predecessors, have worked with the City St Steering Committee for more than five years, and we are proud to support Wahiji Jacobi as we work towards stewarding the plan into action. EPL remains committed to reconciliation and to supporting Indigenous communities. Our community-led service philosophy is about building relationships and identifying and meeting evolving community needs with a focus on reducing barriers to accessing library services. I cannot see a more powerful way for EPL to embody our community-led service philosophy than by adapting the Indigenous framework to our engagement practices. For EPL, this journey has been ongoing. In 2007, we were the first library in Canada to hire an Indigenous services librarian. Through the Voices of Amiskwachi, our digital storytelling initiative, we steward stories from surrounding Indigenous communities. We bring library services to our neighbours at Enoch Cree Nation. We offer weekly virtual Cree language classes to the public with our partners at the Canadian Native Friendship Centre. 
PSU Wiskagen, our Indigenous gathering space, opened its doors to the public in September 2020. The Milner Library is also home to beautiful art created by a variety of Indigenous artists. And then most recently, Nakom Joanne Saddleback joined us as our second elder in residence. While we have more work to do, we are grateful to the Indigenous elders and communities for their feedback, guidance, and support. I am proud and excited as we are committing to and adapting the Indigenous framework and the action plan for EPL. This is an important and significant undertaking that I believe will have a lasting and meaningful impact for the communities we serve, our local partners, customers, board, and staff. Wahiji Jacoby is a covenant for living together, and for me, I hope it serves as a reminder that we are stronger together. Thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, now we have Don Marie Marchand, a former artist in residence for the city of Edmonton. Hi, Nia Chipe Chippewa Squirrel. My name is Blue Horse Spirit Woman. Um, I was asked to do an, an art piece for the uh, framework um, that encapsulized. Um, what was said during the advocacy part of their um, engagement sessions. Uh, I chose to write or to come in and speak today because um, in reviewing the document itself, the framework, um, obviously the, the artwork is gorgeous. Um, all four artists have really, really put a strong effort forward and it's a beautiful document. But I wanted to speak to some of the things that the artwork says that are not in the framework. So um, I'm going to speak only about my particular piece, which is the advocacy piece, and how it's broken down a little bit, hoping to encourage all the councillors to follow the links and actually work with and absorb the information that these artists are trying to put forth. So for advocacy, what I found was that there were four main themes in all of the things that were being spoken. They came down to financial support, uh, staff and training, an ombudsman or an advocacy office, and safe, culturally safe spaces. So when you look at my painting, uh, what uh, came, kept coming across was that financially, there's a lot of startup funding, but not a lot of sustained funding to go the course. So when you look at the symbolism in around the funding, you see that the horse, which would be the startup funding, is covered um, instead of being front and forward. And that would be because um, sometimes the, the funding is not sustained. So you have just enough to start, start, but then it's not sustained and we lose really important programs and services. The second is that sometimes the funding bureaucracy becomes the barrier itself. And that's why the horse is covered because traditionally the horse was a sense of currency for um, this particular territory. Um, the other thing you'll notice, and you'll see it throughout the entire document, is the, the horseshoes, the Vs and the, the Us. And I'm stealing that from the ledger drawings of the Indian Wars down south. Um, after these ledger drawings started coming out, uh, there was a, um, uh, people were analyzing them and they realized that the V-shaped horse hooves meant the non indigenous or the indigenous horses and the u-shaped hooves were the um, cavalry horses because they were shod so when you see the 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 pattern of the hoof hoofs going through the entire document basically what it's saying is that you need to follow the community in the direction that it needs to go and sometimes what looks like following the community is actually just accessing privilege. So a lot of times, um, uh, 
due to systemic imbalances, what looks like we're moving backwards is actually us just catching up to where everybody else is so that we can move forward. Um, the funding also, because it affects all four of the frames, it affects all four of the major themes, that's why those hoofprints prints run through the whole bottom of the, the entire painting. We also want to talk about that whole idea of, um, of uh, training and staff. And it's already been reiterated here, but I'll say it again, that there be an inclusion of elders, women, and youth perspectives when you're developing policy. That you develop consensus building that there is a recognition of indigenous history and natural law, and there's a reliance on protocol when you're dealing with indigenous people. Um, there's also a mention of the personal work. The three areas that need to be recognized as your personal work are the personal bias and prejudice against indigenous people you may hold, the personal and generational privilege and how colonial history and min minimizes intergenerational and structural violence. So these are that's your personal work as City of Edmonton staff and that we hope this framework brings forward. Hey, hey. Thank you very much, John Marie. We really appreciate it. And uh, is there a way we can access a, a write-up of in any Yes, way? I've provided a roadmap to the to my painting and there are other artists who have provided work and descriptions about their artwork and they're linked on the document online perfect thank you and we'll look into that and it's a, a very good illustration of why art is important we'll now move on to kyra brown thank you counselor Pat. good morning and greetings to each and every one of you my name is Kyra Lee Brown, Egwani Tusikasun Tuwitan Achak, which is my North Star spirit name. My bloodline is Nihil Cree and Portuguese, and I'm Miskwachi Waskegan born, and I'm honored to be here to speak today to the meaningful work of the City of Edmonton Indigenous Relations Framework. I am in the position of the Indigenous Relations Advisor with the Edmonton Arts Council and in, in our efforts to support the Indigenous Arts community, I have been on the Indigenous Relations Office Framework Committee for the past year and a half. This work has required many circle voices that aim to build a strong relationship through long-term commitments and actions. Alongside the city, EAC is prepared to support this work through its own commitments and actions. This is an ongoing process that has found success embedded in the deeper conversations and learning from the work and wisdom of past conversations. Our EAC family believes in the formula of listening, collaborating, and taking responsibility. We participate in the dialogues where we together seek to find best pathways to reconciliation. Where we are figuring out community strengths and seeking ways to acknowledge what is challenging so that we can work together to be, act, and do the work that heals and celebrates thriving, contented families and communities. The Edmonton Arts Council has a 10-year plan, Connections and Exchanges, where we are committed to understanding and supporting the needs of Indigenous arts and cultural communities. Through the opportunities to partner with the city and other agencies, we continue to create ways to support and align with the roles of listener, connector, advocate, and partner. They are intrinsic to the work that believes in meeting the needs of the arts community through long-term collaborative efforts. Our team works to hear what is truly happening in our arts and cultural communities, then creates responsive strategies that support the ongoing work within the community. The AC strives to be a connector with the city in these solid framework efforts through its past and ongoing agreements with fellow organizations, the Edmonton Heritage Council and the Edmonton Arts Hub. My experience with building the Indigenous framework is a reflective process. I've had to think of my own family historical experience living in our Edmonton space about the blessings and the struggles. This framework speaks to my heart about true reconciliation that needs to be an effort together so that we can figure out the best ways to thrive and support our well-being 
and the op and the opportunities for future generations to come. I do feel a great sense of responsibility to help our communities heal, to help our communities to be who they want to be, to help our communities reclaim their sense of worth and sense of family connection and culture, to help our youth grow to feel excited about their home and place that they live in, and to help our seniors and elders feel peace and safety. I have observed the circle of incredible people sitting at the table work through difficult discussions on how we can create a framework that reflects the meaningful idea of connections that matter. I believe we have achieved relationships that honor each other and that this is good energy and it will be reflected in the actions and strategies going forward. This relationship work is not new. It is built on the work of many people before and will continue with generations to come. So I feel honored in contributing to building the pathways that support reconciliation, that support a united direction and commitment to uplifting our First Nations people so that they can choose to thrive and participate in what our city looks like. EAC believes that Indigenous peoples have agency in their journeys of revitalizing and participating in traditional, contemporary and future manifestations of our culture. This is reflected in the Inu Rivalot 11 Park Project, where over the course of more than six years, many artists, knowledge keepers, professionals and community members help bring the park to life a park that proudly reflects the culture, traditions, and history. Art piece is placed in perpetuity for our community to build memories that meaningfully connect us. To sum up my experience, it is an honor and a privilege to work with the city and partner circles of dedicated people and an honor and a privilege to stand side by side with my own work family, the Edmonton Arts Council, who work with passion to support the discovery and realization of what support for the Indigenous arts community looks like. Hi, hi, thank you. And uh, next, I'm not sure if it's Levy or Levy, but I'm pretty sure the first name is Andrea from Edmonton Police Service. Hi, yes. Um, I mean, my name is Andrew Levy, and I'm an Anishinaabekwe and a member of Washak Anagum in Treaty 3 territory. And I'm here today as the Indigenous Equity Advisor at the Edmonton Police Service. I've been here in Edmonton for 14 years, and I thank the signatories and descendants of Treaty 6 territory for welcoming me on this land, where I've built my career, started my family, and reclaimed my identity. To me, which to elders Jerry and Joanne Seidelbach, Tom Snow, and Heather Porters, who have spoken such truth today, and for the guidance and strength of Donna La Donna Whiskey Jack throughout this work. I've been with the internal working group since the fall of 2018, and I am honored and inspired by the intention and dedication of the city employee allies that have continuously shown up in this space to learn and grow. And for my fellow Indigenous City of Edmonton employees for being vulnerable in this space of growth, providing their strength and experience to help others learn. Challenging racism within a colonial world is a work of resistance and strength, and I honor their commitment to this. This framework is built on a foundation based in ceremony, passion, and relationality that is necessary for the actions moving forward to be done in a good way. This work is all about relationships and the truth that comes with that responsibility. Advocating for Indigenous equity within systems has been at the center of my being since I was young. Seeing the struggles that my mom and her siblings faced with the various systems, in addition to the impacts of my grandmother surviving residential schools on our family, I have always wanted to challenge our social and political systems to see the value of our Indigenous ways of being and knowing. For me, this has been a personal and professional journey of reclamation of what colonial institutions has taken from my family and community, and I believe a new future built together is possible. However, this is only one side of it. We need the support and courage of our leaders to take up the institutional will and create action from our work. This is why it is vitally important for municipal bodies such as the City of Edmonton and Edmonton Police Service to be the leaders in advocating for the equity of Indigenous peoples within our systems, as these are central pillars in our systemic structures that have, built, have been built on assumptions that have limited understandings and produced negative experiences of and for Indigenous peoples interacting with these systems. It is up to us as leaders to work and advocate for our own truths in these instances, as well as larger societal reconciliation. In recognition of the complex relationships that policing institutions and Indigenous peoples have and the complex road going forward, 
the Edmonton Police Service at this time is not adopting the City of Edmonton Indigenous Framework, as we need to first address our complex issues and barriers specific to policing first. Although we are not adopting it at this time, we are in alignment with the spirit and intent of the framework, and we will be continuously working with our municipal partners to better support Indigenous peoples within Edmonton, and we'll be working towards developing our strategic path forward that addresses our unique relationship with Indigenous peoples and creates substantial systemic change in collaboration and unity with community partners. Part of this work begins with the development of the Nisukamakwin Council and the community's aid in implementation of the systemic recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls in Two-Spirit Communities, Broken Trust Report, and the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Our intention with this work is to address the concerns and solutions that have come from generations of consultations, providing a foundation of sorry, concerns and solutions that have come from generations of consultations providing a foundation of relationships that work to address the systemic barriers and challenges experienced by Indigenous people. It is through this work, hand in hand with representatives of the Indigenous community here in Edmonton, that we hope we can affect real change within our systems. The framework that you see before you has been built on a foundation of relationships, growth, learning, and ceremony. The work that the employees, youth, community, and elders has done is an amazing first step to creating change for our city. We have spent many years together envisioning the path forward with, with courage and compassion. It is at this point with this foundation that the leaders in our collective systems need to find that same courage and compassion in order to take it from intention to action. I think it is beautiful that it is our Indigenous ways of knowing and being that have brought us all here together across agencies, organizations, and community to build a better future for our next generations. Jean Meagridge, for the youth and our elders who are involved in this work, it is you who have provided the backbone of our collective understanding. And my hope is that our leaders in the city will be impassioned by this intention and provide the resources and space to make this framework actionable and impactful. Jean Meagridge. Meagridge, hi, hi. Um, we'll now move to Matthew Wood. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Wood. Uh, I'll see you guys soon. Um, I'm here today uh, as a 2021 Indigenous Artist in Residence. Um, very grateful to be here and to be supported by an amazing committee uh, and a program that I believe is very vital to our communities and uh, programs and opportunities like this allows, you know, for artists such as myself and many uh, within Treaty 6 and all across Turtle Island, I mean, uh, it gives us a chance to reconnect with our culture, our, our identity. Art is in everything. Art is something that's been instilled into our genetics, our, into, our, into our DNA as Indigenous people. It's in our culture. It's in our, in our language. It's in our, you know, our syllabics. It's in, in our dance. It's in our beadwork. It's in sewing. And, and these are all things... Uh, that have layers and teachings within them, within within the arts that allow us to teach us how to 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 care for one another, to have that empathy, to to teach us to 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 treat others how we want to be treated. And uh, for me, uh, it, it, it's really important for someone being disconnected from my community, and then finally being reconnected through the arts and being. Uh, being supported and uplifted through programs such as the uh, the Indigenous uh, Artists in Residence. Um, you know, earlier they, uh, there was there was uh, words of, of of youth being fearful to to be in these positions, and um, <laughs> even me today, I, I still, as much as I'm supported through the community, uh, I, I sometimes overthink and think that I don't belong in these spaces, but. Um, it's become more evident and um, a responsibility uh, and a duty that I feel as an artist myself is to express these uh, these things and, and 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 to to encourage more support within the arts and programs and culture, um, it, which you know, with more support and the importance of these programs, it, it strengthens our relationships with the first day, with the first peoples of our, of our culture. Indigenous peoples here, right here in Treaty Six, and all around, uh, as and, you know, through 
through Turtle Island. Um, and it gives us a way to, to honor a lot of the things that we speak of, you know, with the uh, truth and reconciliation, uh, the framework of what we speak of today. And um, it's, you know, I've had, there's many counselors and we have uh, even our mayor that's uh, has attended things such as uh, the Cypher Wild, which I'm uh, one of the founders, uh, founding member of Cypher Wild, which is uh, a block party event, which brings community together. It brings people together of all walks of life. And it's become more evident as well, too, is that there's the need of this because uh, a place of belonging, a place of where uh, people could be themselves, where people could share their story. Everybody has a story to share. And we all know how you know we all have a different approach to how to share our story whether it be through through music whether it be through dance whether it be through our languages um even food you know i think these are beautiful things and um yeah i just really truly truly believe that uh with with more programs and opportunities like this that we won't have you know idle hands out there uh with our youth and without programs for me my options were either to be uh, in a native gang, uh, go to jail, become a drug dealer, um, you know, be in, in a negative space and putting um, <laughs> a lot more hurt than, than, than healing out into this world. So it's a two way street. And I think um, we, it's not, we're not here to, you know, fix people. We're here to, to heal together. And the arts allows that. It allows us to, to heal as a community, as a, and, and as a whole. And um, it's 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 uh, if if you have attended uh, a cipher wild and while leaving city hall or just walking by in Churchill Square, you have seen the energy that it, that that it, that it holds. You see the 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 activation it brings, uh, not just for indigenous youth, but all walks of life, even our elders, our our, our adults, uh, people from the inner city. Uh, these are all people that are our are, are parents or, or, or brothers or sisters, aunties and uncles, um, human beings. So, you know, we think, uh, as mentioned before earlier, the mistreatment and the, the situation that happened earlier, um, you know, like these things need to be, uh, I'm starting to lose my train of thought, but these, these things are, are, are you know, with programs like what we have out there and providing and providing a space for people to have their voice, um, I think, you know, we're able to, to strengthen those relationships and really put forward, you know, this this framework and, and more than just putting a little patch on it, a little Band-Aid, it allows us to really, really move forward. And um, I thank you for, your, my, uh, for, for having me here. And hi, uh, hi. Hey, hey. Thank you, and uh, I relate to your words. Uh, look forward to see what you create this year. And uh, of course, we uh, added one more speaker, um, and that was uh, Ron Walker. Good morning. Uh, tensei, uh, Ron Walker, the Sikas on Treaty 8 Ochinia. I'm a direct descendant of the Treaty 8 uh, signers. Uh, good morning to our cultural uh, knowledge keepers and my relatives in attendance today. Thank you to the city councilors for hearing my message as well, as well as the hardworking staff at the Indigenous Relig Relations Office, led by Jamie Miller and other organizations that we continue to have successful engagements with. I also want to thank the Honorable Mayor Iverson personally, since he has been in leadership, interactions, dialogues, and actions between both the city and the Indigenous people have improved. That comes from having an open mind and being knowledgeable about the history of the land. As an Indigenous person who is called Amishkoskahiga in his home, I thank the people of this land for letting me part, be part of the leadership in the community throughout my years of cultural, educational, community development, and artistic endeavors, as well as the ancestors of this land that I have prayed and gave thanks to. One of the largest endeavors we have accomplished together is the development of one of the largest Indigenous festivals in Western Canada. Together, the Indigenous Relations Office, both school systems, local organizations, and as a director of the Canadian Native Friendship Centre, we have developed a festival that can compete with any other festival across Canada. In 2017, we set an, an unofficial world record for the largest round dance at the Edmonton Indigenous Peoples Festival. 
Well, the Aboriginal People's Television Network showed the aerial footage of various communities across Canada on Indigenous Day, June 21st, Edmonton had thousands and thousands of participants. As the group and I have said, on that day, Edmonton won. No one could come close to us and our numbers. This is an example of the success and of Indigenous solidarity and prosperity. With this success in today's climate, the Indigenous Relations Office, with guidance from the city and various other Indigenous organizations, can continue to have successes that benefit not only Indigenous people, but assist to improve the economic, cultural, and community fabric of our home. That is what the creation of this document, of this living document, I would like to think about um, when it comes in terms of the framework. Many times I have been on many council or committees and, and discussions across Edmonton, not only for the festival and the arts, but also for um, COVID um, education uh, and, and cultural uh, presentations as well. Um, and also multi-ethnic invitations. Um, I personally welcomed uh, the Syrians uh, in 2017 at uh, a Black festival called Five Artists, One Love, curated by my friend Darren Jordan. And when I did that, it came to my realization that is what should be occurring at the airports, is Indigenous people welcoming the people from different countries to this land because this is our land. I'm grateful to the city, especially as I said, you know, Honorable Mayor uh, Iveson for, for understanding that because in the past, and I've lived here in Edmonton for a long time, in the past that has not occurred. So once again, I want to say thank you. Thank you for listening to me and hi, hi. Hey, hey, thank you very much. And that concludes our speakers. Um, at this point, we'll open up to questions from councillors. And uh, just taking a look. Um, at this point, there's no one on the board to ask any questions. So um, I see some people are raising their hands. Uh, Mayor Iverson, go ahead. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm not able to uh, put the request in through our system, but um, I uh, really appreciate all of the wisdom shared today and that it represents a lot of depth that contributed to this work. So I just want to thank everyone, not just for their time here today, but uh, tremendous effort and leadership in supporting the city. Uh, to to see with two eyes, as we heard Mr. Smythe say say earlier, uh, I feel very fortunate at all of the things that uh, that I've been privileged to learn uh, through the work of reconciliation. And so, thank you, Mr. Walker, um, for those kind words. I've had many good teachers, some of whom are on this call. Uh, so, my question uh, to uh, elders Joanne and Jerry um, would be: you know, five years from now. How will you know that this was a success and not um, another another document that that concluded a lovely process, but uh, but instead is something that starts off something new and and beautiful and successful and healing? I think uh, some of the declarations that you've made already, uh, Mayor have been a really good uh, action towards that visibility that Indigenous people need in this in the city. Uh, I think that the ability for us to have support, to have Cree, the Cree language as an official language in the city would be an excellent, an excellent idea. It would raise the level of it that the city recognizes the matriarch societies that our Indigenous people come from it raises the status of Indigenous women in the city and to begin to understand how that matriarchy sees uh, governance, sees how the um, city uh, acknowledges them, I think is an, excellent, is an excellent idea. I know Jamie and her office have already done some work towards this, toward, towards raising that level. So these are some of the big indications that there, that there be some kind of that you know, I say that cultural center, you know, but the ability to to enact the um, 
uh, uh, UNDRIP, uh, that we have the right to educate our own children in our own languages, in our own cultural ways, rather than basing everything on an Alberta educational system, that we have the freedom to do that. I think that that goes a long ways as well. I don't know if those things are accomplishable in five years, but I think that that we're even discussing it is a huge advancement already. And I cannot thank you enough for your, your kind ears and and asking that that question. I'll let my husband, uh, I, well, I'll let him say a few words. <laughs> well, just in, in general terms, uh, when we, it's the educational co com, um, component of it is uh, what the, in our culture we believe that, but we talk about the process, but part of that process is also uh, a very stable knowledge of uh, the, the past, like uh, by past, I mean like uh, uh, prior to contact here, how we were as an indigenous people and up to this point in time, from the time of the treaty up to this point in the time, and what our elders uh, prophesied as for the future uh, in regards to, I guess, choice or choices that we make as nations of people to uh, this earth um, with whom we are. Uh, Indigenous people regard as our mom, our own mother. So basically, that's uh, within that five year time. I think uh, it's kind of like uh, to me again, like it, it's uh, it, like my wife says, uh, it's uh, it, it would be a tremendous start, you know, like, uh, to be able to see uh, come up to a realization of that sort that, that uh, with people, indigenous and non indigenous people, are like the people to uh, see. Thank you. Um, and I just I want to give um, uh, Matthew and Emily maybe the chance to give a next gen perspective uh, on the same question. Uh, but I, I I'll just say before I run out of time and hand it back to Matthew and Emily that I really look forward to welcoming all of you to the Indigenous Peoples Experience, where we can bring many of the things we've talked about here alive down at Fort Edmonton. Um, uh, as a as a strong gesture that I think embodies what you were just saying, uh, uh, Jerry. So thank you, uh, Matthew and Emily. I'd love your perspective on this question of how will we uh, know we've been successful here. Maybe Emily first, and then Matthew. Okay, you can go first. Um, everything that Nokom uh, Joanne and Elder Jerry have said for sure, I agree with. I think uh, the understanding of safety and feeling welcome in spaces is something that my family um, and my friends have not always felt in this city. So an increased sort of safety um, in dealing with city employees and city spaces, I think is definitely something that we can measure and talking to the youth and elders. Um, I think, and just increased in visibility, visibility of indigenous art, indigenous languages, um, Ensuring that people um, feel like this is a place they can thrive and live and um, work on projects they're passionate about. So um, I think that the way that the framework is laid out in terms of the seven commitments and the sort of push I've seen from departments and developing action plans means that those things will happen as long as we continue to re revisit it and ensure that it's an ongoing conversation every year and in between those annual meetings as well, too. So um, just... I think that the, the work kind of starts now, <laughs> we're celebrating, but um, the work kind of begins now that after we pass this framework today and that will be the test to see that relationship kind of continues. So I think, uh, yeah, for me, it would be echoing what uh, our, our, our Nokum has shared as well as what Emily has, has shared is just being included, uh, having that those spaces where we feel invited. Um, language is something that is something I'm very uh, focusing on with this residency. So what Nukum, uh Joanne said about language and uh, being recognized, I think is, you know, a good, a good uh, um, sign. Uh, but yeah, many more programs that are being fostered and, 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 and nurtured. Um, why put, uh, why take away these programs, which will only have to put more money towards crime prevention? So let's 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 get these programs up. Let's let's support these our, our indigenous communities to enrich our communities through culture, uh, to to help 
teach other you know, our other communities, our surrounding communities, and all walks of life how, uh, that these teachings and art uh, allow us to teach us how to to, to treat one another, and, and, and within all those those teachings are the medicine wheel and the seven sacred teachings. So um, I'll end at that. That. and thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Yeah. <laughs> Always. Uh, we'll now move to uh, Councillor Banga. Well, thank you. I'm not on the committee, but uh, I don't know who else is uh, Councillor McKean on the committee, but uh, he can go first if he likes. No, he's he's not on the in-group, so go ahead. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, sorry for uh, joining late in this meeting. Uh, I do have a couple questions, uh, I guess, from any of these uh, speakers can comment on them. It is, uh, I hear that uh, the relationship between uh, the city and the indig uh, indigenous peoples, uh, they're improving. But sometimes when you uh, go on the social media, uh, the perspective is, uh, I guess, little different and uh, it tells us there is a lot more work to be done yet. Can I get some comments on this, please? Yeah, we'll, yeah. Yeah. Well, sorry. <laughs> I knew we started oh, to guess. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Tom go. Yes, uh, this is Tom Snow again. Uh, 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 I work for, I'm the elder in residence at the Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society. And uh, what we've done there in the past, like it's uh, been around for 25 years, going on 26, uh, we have improved a lot like we have improved our relationships and we have set up uh, improvement with the relationship between the indigenous people and the and edmonton through a lot of our programs and so those things seem to be like uh, uh more a little more higher up i guess what's happening when you go on social media is it's still happening in the grassroots level and things where it's people less educated can be affected. And so uh, what we've been trying to do is uh, educate people. We educate people as to how, why we are the way we are. When, when, when that happens, then you know, with this understanding, people can, can sort of work with that. But without that knowledge of why we are the way we are, People go to stick to the stereotypes. And I think that's where this conflict, where this, uh, where you know, what you see on Facebook. And so uh, that is one of the things that I see. So in regards to uh, what uh, Honorable Mayor asked uh, before, uh, Kichi Aski is that program that we need set up. And also, we need curriculum in the school system. That would be showing us the truth. And uh, that would show that we have moved. And uh, so I'd just like to lose my comments. Thank you. Thank you. And I got one more question. That's uh, when we are uh, listening from uh, indigenous uh, peoples, it is uh, usually uh, different people are saying that they're the original descendants of uh, of uh, the uh, I guess different uh, 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 tribes you could say or whatever. Uh, but how do how do we know? Like, is there anything uh, that is published? That's kind of like not books and books kind of deal there uh, where we can say, uh, see, actually, you know what, uh, this is uh, this is credible uh, claim and this is not such a credible claim. 
I hope uh, I made myself clear. We we think you, we understand you. Uh, uh, welcome to the. Uh, we're happy to to see you here. Uh, one of the things about uh, in person, my husband do a lot of myth busting. We do a lot of that, you know. But and, and we want people to understand when it comes to elders working with elders. We're not all at the same level. We don't all know the same thing. We don't all know the same ceremonies. Uh, so you you have to really be, um, we don't want to standardize who is an elder, but we want there to be a standard. And there's lots of organizations that are applying this. They're saying, uh, you have to say, who are your people? What language do you speak? Who are your elders? They want to know that. They want to know where you got your knowledge from. So there, there's a way to, we're trying to self-check one another. Also, too, we have that story of creation. I mean, that talks about our creation. We're not immigrants. We were created here on this island, uh, island being North, Central, and South America. And you can tell where an elder is in that story of creation by the first sentence, by the first paragraph that, that they speak. You know, so there is a way of self-checking already within the community of doing that. But it's difficult when you have so many cultures together, you know, that they mix up those cultures because they don't have access to their own culture. Or all people say, learn your own culture first, then you can go and learn other cultures. But don't don't mix them up. Don't mix them up. And especially with social media, that's what's happening. They're getting all mixed up. You know, so we've got a lot of work to wade through about what is credible and what is not credible, but could be credible in Anishinaabe culture may not be credible in Cree culture, you know? So we're, we're trying to wade through that and we, we need everyone's help in order to do that. I hope that answers your question. Definitely that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McKean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to do <clears throat> begin by thanking all the speakers today it was a real privilege to hear you all. I want to also thank uh, Mayor Iveson for his leadership on this issue and for appointing me to the Indigenous Initiative, City Council's Indigenous Initiative, uh, that has also been an amazing privilege and education. Uh, very humbling, and I've enjoyed it thoroughly. I want to thank uh, Councilor Paquette for his grace and leadership. I've learn much by um, closing my mouth and listening to, to Aaron and his graceful um, knowledge and leadership on this issue. I want to thank Jamie, who uh, works constantly on these issues, has, has been a real special guide for me. Uh, and I want to thank um, the elders, and I want to thank Donna. And I wonder if Donna is still on the um, on the meeting here today, representing uh, herself and also uh, civil servants. You there, Donna? Yes, but no. <laughs> Donna, I just wanted to check in with you and see how you felt. You you spoke truth today and you spoke truth to power, as it were. And I want to make sure you felt comfortable. I did, thank you. Um, and you, are you confident uh, that we can slowly um, change minds through, a, through this framework and a compassionate, um, kind and loving response to people? <clears throat> I've become more and more convinced over time that shaming people does not change them. Shaming uh, those police officers from the weekend might not change them. But I've seen remarkable stories of police officers, a police officer, I should say, who made uh, a complete 180 transformation uh, when he acknowledged the truth of what he'd done. So tell me, please, if you can, in a few words or many words, um, what gives you some hope for the future with this framework and, and, and making all civil servants with the city of Edmonton 
um, allies in the work we have to do. I do have confidence in this work. Um, and the reason I have the most confidence in this work is really because this is being guided by our elders, by our community. And knowing the work that we've done to date and for the last 20 years or so, making these connections, creating these relationships, listening and learning from each other and from people. Um, I have that confidence. I have that confidence because we're here today. And this framework announcing this, this sets the stage. This sets the direction of where we're going to go. Yes, it has to be done in kindness and compassion. And it's hard. It's hard for everybody. It's going to be hard work. But I also believe that we have a mayor, council, and our city administration, our leadership, that can make sure that this is leaded, led and guided the way that it needs to be so we can be successful. Thank you, We Dawn. will continue, sorry, we will continue to make those relationships and include our Indigenous employees of the city. Thank you, thank and thank, you. thanks for your leadership. Really appreciate it. Another person who showed real leadership to me in the past was Matthew um, at uh, Cypher Wild. And, you know, I was going to I was going to say how impressed I was to be welcomed at Cypher Wild events as this sort of old fogey, you know, arriving and everybody, all these young people sort of welcoming. And then I thought, but of course they do. But of course they do, because they come from a culture where elders are revered. So, Matthew, thanks for reflecting that back to me. And as I get older, I might. Uh, I might start to um, beat the drum, if you will, on how we need to treat our elders generally uh, better in our in our culture. So thanks. And thanks again to all of you. It's been a, an amazing morning for me. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Uh, the risk of uh, editorializing uh, some of the messaging we get on COVID response really speaks to that. Um, about revering our elders. So I've got a multi-part question, so bear with me. Uh, and it, it is for the elders. And, uh, you know, you grew up facing a lot of racism. Uh, I get a lot of racism in my job. And I'm not saying that for anyone to feel sorry for me. My wife will tell you I'm perfectly capable of feeling sorry for myself. So... We'll leave it at that, but um, the questions that people have, I'm gonna put this up and then I'm gonna let you talk and maybe we'll go with uh, the Saddlebacks because it's a duo and we can get uh, a couple of perspectives, but people will ask in our own organization and in the city, why is this important? Uh, haven't we done enough for, for indigenous people already? Um, why do they keep asking for more? This is, will be the questions that I get in my inbox. Um, they'll put forward stereotypes that they learned through generations of misinformation um, because they don't know the, about the laws that led to the suffering of the people they see in the streets or the addiction problems or the mental health problems or the broken families and the inter intergenerational trauma. They just don't know because they were never told. And when they're told, they don't want to believe it because how could something so horrific truly happen? It must be exaggerated. And how do we do it in a way that encourages the best out of people and acknowledges their pain too? Because I think that's where it comes from. They're worried that their pain will be ignored or overwritten if we acknowledge indigenous history and the pain that exists there. They want to feel like they are nurtured as well, but they'll express it in anger and denial. So how do we encourage the best of us? And how do we respond to those questions so that people will understand 
why this is essential for our society moving forward. Yeah. Okay, I guess it's uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, there's two words that uh, come to my mind, uh, and uh, and I, uh, uh, the, I believe it was Scott there uh, that uh, the previous speaker that uh, got into that a bit too, and uh, it was these two words that come to my mind. They're three words. And they're having to do with uh, that uh, communication that uh, or the dialogue process that's the, that takes place. Uh, there's two types of uh, dialogue old people talk about. Uh, there's um, and this is based again on a long story. If a, if a person had been nurtured through the long story, uh, a young person, for example, had made had all of the tools. Uh, in regards to nurturance of that understanding of the, and stabilize that uh, individual to, to a certain point, then that uh, young person, he's going to, uh, you know, uh, be able to take one of these forms, well, actually both of them really good. Uh, there's this one form of dialogue, it's more direct. They call that one a me'emot. They call that one, when you go me'emot, too much, that's that, uh, you know, when you're, like right to the point kind of thing. Uh, sometimes what happens is there's a shock, or you, you get shocked to a point where you're scared and it turns into anger. That's that may uh, emote. But uh, with a young person that had been nurtured the, through the proper process, they, they absorb that like water. But those that haven't had that type of, including different age groups throughout uh, up to our age and down the, Maybe we haven't had received that, so that mehmoch is not gonna uh, do the cut it for us. In fact, it's gonna go the other direction. Whereas the other form of dialogue, and both of them are called takesque win dialogue. These two dialogues, takesque win dialogue. The first one is mehmoch, takesque win that straighten a point dial, and there's the other one, atsimo takesque win. Achimo Kakeswe, it means uh, teaching them, uh, you know, in the most sensible way possible, the entire picture. Giving them the entire picture in, um, I guess you could say, uh, you know, sometimes when you only take a, a part of a picture, a portion of that picture, sometimes you can't, it doesn't really cut it for you. But if you give them the entire picture, they begin to see, okay, yeah, then this connects over here really good. So, and they absorb it better. That's part of the whole process. So it's process as my wife was talking about. Part of that system or tradition of process entails that type of uh, relationships. Thank you. <laughs> That's a, those are big questions that you're asking, Aaron. I mean, one of the things that my husband and I experience when we go to the bank, when we go to buy a car, when we go to buy groceries with the cashier is that microaggression because I'm lighter skin than my husband and my husband is more obviously indigenous. People talk to me. They refer to me. Even when he asks the question, they talk to me in answering it. Like that's how, how micro that racism runs in, in our society. Sometimes I feel really awful, you know? So when you're facing that every single day, you know, when other people don't acknowledge it or it's not visible to them, it creates this, this anger. And people want to know why, why we keep wanting something. We, because we're missing so much of what we should have had the moment that we were conceived. All those ceremonies, all those rites of passages. You know, that even when a baby is born, the name of the umbilical cord attached to that baby at birth changes. And the name that it changes to is what is your name? You know, it's only a fourth uh, generation, uh, an elder who has four generations in front of them, who can name a baby before it's born, you know, in the, in the womb. And that doesn't happen anymore. It used to happen, every baby would be born with their name, but it doesn't happen. So at the very get-go, our children, our, our populations, our people are not getting what they need. And they, instead, they're absorbing that epigenetic trauma, you know, and, and when you don't deal with trauma, when it first happens, it becomes intergenerational and it gets worse. So 
So we have babies born in a rage and they don't even know why. So you're constantly getting people and what they need and how our old people have taught us. If you only, uh, uh, if you only achieve two things in life, kindness and compassion, you will have achieved everything. And being kind and compassionate doesn't mean being everybody's walking mat. It means that you do, it's not important that people love you or that people even like you, but you're going to make decisions based on the very best that you can. That's the other concept that we need here, is the acceptance that everyone is doing their very best. Their very best is changeable. It changes. It can change. It can be different in a day. But the acceptance that everyone is doing their best, including that guy in that ditch trying to survive the next 20 minutes, he's doing his best. And that's what people need to understand, that under, under these huge issues that Indigenous people are facing, we are not facing them alone, and we didn't cause them all by ourselves, but that we are doing our very best. And it's that anger that we're born with that we got to get over it's uh, our mayor sat there for days with us at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission when it was here in Edmonton. He was a witness. He felt all of that trauma that we were feeling. So it's not going to take a year. It's not going to take 10 years. It's going to take time. And we need to be, we need to insist that when we make these partnerships, that the P, our partners have a working understanding. You don't have to believe in what we believe in, but that you have a working understanding of what the culture is, of what it can finally, I mean, we sit at committee tables, we don't have the freedom to contribute what the culture, this vast culture we have, has as a this rich resource, to have that freedom to say what it is. So I think that it's really important. That's a big question that you asked, Erin. I hope that I answered a little bit of it. But in our day to day, there's not a day that goes by. When I walk out my front door, I experience culture shock. I know that the people outside that door, they don't think like me. They don't see the world the way I do. They don't have my experience. They don't have my history. They don't have, they don't have my culture. So every day it's culture shock for me. So it's not easy. It's not easy. But I'm not a foreigner on this land. I was created on this land. You know, and that's what people need to understand. We gave, we, we shared paradise with them they don't understand the sophistication and the technology that it takes to maintain paradise but that's what we continue to thrive to contribute that inalienable right to protect and preserve the land that's first and when we we're not allowed to achieve those goals there's a constant wanting in us, a constant need in us. That's sometimes like a roar in our ear. So I, I hope that explains a little bit. Thank you so much for asking that question. Bless you for it. Mm. Hey, hey. Thank you. It would be nice to be able to sit in silence for the next five minutes absorbing that, but uh, we have these structures that we follow. Uh, Mayor Iveson. I actually I will put it out there first. Are there any other questions for our speakers today? I mean, yes, but but we need to we need to move on. So so yeah. I'm, I'm I'm on the board. To, uh, the agenda to does indicate we have to move yeah. on. So. Uh, um, Thank you very much to all, all of our speakers. I wish that we could speak with each other for days on end. Uh, and maybe one, one day we will have that opportunity. For now, you are welcome to stick around and watch uh, the rest of the proceedings. And uh, we will move to questions for administration. And we've got Mayor Iveson up. So what I'd actually like to do, Mr. Chair, is and this is a little outside of our normal process, but um, I think it's worth considering. I'd like to move that the Community Services Committee recommend to City Council, the Council endorse and commit to adhere to the guiding principles, four roles and seven commitments contained in attachment one. Uh, I think, and, and just speaking to that 
briefly, I, I think in the interest of time here and recognizing then this would give us an opportunity to make further comments and ask further questions with all members of council next week, uh, is I think um, administration has done marvelous work here and clearly is committed to this based on their earlier comments. And I've been uh, very grateful to have a number uh, uh, of thoughtful conversations with Mr. Corbold. Uh, about his personal commitments as our city manager uh, to this work, which I'm heartened by and we heard this morning. But to drive this across the whole organization um, without council uh, very strongly subscribing as well as individuals and as, as a group, I think is a missed opportunity. Now, whether there's a better way to do this in the form of a policy or, or something, I, I'd, I'd take advice from the clerks perhaps between now and next week. Uh, but I, I think a stronger statement from us um, than mere receipt of information, as excellent as this work is and as grateful as I am for it and the information all shared with us today, including by our speakers who uh, really uh, moved me today. All right. Well, uh, I do think a, a stronger statement is, is required. And so I put the motion in a, a more direct uh, uh, and um, um, not sure the right word for it, uh, decisive format. So I'll leave it there in the interest of time. We can discuss it uh, further either later in the day or or uh, if if folks wish to extend, I'm happy to do that. Happy to take questions on this. Well, the chair uh, is amenable to that. We'll see if uh, committee is when it comes time to vote. Uh, however, we are at the noon hour and uh, we're going to take a break so that everyone can get nourished and uh, do what they need to do. We will be back at 1.30, but we have an item that is the first item on the on the docket at 1.30. Uh, and then we have a second item. So this will actually uh, probably be discussed after all of those other things. So our questions to administration uh, will not come until probably much after uh, 2 o'clock or even 2.30, just so that people are aware. Um and that is unless committee wants to make a change, but I think that we already dealt with that during the agenda. So that is where we're at. Um, enjoy your enjoy your hour and a half, and uh, we will return.
And speaking of getting moving, let's call this, uh, we're back, let's call it to order, and uh, I'll just do a quick roll call. I am present, Councillor Knack. Yes, good afternoon. Okay, Councillor Zadik. Here. I see you there, Councillor Nickel. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, and uh, I saw Councillor Henderson. Yeah, I'm back. Okay, and uh, Councillor McKean, I've heard your voice. I am here, thank you. Okay, heavy with uh, age and wisdom. And uh, I believe that's all. Are there any other councillors that uh, I am missing? We want to acknowledge you and celebrate you. Banga is here. Oh, Councillor Banga, celebrate. Consider yourself celebrated. Okay. So uh, let us move on now. We are now uh, moving to our first time specific item of 1.30 p.m. Progress on Connections and Exchanges, a 10-year plan to transform arts and heritage. Uh, we have joining us uh, Sanjay Shahani and uh, probably some other people. So I will let you uh, take it away. And uh, I understand that you do have a brief presentation. Thank you, uh, Councillor Paquette. This is Sanjay, and I uh, want to just thank um, all of council that's here. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a huge honor for us to be doing this presentation. I know I've only got five minutes, so I'll try and be very, very quick. Um, we have attached a report on the progress, so I won't go through the report, but I just wanted to give council a sense of um, how, we are, how we are actually presenting, uh, how we are implementing the plan, what some of the accomplishments are and what the future looks like. And so, do I have control over the presentation or how does this work? I've never done it, so. We're controlling uh, the presentation in council chambers, so if you just give us an indication of when you'd like to advance the slide, please. Okay, so can you advance the slide, please? Uh, I'm not sure. All I can see is the title. One moment, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I just wanted to briefly talk to you about the Connections and Exchanges Strategy because it's been, um, it's been about two years now since you approved it unanimously um, in, on October 2018. So the Connections and Exchanges Plan is a strategy and there is a, there is a a sort of hierarchy to that strategy. We have three ambitions. Uh, we have eight aims and we have 55 actions. 23 of those are uh, applicable to the Edmonton Arts Council. So I will be doing a, a progress report on the Edmonton Arts Council's implementation, not on the Heritage Council or on Arts Habitat. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'd like to start the presentation by actually thinking about the strategy itself. It is a fairly complex and dense strategy, and uh, we have been um, spending quite a bit of time at the EAC in developing an implementation framework and, in, uh, and an operational plan to actually get this uh, off and going. So um, we, have, we have prioritized eight actions of the 23 that are applicable to the EAC, and there is a fair amount of detail in the report attached um, on how we have implemented each of these eight actions. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about now very briefly is how can we understand this implementation? Uh, because it is, as I said, a fairly complex strategy. Um, a good way to understand it is, uh, and how the EAC is bringing it to life is, if you think about the strategy as, as a jigsaw puzzle with many disparate pieces, many irregular pieces to it, we can't see we can't see what the strategy promises to us by just looking at it. We have to start putting it together. Um, one of the things that my team and I have been doing um, and spending spending a lot of time on is 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 that is that we're giving it the time and space to do it. And of course, as all of you know, with the advent of the pandemic, it has it has disrupted uh, you know a lot of the planning and implementation. I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, it's important to understand that as we are putting these, these puzzle pieces together, um, 
we we are we're looking at it from the point of view that if you look at the 23 actions each of these actions is is a piece of the puzzle when you put these when you put these actions together what you get is you get uh, the the gradual coming together of the scenes or the aims um, in the in the strategy which are really the outcomes or what what will happen in edmonton and over time over a 10 year period we are going to have the three ambitions this is the vision for what edmonton will become if we pay close attention to how arts and heritage are are actually doing the, the transformation um, my, my team itself has been using an approach um, and we heard this morning um, um, with the indigenous uh, framework that the approach of listening and understanding is key to this work that we cannot assume to know it because we have been involved in it for many years we have to listen and understand we have to we have to take care we have to also think about shaping and advancing the work uh, so how we put the pieces of the puzzle together we have to also think about exploring and seeking so testing and piloting is a is another key element of how we are implementing and finally when when the when the aim or the outcome has come into into view we can create and show the work we have done together not just the work done by the edmonton arts council but by the artists and the arts organizations and edmontonians themselves so this is a way that we are humanizing what looks like a very corporate very dense kind of strategy Next slide, please. A really key element of this strategy is the measurement, evaluation, and learning framework. And um, we wanted to know, we wanted to be sure that people in Edmonton um, and you know council itself was aware of all the changes that were happening in Edmonton. And so one of the ways that we we thought about it was to build a measurement and evaluation framework right into the strategy itself. And the slide actually will will give you, um, you know, a sense of how the measurement, evaluation, and learning framework actually works. Um, I can't really read it, so I'm not going to try and read it. But what what I what I will say about it is that um, this is a framework that actually allows us not only to to track the impact of the program, services, projects, and partnerships that we will be doing on behalf of the city and with the arts community and Edmontonians, but it also allows us to track our own corporate performance. So there is a there is a modicum or there is a value of continuous improvement, which is built into how we implement the strategy itself. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide now actually starts talking about the implementation itself. Um, as we were ready to implement things, we were we were consulting with people. We were doing um, you know artist roundtables. We were doing some research. Uh, we had put some things in place, and um, out of nowhere, we had the pandemic hit all of us, and this really put a dampener. And one of the big things that happened in the pandemic, I mean, all sectors of our economy were upset and hurt, but the art sector was was very severely affected by this by the advent of the of the pandemic and it's probably going to be one of the last sectors that will be able to emerge once we are out of this this uncertainty um, during this time the eac spent a considerable amount of time uh, you know sort of thinking about how can we how can we make sure that the livelihoods of of, of artists and and um, um, arts arts workers were were uh, you know which were very badly affected how can we make sure that those those livelihoods were were uh, somehow supported so we 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 sort of pivoted quite quickly and we released new grant programs um now keep in mind with the pandemic there was no gathering and we still don't have any gathering and so a number of performing arts organizations and visual arts organizations had all their facilities closed and were not able to actually put work out. So we focused on the things that artists do best, which is to create art. And so um, we we focused on programs and investments that not only provided an income to artists during this very bleak time, but also we wanted to make sure that they were valued as artists in our community and that the creation of art did not stop. So 
there were a few programs and it's it, they're, they're all they're all listed in the slide i would like to highlight that one of the key principles in the plan is inclusivity and we we took this as an opportunity to to actually deepen the work the eac has a fairly good track record of working with equity seeking artists uh, as well as artists from indigenous communities but we know that the work is incomplete and the work has to continue as our communities change and evolve and new people come into edmonton um, but we took this as an opportunity to use um, the plan to actually quite forcefully um, uh, ensure that there was a new way for artists to approach us to get grants. And so we created the Equity and Access Program, which in which, the, with the help of the EAC board, we were able to more than double the investment um, in, in, in uh, you know, equity seeking and Indigenous artists. Um, this investment, I think we spent close to $590,000 uh, in ensuring that that artists uh, from equity-seeking backgrounds and, and indigenous backgrounds had an opportunity to actually make work, we also put a fair amount of funds in uh, in the digital promotion of art to make sure that artists who wanted to present the work to a public were able to do so, were able to do so, and we spent a fair amount of time in looking at our own internal capacity by hiring new people um, and uh, who who could actually support the work. Um, I also want to mention here that the Edmonton Community Foundation, which is a long-term partner of the EAC, um, uh, was was very very helpful, and in fact, um, you know, provided the EAC with one hundred seventy thousand dollars of additional funds, which we could put towards Indigenous artists and equity-seeking artists. Next slide, please. Despite Despite all the disruption caused by COVID, um, our uh, uh, work with the community didn't stop. So while community programming in Churchill Square and other parts of the city that the EAC was responsible for doing had to, had to stop, we came up with this idea of, of taking art into the community without actually um, violating public health regulations. So working with community leagues and other partners in the community, we created what we call Festival in a Box. And we, we brought artists right into, into communities through 20 parades across the city. Um, this actually not only brought a whimsical uh, kind of um, look at how people could remember and, and, uh, and connect with artists and art, but it also actually uh, brought neighborhoods that were fairly dead as people were in their houses, particularly during the first wave. Um, when the, it was very difficult to go out or anything, and there was so much uncertainty, we actually brought these these parades uh, all across the city, beginning in the early summer and all the way up to the fall. Um, and we had we had uh, many many people come out uh, of their homes just to just to look, watch, cheer on, applaud, and it also was a way for us to employ artists who were out of work. Next slide, please. Um, we, despite the pandemic, we found novel ways of, of consulting with the community. This is a value that is embedded in, into the plan that we will consult and we will listen and understand what where the community is. And so we started consultations with arts organizations and festivals in the late fall of 2019, continued them all the way into the early part of 2020. And then we, um, th this was done through online surveys. Um, and then we had um, uh, very specific artist roundtables. Uh, we had nine roundtables in total. Uh, four of them were for artists from different disciplines in the community, um, as well as we had uh, a few with indigenous artists that were dedicated for indigenous artists, and we had a few with equity-seeking artists. Um, and this was done, uh, again, it was done virtually to keep everybody safe. Uh, the information that we have received from these roundtables is now going into informing our granting programs and our services. Next slide, please. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, about public art only because it's one of the actions in connections and exchanges that we have, we have actually prioritized. There's been some really good work that has happened in this area, and we have worked particularly closely with with our, with our colleagues in the city. Um, there is a, currently a policy review that's ongoing with uh, the Department of Urban Form. 
and hopefully we will bring a suite of new public art policies to you. Um, and uh, I just wanted to highlight a few things about this work. Um, the policies that you will see before you, uh, hopefully over the next few months, will give will give the city and the EAC um, a better handle on how to plan a, a, a sort of public art project cycle over a four-year period rather than tying uh, specific capital dollars to specific uh, public art projects, we'll be able to give you an artistic plan for the entire city, not just where the capital project happens. We are also proposing in through this policy with our colleagues at the city that the budgets for, for, for public art be more flexible so that uh, wherever there is the need for art in the community, we can actually now think and put art there and not tie it to a specific capital project. Um, we are also thinking very deeply about community animation. So the context in which the art is created and the context in which the art is received by the public is a very important part of public art because it is public. You know, you walk by it, you touch it, you ride by it in the subway and so on. Um, and so it's important that we, we think about community animation, not just after the art is installed, but also during the process of, of considering the art. And we are also very, very keen on ensuring that the, uh, the 260 plus pieces of public art that Edmonton currently has um, are, are actually sustainable uh, in, in terms of the care and conservation of all the pieces. So you will see this in the policy when, uh, soon, hopefully. Next slide, please. Um, I want to briefly talk about the work we have done. Um, in, in, uh, in, in ensuring the Edmonton Arts Council itself is, is strong. And this work has meant that we have brought some new expertise into the organization. Particularly, we have hired, uh, 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 it's, a new it's a new position, we've, we've hired, hired a manager of research, measurement analytics and learning. We, we have now our first indigenous relations advisor, Kyra Brown, who um, um, all of you heard from this morning. We have uh, an equity and inclusion advisor now, who's also working with all our departments and with all our with all our areas. Um, and we have uh, uh, somebody who has, has many years of experience in the arts community, who's now our our you know our strategic investments and community relations advisor. We also have a new position at Ticks on the Square. Um, so we have done that work and we've hired people. It's very difficult to do in, in a pandemic, but we have managed to do it and we're doing really good work with, with the addition of, of our staff. Um, our, our board has also been involved in looking at its own governance and has actually renewed not only their board processes and we are currently going through a board development process to get that work um, going. Very hard to do again in the pandemic, but we're doing it. Um, and they have also renewed all the committees of the board. And so we are in a, in a place now to actually um, support the implementation of connections and exchanges. Next slide, please. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, our, own, our own redesign process. So we are going through, as an organization, a complete revamp of how we do our work, what our work is, and the positions we have, and the kinds of roles and responsibilities. So there's organizational sort of you know, redesign work that is happening. Um, we also want to make sure that this work supports a flexible, adaptive, and iterative approach to our implementation, uh, and it ties back into some of the earlier slides that I talked about um, in how we are actually approaching implementation. Um, and then the other exciting piece of news is that the Edmonton Arts Council is looking at its technological infrastructure, and so everything from our granting platform to how we actually manage our, our public art collection and everything in between, like ticks on the square and community programming and other kinds of services, we are investing a, a considerable amount of time and effort and resources to make sure that we are a fully integrated organization. The pandemic has made us more aware than ever that digital integration in this time of uh, social isolation is really important. And so we're doing that work also to make sure that we can actually implement the MEL framework and that the measurements and evaluations and the learning that happens from them is actually possible digitally with new kinds of um, products and tools. 
that will allow Edmontonians to not only see where their art is, but also the impact of the art on, on the city itself and, and the artists who make the art. And uh, with that, I think I've come to the last slide. Um, yes. And so in the last slide, all I want to say besides thank you and questions is that um, uh, we are very, very, we're looking forward to giving you a more robust report um, next year. And we're looking forward to the time when we can all come back and we can all be together um, and actually do the things we do best, which is to come together and enjoy the beauty, joy, and the you know, fabulous sort of transformative effects that art actually brings to our lives. With that, I will end my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sanjay. Uh, very thorough. I believe that Councillor Henderson has a question. Uh, yeah, just uh, well, while we have you here, and I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm because I, you know, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm been able to be at a lot of the Arts Council meetings, so um, I have a good sense of the longer term. I wouldn't mind while we're all together, though, talking a little bit about the short to medium term piece of this puzzle, um, particularly in our response, probably over the next year. I mean, it strikes me, it was almost literally a year ago at an Arts Council meeting where we sat down and worried about what we were going to do if the worst happened and the worst happened. Um, and we've had a couple of meetings since then, I think, with the larger arts community, which were very helpful and useful. But I was really struck, um, I think, in, in terms of the Arts Council response, um, that in actual fact, the order of that kind of uh, relaunch, recover, reimagine comes out differently for the arts community. Um, in your thinking, and I wouldn't mind you hear you talk a little bit about that, but also aware that at our emergency advisory committee last week, um, the city manager made reference to the fact that one of the things we may need for people this summer as things begin to slowly reopen is a kind of use of our festival infrastructure, although probably not in the way we usually look at it, it's something different. And just, if you can just think through the next year, you know, how, what it, what a recovery looks like for the arts, um, what we need to do to make sure that it's healthy and, and also the ways in which we might be able to take advantage and use that I and mean, where things are at. So, sorry, it's a whole bunch of questions on the one. Yeah, no, that, that's okay. That's okay. So we have begun, we have begun this thinking with the arts community. Um, and we've started it particularly around our granting programs. As you know, you, you're both you and Councillor McKean are on, on the board now. Um, and the way we've tried to think about it is uh, that this, this I mean, that some people say that the life, the, the true recovery from a pandemic is four years long. I believe that we will come out of it earlier than for four years. Uh, otherwise, we'll all go, you know, sort of, you know, completely crazy. But um, the way we have actually thought about it is, that the, the work that we're doing, and we're very thankful that Connections and Exchanges actually is giving us the guidance to do this work. Uh, we didn't expect a pandemic, but, but the plan is built around this adaptable and iterative and uh, flexible approach. And so already what we have done is that our, uh, our main sustaining program, which is our operating program for organizations, festivals and arts organizations, we have uh, realized that it's very hard to plan in this environment. And organizations um, are not able to do their, their their work in a way that they are used to. So right before you today, you have the sustained grant recommendations that you already, I believe, um, you know, passed. Uh, this is a way to ensure that organizations that are, that are just keeping the lights on and doing what they need to do are able to do that work. We have the Activate um, um, uh, stream, which is really about supporting... Uh, any kind of activity. It's not about public presentation, but any kind of activity, everything from commissioning artists to do new work to actually collaborating and doing some interesting work or, or partnership work. Um, and then we have another stream which we are still working on, which we are calling Invent and Adapt. And the idea behind this is that we will be there with investments to ensure that the organizations that do want to do work and do want to come out have the have the resources and the tools to do the work. One of the big challenges, Councillor Henderson, as you know, is that the pandemic has has really now put into question both artistic and business models. 
So how do arts organizations that are very entrepreneurial and that are very um, are very uh, tied to their audiences, how do they come back? And so uh, this is an area where I think we we may need some more investment. Um, we we are lucky um, at the Arts Council that we have great support from all of you, and so we do have investments, new new investments coming in um, uh, this year and next year, uh, which we will use sort of judiciously. But I think for a recovery, if you want to think about a recovery, it's for the arts. It's going to be at least another two years before there is any recovery, because I don't believe there will be much of an opportunity for arts organizations to actually um, produce and present activity this year. So if we all get inoculated by this summer, there is a possibility that we'll have some kind of gathering, uh, whether people are going to go into theaters and whether they want to go and sit next to each other within six inches, that's a question. We've invested in some research with, with, uh, with Calgary Arts Development coming out of Calgary, looking at Edmonton and Calgary, particularly looking at, at public attitudes, not uh, arts organizations, but, but audiences. Um, so, you know, any kind of investment is, is actually welcome. But my, my only thing is that my team, um, we, are, we are quite strategic in how we're doing these investments. And so we would like to have more consultations with the arts community and, with, and if, if possible, with council to ensure that if, if there is, if funds are available uh, and that we do get new funds, that they're invested in a way that makes sense. Great, thanks. I have one more question, but I'm out of time. I'll come on for a second round. Okay, uh, Councilor Rickey. Thank you, Sanjay. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, go ahead. Thanks, Sanjay, for the presentation and update. Um, I have been, uh, my office has been hearing of late from, um, I guess they'd be private, private sector venues, live music venues who are in desperate straits, and and I haven't, um, I haven't, I don't have an answer for them. Uh, do you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I don't actually, Councillor McKean, but I think we have had discussions on this subject. Um, some cities in the country have gone the road, have gone the route of actually creating, creating. Uh, specific bylaws for live venues. How successful they've been is a, is a difficult thing to gauge. Um, I, there, I, there, there, there aren't that many direct subsidy opportunities. Uh, there are some that are happening, but I mean, again, the idea of people gathering in a venue, it's a big question mark right now. Uh, yeah, I, yeah I, I think the public health issues have made it impossible and yet, obviously, they're covering costs and our important uh, hospitality venues, live music. Uh, I personally think is critical to a, to a city's sense of self and, and, and quality of life. Um, but it, it maybe uh, maybe I'll shoot you an email offline about that just to see if there's okay. either, we could yep. talk about that further. The other thing I wanted to ask was because I um, just want to give you this opportunity and to plain language this for us. Um, we are, the city of Edmonton is uh, in a budget bind. Uh, everybody's going to be in a budget bind and, and we're going to want to help out as many people as we can. And I, I know the arts community overall would be suffering during this pandemic. Do you have anything to offer? You know, it might be for the next council, more than so than this one, but why investment in the arts might be critical to the future economic prosperity of this city? Well, and, and that's a really good question. Uh, the economic piece is not talked about as much. And, you know, artists um, and, 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 and the arts, you know, when I did my budget presentation now two years ago to all of you, um, the, uh, on a very conservative level, the... the um, the, the total economic output of what happens when there is arts activity in our community um, what comes from comes from a study done by PACE, which is now almost three and a half years old, four years old, 
And at that point, the economic output was about estimated to be about $105 million. Um, we, and this is not necessarily counting all the investments that happen with public art. And, uh, you know, because a lot of the art is made made here and the artists who, who, who we commission uh, live here. And so the economic uh, impact of the arts just from arts organizations and festivals and, and individual artists is about 105 million. The multiplier effect is something that I it's, it's difficult to actually put a finger on, but but it is it is a sector which which is um, some. I mean, it's it's more. It's if you look at it cumulatively, it seems to be more than 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 the professional sports sector sometimes, right? Yeah. Um, it's just it's just that we don't we don't actually think about it that way because the benefits that the arts bring to each one of us are are quite transformative and quite uh, important. And yeah. the biggest one is it allows us to gather and come together as a community. Yeah, my assumption is there will be sectors like, broadly speaking, the social service sector that will be under increasing pressure to show outcomes. And I, I want, you know, it's a little unfair to show all the outcomes that a piece of public art might have, but that might be something that's coming for your sector too. And I, you, you probably don't have a ton of sophisticated measurements yet. No. No. Yeah. No. But, but we are working on it. Just so that you know, we are equipping ourselves and not just because of the current situation. We're equipping ourselves because I think it's important that the public understand when there is public investment, what, what the impact of that investment actually brings to our community. And there is a multiplier effect, but there is also a real effect, economic impact. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, just to, the other half of my question, just to go back to it again, is it strikes me that, as I think it's becoming clear to us, that as we go into the summer, um, that there's not going to be any magic switch where everything will go back to normal. This is going to be a very gradual process. Um, and and I'm just wondering, you know, about ways in which the city can work together with Arts Council uh, to really think through how we can help Edmontonians in a larger sense with that kind of, with that gradual process. Um, you know, I think, I think that, I think it sounds like that's going to be one of the focuses that the city will have over the course of the next few months, is what happens with that slow reopening, which in some ways may be more painful than anything. Um, and I'm just, and it seems to me that they, that, you know, working in tandem with the arts, there may be some, 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 ways, some ways to, to steer our way through that. And just your thoughts on that. Uh, well, that's, that's really good. And uh, again, it's aligned with connections and exchanges. In fact, one of the things that connections and exchanges talks about is the work that we're do that we will be doing with the city itself. And, um, I can, I know the city manager is on, on this, uh, call. And I can see Catherine Owen, who's, who's there, uh, who I can, I can see her face. Um, but one of the things is that we are, we are working quite closely already. And very soon, I believe, we will have the opportunity of joining our, our, our colleagues on, the, you know, on their interdepartmental committees that are so important to ensure that the city plan and the city strategy is implemented. So the, having the voice of the arts... Um, often is a, a way for planning and um, other other parts, you know, other parts of the operation of, of the city uh, to bring some creativity and some out-of-the-box thinking. And, and artists in our community are very good at doing that. In fact, pandemic or no pandemic, people are still extraordinarily resilient and, um, uh, you know, forward-thinking. And if you just walk, if you, I mean, some of you probably have seen it, but... The, the winter festivals have done an amazing job. I went, I went to Borden Park um, yeah, on, on, on Friday. Uh, it was very, very cold. It was minus thirty. <laughs> but, but the installations and the amounts, of the, the things that they've done in Borden Park, you know, there were people walking around because people are hungry. So there are ways that we can make our city come back, and some of them, some of them will will involve sort of cross sector kinds of you know partnerships with small business or with you know with city or so I have no doubt that that kind of work is going to only pick up steam 
and it's again, it's I, I think it's it's something that is bred into the EAC's DNA because the arts community does that all the time. It, you know, it does it naturally. Uh, it's very hard to put any kind of artistic performance or artistic event on unless you are collaborative and you think outside the box because there is, you know, the amount of public investment that goes into the arts um, is often between 15 and 20 percent of, of, of a budget. And so the rest of the money has to come by being inventive and by having an audience and having, having private donations. So I don't know whether I've answered your question. Yeah, but. no, that's great. I, I asked him back because I know in part I, I see that Ms. Owens listening as well. I think there's a, I, you know, I think I think we're going to we're going to understand over the course of the summer that the arts is a resource for that's going to be very helpful and useful to us. So I really just wanted to ask the question out loud with everybody here in the same room. Um, and I think the administration is already understanding that. I just thought it was useful to have everybody sort of think through that a little bit. So thank you. And I too, I went. I went on Monday to, to deep freeze. It was it was very cold. I was not by any means the only person there, which I thought was exciting and impressive. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for the presentation. I don't see any other questions, which means that uh, it was uh, very informative. Um, if there's no one to move this to be received for information, I will make that motion. And. Um, uh, if there are no other comments, then we can just vote on this. So thank you again, Sanjay, for coming in. Um, thank you so much. Don't see anyone want, wishing to speak. Um, and we've got the casted motion up, and the vote is coming in, I'm assuming. We just need your vote, Chair Paquette. I've got that spinning wheel, so I'm a yes. Thank you. So that's all the votes. Thank you. And that is passed unanimously. Um, indication that uh, we understand the importance of the arts in our community. Thank you very much. We will now move to item 6.5. Uh, it is the second time specific of the, uh, the hour here. So. Um, this is 2021 Investments and Organizations. Uh, is there a presentation? Mr. Chair, um, we're actually on 611, which was the other item oh, that replaced that as the second item at 1.30. Ah, we did make that the second item? Yes, we did. Okay. And uh, did we pass that as the second item? Okay. So yes, my mistake. 6.5 was passed um, as oh, it wasn't selected right. for debate. Okay. Well, I've got it as selected. My bad. This is great. Uh, 611. We're a little more, more lean than I had feared. Uh, Mr. Chair, just to uh, briefly introduce this item, um, 611. Um, our team on this item this, this afternoon is uh, David Aiken, branch manager, uh, John Simmons, director from our Community Standards and Neighborhoods branch. Uh, we also have Christina Hodgson from Legal Services. If there's questions in that domain. And also on the call, as we had last time, is uh, Dr. Colleen St. Clair, uh, Professor of Biological Sciences from the U of A. Very briefly, Mr. Chair, based on the feedback committee provided at last uh, committee meeting on February 3rd, we're providing an alternate version uh, of the proposed bylaw amendments that you saw two weeks ago. Attachment one in the report is the original version um, that was prevented previously, for your information. Attachment 2 then provides a version where the previous section 6.3 is now uh, reduced and simplified and presented as section 6.22. This is the version that administration is recommending. And then thirdly, another version is presented in attachment 3, which removes the, the uh, clause altogether. With that, we can hear from the speakers and then administration can answer your questions. Okay, so uh, speakers understand uh, the uh, protocols that we have in place. You've been here before. Um, and for everyone's benefit, I will just uh, remind you that we have a number of incredibly important issues to get to today, this being one of them. So uh, please uh, govern yourselves accordingly. All right, and so our first speaker will be 
Um, and I can't find it. <laughs> so, for some reason, it's not on my list. Uh, and that is awkward. So, clerks, if you can name uh, one of the speakers, please. So, first on this item, we have um, Alan Picard. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, my name is Dr. Alan Picard. I'm an emergency physician and resident of Laurier Heights, a uh, wildlife sighting hotspot here in Edmonton. Uh, today I'm going to share specific concerns and solutions regarding language in the current proposed bylaw. As well, I'm going to bring to the forefront the very real risks to human health at issue. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, regarding the versions of the bylaw, we actually favor option one, uh, with one important exception, uh, section 6.3a. Hearing the concerns of other residents, the fallen fruit issue is viscerally controversial and threatens public acceptance of this bylaw. Uh, next slide. Uh, a strength in version one is that it provides specific language around bird feeding that versions two and three do not. Uh, this point is important um, because it makes clear that the kind of bird feeding most Edmontonians do, next, is okay, next, uh, but that excessive bird feeding, the kind that attracts hundreds of scavenger birds and coyotes, next, uh, is not okay. Um, next slide. Between versions 2 and 3, we also prefer version 2. On close read, though, there is a disabling contradiction written into the bylaw, uh, which I'm going to outline. Please follow along. Um, section 2N, next, states that uh, wildlife uh, does not include feral cats and birds. Next. Section 2 or 6.21 states that a person may not feed. Next. Wildlife, feral cats, or birds, leading to a next nuisance condition. Well, what's a nuisance condition? Uh, 6.3 three attempts to specify what a nuisance condition is shown in this blue box next um, however um, next it is only in respect of wildlife as i just stated section 2n states that wildlife does not include feral cats or birds next as written then the specific behavior defining a nuisance excludes birds and feral cats this is a problem uh, therefore Leaving a mound of raw meat in a fenced off yard, but accessible by hundreds of birds leading to the spread of this raw meat and bird feces to surrounding properties and parks would remain completely legal. Um, this kind of bird feeding happens. I see it every day in my neighborhood. And sadly, it is perfectly legal. This contradiction will impact the bylaws effectiveness and ought to be addressed. Next slide. The solution would be to either one, include birds and feral cats in the definition of wildlife, or two, specify what a nuisance condition is in respect of wildlife, birds, and feral cats. Next slide. Um, the risks that habituated urbanized wildlife and wildlife feeding cause are real and worthy of our concern. Over the weekend, I teleconferenced with Dr. Stan Houston, the North American expert on human alveolar echinococcus, a fatal illness caused by the parasite Echinococcus multilocularis. Next. This parasite is transmitted to humans by coyote feces entering our food chain. Examples being from neighborhood garden vegetables that have come in contact with coyote stool. It is also transmitted from domestic dogs that have contacted coyote stool through sniffing and rolling behavior, like in a dog park, and brought it home in their fur. Once a human is infected, and after a prolonged incubation period, it is a fatal illness unless detected and treated with an indefinite duration of antimicrobials and major abdominal surgery. Most recent evidence shows 25 to 80 percent of Alberta's coyotes carry the parasite. Next slide. In fact, uh, Edmonton, an area, is a hotspot globally for the zoonotic illness, as this graphic, recently accepted for publication, shows. Both in our conversation and in published work, Dr. Houston makes clear that greater urbanization of coyotes will lead to an increasing prevalence of this fatal illness. This growing health concern is now part of my diagnostic consideration when I treat patients presenting with fever, abdominal pain, or a liver mass in my emergency department. 
I have treated patients that have been attacked by coyotes in urban areas. These patients require a full trauma assessment, sutures, an expensive, painful injection of rabies immune globulins around their wounds, a vaccination, and follow up with public health. Next slide. As a frontline medical doctor in the era of COVID sweeping global disruption, I am concerned with the growing evidence around this novel fatal zoonotic illness. And I'm concerned about increasing reports of habituated coyotes injuring humans. As a city, we should also be concerned and put our efforts into preventing these problems by creating this bylaw. An ounce of prevention will always be better than a pound of cure. Next slide. To close, uh, we resolutely support a wildlife feeding bylaw. We have offered suggestions on how it could be more clear and effective. This is a chance to be on the prevention end of a public health problem. And we are eager to assist in this endeavor. And thank you for your time today. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to uh, Darcia Wasserab Roland, and uh, you have five minutes. Unfortunately, Darcia is not available to come this afternoon. Uh, my name is Lasha Krejci, and I'm a third speaker. She is giving me permission to do and read her presentation today, if that's all right. Yeah, please proceed. You have five Thank minutes. Okay, my name is Darcia Rotserab Roland. I am a longtime resident of Edmonton and a supporter of healthy coexistence of humans and wildlife in Edmonton. I would like to emphasize some of the points that have been raised by Dr. Picard by outlining some specific scenarios. Problems, in fact, problems that have happened in Edmonton and continue to happen. I ask those of you here to ask yourselves how this bylaw will fix these problems. Number one, a dog owning resident faces expensive vet bills from her dog eating raw meat dropped into her backyard by birds that feed on raw meat left in the do yard two doors down from her. This resident is myself. How will this bylaw fix this problem? Multiple citizens have observed the same SUV around all corners of our city, depositing raw meat, animal food, bread crumbs, and seed in alleyways and ravines. The identity of this person is known, and the behavior has been reported to bylaw, Edmonton Police, Alberta Health Services, Fish and Wildlife, and City Councilors. Yet the behavior continues with impunity. How will bylaw fix this problem? A resident leaves piles of seed, meat, and dog food in their fenced yard, attracting hundreds of scavenger birds, coyotes, and feral cats daily to an area adjacent to other houses and a public park. These areas are now covered in bird and animal feces, which are known to cause deadly zoonotic diseases. A child said was ripped out of his hands by a startled coyote at the Toboggan Hill, 100 meters away from this property this December. Decades of attempts to curb this behavior, including accessing mental health resources for the individual, deploying bird deterrent techniques, direct empathetic and sympathetic diplomacy have been ineffective. Inviting this neighbor for coffee to talk about the problem has been ineffective. The feeding continues and worsens. How will this bylaw fix the problem? Please consider these real fact-based problems and how this bylaw is going to fix them. In addition, no matter which of the revisions to this bylaw is ultimately chosen, we encourage the city to include escalating fine amounts for repeat offenders. This was included in the first revision of the bylaw that was presented to the committee in November 2020 and is in line with other wildlife feeding bylaws in other jurisdictions, notably Clearwater County, Alberta, Vancouver, BC, where the fines can go up to $2,500 for repeat offenses. The City of Toronto imposes fines up to 5000 for depositing food from wildlife in parks. Darcy apologized for not being able to be here to speak, but thank you for considering this bylaw. And thank you for allowing me to do the presentation. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, we'll now move on to uh, Julia Galili. Mr. Chair, we've been informed that Julia was not able to make it back for this time. Okay, understood. And last but not least, uh, Charlie Richmond. Uh, I was think I was third on the list as well. Okay. Am I on? 
Lasha. With Charlie Richmond here. Yeah, oh, you okay. got your five minutes, Charlie. Go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, counselors. We're back again. A decade ago, anything as arcane as bylaw details might attract only the rare speaker. We take some joy in our more involved public. It may be hard on admin and worse for a counselor, but our democracy is predicated on the scrutiny. Thanks so much for this opportunity to speak. Okay, our bottom line. We recommend removal of section 6.3 per attachment 3. In other words, we recommend attachment 3. And this is over retention through editorial contortions incorporating into section 6.2, and that's per attachment 2. Sierra Club's uh, interest in environmental uh, bylaw, which will be endorsed by the, uh, the public, be enforceable and accomplish its intended goals. And uh, we hold a long record in support of law and regs which foster conservation. But badly crafted law works against public respect, creates confusion, and invites litigation. Had this bylaw been passed as originally submitted, I'd have arranged to have a neighbor file a carefully framed complaint, politely, politely accepted a citation, and proceeded to appeal. Whatever it takes to have workable bylaw in the interest of environmental practice. We don't dispute the intent of this bylaw, and we endorse uh, the explicit citation of coyotes. But there could be additional context to frame the black letters. Uh, and I should mention that um, uh, if Colleen's on the, um, uh, on the line, uh, she'll recall that I actually delivered a dead coyote from my yard to her door, uh, which was diseased. So judging by practice in most Canadian municipalities, the goal of reducing unintended attraction of wildlife through feeding is best addressed through education with bylaw as the backup. So we add a recommendation to administration that future draft bylaw might be submitted along with an outline of proposed educational context. Generally, the rationale for specific prescriptions in a bylaw should be reserved for its uh, small r recitals, not, not customarily included in bylaw, but which can be addressed in its contextual frame. So we'd recommend that the rationale supporting and the supporting science not be included within bylaw. Uh, a problematic example can be set found uh, right now in section 62 sub 1, which states that person shall not feed, attempt to feed or deposit food on land they own for consumption of wildlife in a way that uh, that leads to a public safety risk, health risk, or nuisance condition. Now, um, with the test of nuisance condition uh, elaborated under Section C, sub-subsection C, is habituation, food conditioning, or increased presence of wildlife to the area generally. However, with the naive citizen or my bylaw officer know whether there has been attributable habituation or food conditioning. These are terms of the trade in animal behavioral science. These metrics are the stuff of research and refereed publication. The lay person is unlikely to have a clue as to their meanings, much less what the test may be. The metric is not as obvious as reading kilometers per hour on one speedometer, against which we have other bylaws. How about damage to neighboring properties? How would the offender know? How might it be proven that a tidbit left on the backyard picnic table lured wildlife into foraging in one neighbor's yet one's neighbor's yard? Maybe it was caused by the existence of a nearby park. And culpability may be questioned. And further, however, would the bylaw officer know when an offense rises to a violation under these metrics? And what is the evidentiary value of arbitrary judgment? These sections belong in background educational materials. Just stick to simple prescriptions, as, for example, the City of Champions um, bylaw, Section 7.8, and Calgary's Community Standards bylaw. A, no owner or occupier of a premises shall allow it on the premises the accumulation of A, any material that creates unpleasant owners, B, any material likely to attract pests, or C, animal remains, parts of animal remains, or animal feces. The context for this Calgary bylaw is a couple of pages of principles and rationale, but well-worded and worth perhaps more than the bylaw proper in accomplishing the goals. It begins, we're fortunate to have nature on our doorstep. Our urban setting coexists with nature in our parks, backyards, and in our communities. Please let nature be wild and refrain from approaching or feeding wild animals. Secure garbage and pet food and eliminate other potential food sources such as pet waste that may attract wildlife. If you have bird feeders in your yard, please keep them clean and the area underneath clean. Who could resist that? 
So let's go with attachment three, dropping the inclusion of technical terms and rolling it out with a positive publicity in an educational feature. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, that will take us to the conclusion of our speakers. Um, I don't see any questions for our speakers. Uh, I do have a question. I did ask to speak on my own behalf. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, if you speak on someone else's behalf, that is actually considered your time. I didn't realize that. Thank you. Okay. Um, we do have uh, Councillor Hamilton on board. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you um, to all the speakers who came out. I listened to the meeting. I wasn't able to attend the last meeting, so I, I listened to um, that discussion recently. Uh, and I know, Mr. Richmond, you're returning um, for this discussion. Um, uh, but I, and I've made some notes I'm going to ask administration about, including Dr. Picard, your uh, concerns about the definition of wildlife. Um, uh, I heard from Mr. Richmond that uh, there is a concern regarding the ambiguity of cause and effect. Is that accurate, Mr. Richmond, that you see a little piece of or that maybe someone forgot to clean up the backyard picnic and now you're seeing damage to your property and you're worried about that correlation. Is that accurate? Well, I'm, I'm just wondering if the, I want this bylaw to be defensible. I want it to be defensible in the eyes of citizens and in our courts. Um, yeah. or, and, and so um, I guess I would like, I would like some cleaning up on this uh, in five minutes. We don't have time to really go through this. Um, how does this happen? Uh, perhaps there's enough um, uh, enough feedback from these two sessions that, in fact, um, uh, several of the participants would might be invited for informal discussions. Um, mine, by the way, comes obviously comes from um, advice of, of, um, of both uh, wildlife experts and and lawyers, but uh, and I pretend to be neither. Um, so. Um, uh, but but there are certainly people that, that that would be more than willing to assist administration in this. As and I believe that you, both you've heard from some, and and there's some uh, certainly in, in university. Just I, this morning, I, okay, okay. Sorry, thanks. I I appreciate that, Mr. Richmond. Um, I think uh, we're, we're, I'm gonna. I've made a note to ask administration about that because I think uh, this is coming. Um, under as an amendment to a larger bylaw, and I think uh, some daylighting on how enforcement works around that is um, is warranted. Um, but that is to say, um, Miss Miss uh, Cratchy, um, you could maybe speak to some of the, uh, I would say, un um, uh, undeniable impacts uh, to your property of having. Um, the wanton feeding of wildlife. Could you briefly talk about um, some of those impacts that you see on your property? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I muted it. Um, I have seen on my property this fall increased amounts of coyote feces, as well as across the street on the private park of Laurier Park. Uh, we have numerous walkers here, dog walkers. Um, my dog specifically have stepped on coyote poop. Uh, I've had to wash their feet. Uh, I've had to deworm them with a specific dewormer that will kill that parasite from the vet. The veterinarian has major concerns about this. Um, I deworm them also for my peace of mind, so I don't pick up the parasite because there's a long inoc inoculation period. So those are some of the things that I'm seeing in this area. I'm finding droppings of huge raw pieces of meat, winter and summer, in my backyard. My dogs have picked it up. I'm ending up with expensive uh, veterinarian bills because they don't eat raw food. And one particular dog has um, Crohn's disease. Uh, can you imagine that? So that is not good for a specific diet at all. So that's a concern. I'm awakened many times during the night by my dogs barking at the front window. And just last week were four coyotes on my street um, with the intention of looking at that neighbor's home waiting for food. That's what it appeared to me. I've, I've learned to 
read them a little bit because I've been here for 40 years in the Laurier Heights region and um, I've been stalked uh, right on my property, actually on the, on the street on my property and it's, it's getting to be too much. There are too many running rapid and they're being habituated in this area. Um, thank you for that. And with my last seconds, I'll turn to Dr. Picard. Thank you for um, speaking today about some of the health considerations. We heard speakers last time who were concerned that this is about the coyotes. And having talked to you and your neighbors, I don't think this is about the coyotes at all. So, you know, um, um, piggybacking on what Ms. Krejci has said, um, could you uh, maybe talk about what this is about for you in terms of habituation and health? Certainly. Um, so I think the the core issue is actually the inappropriate attraction of uh, of wildlife and scavenger birds uh, to residential areas or, or really to anywhere in the city. Um, one thing that I can speak personally uh, about is I, I live close to Lasha Krejci and um, this neighbor in, in, in particular and I really don't want to berate an individual. I just want to speak for anyone who's had be in this circumstance and may be in this circumstance down the road. Um, the glaring lack of, of, of enforcement to say that, you know, it's not okay to put a mound, literally a mound of raw meat and bird seed in your front yard, covering an area of four or five square meters that attracts hundreds of gulls, corvids, pigeons, squirrels, eagles, coyotes <laughs> to one yard and the resulting excrements on the surrounding properties and parkland, uh, including on my house, which, um, you know, believe me, I'll, I'll take any excuse to go use my hands and work on my place, but I don't enjoy crawling up on my roof and cleaning up my eaves twice a year, just full, overflowing with um, gall feces. Uh, I don't feel totally safe uh, letting my three and soon four kids just out to play in my front yard when I often spot coyote feces on my front yard, knowing full well that it's a potentially dangerous vector of a serious illness. And um, there, there is no, um, I understand the other residents concerned about the wording of the bylaw, but um, we have to have some common sense and, and, and the city has to have some common sense to be able to have a bylaw that looks at that kind of activity and just says, wait a sec, this is just plain wrong. Um, this needs to be addressed. Uh, so okay. that's sort of my personal take. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, I don't see any other questions for uh, our speakers, so thank you very much. We will now move to questions for administration. And uh, if uh, there's no other uh, folks on the list, I will uh, start that out. And uh, so hearing what we've heard today, uh, this is our second crack at it. Uh, do you feel like we need a, a third attempt to get this right? Or do you think uh, this captures people's concerns and that there can be adjustments made along the way. But then again, that, any adjustments that have to be brought forward as well. So just your thoughts, how we can actually deal with this expeditiously and, uh, and uh, actually, you know, as close as is possible, which is a far cry from perfect on this issue uh, to just deal with uh, these concerns. Oh, thanks, Councillor. Maybe I'll ask Mr. Aiken to uh, weigh in on that and maybe uh, the law branch as well. But go ahead, Mr. Aiken. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think with any with any bylaw, uh, adding in new sections always has that sort of unknown element to it. Uh, for us, when we, uh, you know, happy to take any direction from committee, uh, you know, we've talked through this. You know, we I think we have a reasonable understanding of the, the nature of public complaints that we do get and uh, the gap that's currently uh, we suffer under to try to help them uh, resolve these situations. We think this bylaw is fairly straightforward, uh, consistent. Um, you know, our learned friends from the law branch gave, gives, gives us great advice relative to capturing the right language to allow us to be successful, not so much in court, but to communicate to the public. And obviously with any bylaw, new bylaw amendment, we will make, uh, you know, great strides in educating and making people aware of what those rules are. But the language has to be captured within the bylaw that gives clear direction for an offence to occur and things like that. We think this bylaw does that. Um, and so once the bylaw is passed, obviously, as a standard approach, we would create the standard operating procedures, the policies to provide direction to our enforcement officers. And as mentioned by some of the speakers, 
providing that additional clarity in interpretation of what is a nuisance, what is public risk and health. And obviously the courts end up giving us clarity as to, yes, you're spot on and we've got you know, many years of history of doing that, uh, or there needs to be adjustments, and we're happy to bring those adjustments back to, to committee for any, any, any change. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, it should be understood that uh, no bylaw uh, that we work on is, uh, is perfectly formed, that common sense dictates that we adjust as we go along, but we don't actually know the precise ways to adjust until we start putting something into practice, and that way we can uh, learn from experience. So some of these suggestions that are here today that could possibly be incorporated into bylaw may still find their way in, but we have to start from somewhere. And this is your recommended sort of launching point. Do I have that correct? Yeah, that, that is correct. I mean, I, I think the, the, the speakers bring up some valid points, but I think that's valid for any piece of legislation, new legislation that we, we put into play, and that's a, it's a learning experience. But right now, uh, based on our discussions and understanding the situation, uh, we don't have any issues with uh, moving it forward. Okay, and uh, the speakers can submit uh, uh, their presentations and their uh, recommendations to you, and you will consider them, especially going forward. Is that Do I have that correct as well? Oh, absolutely, sir. Yeah, okay, great. So with, with, with all of that understood, I am going to uh, move the recommendation uh, that uh, bylaw 19553 is set out in attachment two of uh, February 17th, 2021, Citizen Services Report, CS00237 REV, uh, be given the appropriate readings. That will be, uh, that's what I move now. If there's any debate on that, let me know. And this is to just uh, introduce us really quickly. It's just in the understanding that this is going to be an evolving document. But if there is debate, uh, we should have it out uh, right now, I guess. Uh, so we will now move to, and if you don't mind, Councillor Hamilton, Councillor Nickel has uh, hopped on the board. No, I can wait for Councillor Hamilton. Oh, okay, no. great. Go ahead, Councillor Hamilton. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad that you've moved it. Um, I, I, uh, I'm in support of this bylaw um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I don't have a vote on this committee, um, but uh, I, I want to talk to administration. We had a question about the definition of wildlife and it excluded birds and feral cats um, and uh, I think as Dr. Picard pointed out that creates some problems in terms of um, the, being able to clean up some of the nuisance uh, mess um, that that sometimes comes with uh, feeding wildlife um, and uh, I was wondering if you had some clarity around that definition. Uh, yes, Councillor, uh, Dr. Picard was spot on, and actually I'll turn it over to uh, Christina Hodgson from our law branch to provide uh, an overview of what uh, the doctor was uh, concerned about uh, in the um, definition. Thanks so much, David. Um, so, Dr. Picard, I just want to say thanks for bringing it up. Um, saves me from having be, to be the first one to say it. Um, we actually have a motion that clerks have assisted us in drafting to slightly amend the bylaw. Um, that is a little gap that does exist right now. Um, the definition of wildlife was actually drafted very carefully to exclude birds and uh, feral cats because there are some other issues that we are dealing with on that front. However, um, that section that does speak about what nuisance is, does need to include those two pieces. Um, so we are going to um, provide wording on that amendment and what it will look like to include very specifically wildlife, birds and feral cats um, in regards to nuisance. That's uh that sounds excellent. Um, in my slide, I did have a uh, slide that had um, a solution to that, and I just wrote the uh, extra text in red. Great. I think we'll get an amendment on the floor. Um, I, I have three minutes left to ask questions of administration. Um, uh, we heard some concerns both the, today, uh, Mr. Aiken, and last week, uh, a few weeks ago, about education, why um, some concerns that this would be heavy handed. Why aren't we going to education? Um, can you briefly touch on the, like, we still do education, right? This isn't the first, the first place that city administration will go, correct? Oh, absolutely. Education and awareness is always our starting point when it comes to any existing legislation and in particular new legislation. So certainly we will be making those efforts 
communicating that there is uh, a new requirement and standard uh, where there's previously been a gap and we'll be uh, looking for that voluntary compliance from citizens in regards to this new this new change. Yeah, and, and for communities that might be concerned, there's actually um, folks that will come out to your community group or your community league meeting, uh, either in person or virtually, and, and give a presentation on um, sort of how to coexist safely with uh, the wildlife in our river valley, correct? That is correct. We have a wildlife team and I'm happy to uh, provide educational opportunities for communities and neighbourhoods in regards to that, for sure. Um, and we've had, I, I think you covered the enforceableness question with uh, Councillor Paquette, um, but we did have a question from one of the speakers about the escalating fine amounts. Um, and could you speak to where uh, your team went with that discussion uh, uh, and uh, in terms of this bylaw? So maybe I'll just ask uh, Christina just to outline the progression of fines and then I'll, I'll uh, round it off. Thank you. Um, so as with all of our bylaws, the fines in this bylaw are mandatory minimums. Um, so basically the minimum fine on a ticket is the amount that is outlined in the bylaw. And then that can increase if someone does something more than once, if their behavior escalates, basically we would require them to go to court. We would issue a different kind of ticket. Um, and then that way the fine could also increase at the same time um, because of the historical behavior. Uh, oh, sorry, Mr. Aiken. Uh, so, so as you know, our, our standard approach is a progression model of seeking voluntary compliance, uh, educating first awareness, seeking voluntary compliance using specified penalties, and if we get a repeat occurrence of the offence and they're not uh, being serious or we need to send a stronger message or act as a deterrent, we can certainly, you know, uh, impose other sanctions. And so that is the sort of the process, but... But again, um, you know, we, we don't envision, uh, you know, historically we haven't had a lot of complaints. And so, you know, we, we think we can um, move the dial on those properties where we are getting, uh, you know, chronic uh, problems and uh, continue to educate citizens uh, who may be uh, wanting to try some of these you know, different approaches where the bylaw simply says you can't do that. All right. And that's my time. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Nickel. So, oh, Mr. Aiken, remember the birdhouse in my ward? Remember that a couple years ago? We had a guy. Uh, I have some recollection. Yeah, uh, throwing bird seed right across the crescent, all over people's cars. <laughs> it was pretty crazy. Do you recall that one? Uh, I, I recall. Um and a number of very similar incidences. So yes, I uh, I don't know it's been a problem in the past. So is this is in addressing the the birdhouse, the infamous birdhouse of Ward Eleven? Let's call it that. This bylaw will that will give you more tools to deal with those kinds of individuals. Just a yes or a no. Yes. Okay, that's good because it was very frustrating, as you recall, for years trying to deal with that particular house. So, but number two, this bylaw you would not consider finished, would you? I would like to say to the speakers, or can I say with confidence to the speakers, that uh, if they have some amendments, right, we can they can send them to our office and we can put them in front of you in due course. Yeah, our, our, yeah, absolutely. Happy to take any input from any of the speakers or outside uh, experts relative to the bylaw. I, I think the the proof of how successful it will be will be our application and implementation of it and, and how the courts see our approach to uh, dealing with those um, problem areas. Yeah, and, and it's, it's important to mention the courts, is it not, Mr. Aiken, in the sense that we're going to have to field test some of these, these new regs, are we not, as to their being applicable or even enforceable in the court, correct? Uh, that is correct. Yeah, so there are some limitations that we do have to test out. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Nickel. Uh, Councillor Nack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to put that amendment on the floor that had been referenced. Uh, so I, I think I'll read it out here that section 6.23 of bylaw 19553 attachment 2 be amended by adding uh, feral cats or birds after in respect of wildlife. 
and that bylaw 19553 as amended and set out and attached. Oh, that's already on the floor. So that's just the amendment, sorry. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, any debate? Any more questions? All right. Uh, please vote. Oh, I did, I did not ask if anyone wanted to close. No, okay, please vote. And just to clarify, Mr. Chair, at this point, we would just be voting on the amendment, unless you want oh, to restate the motion yeah, okay, to let's vote, vote on, on it all. Yes, you could yeah. also restate it to vote on it all at once, but that's up to you. Let's do the amendment, and then we'll just do it in the proper steps. It's easier for keeping minutes. Yes. I am a yes. And Councillor Zadig? Yes. That's all the votes. Yes. Display the vote, please. That is unanimous. Now we will uh, vote on the motion proper. Um, any debate? Any closing arguments? Not seeing any. Let's vote. Yes. I am a yes. The vote is just coming your way now. And to confirm, Councillor Zadok, were you a yes? Yes, yes, I was. Thank you. That's all the votes. Okay, display the votes, please. And that is carried unanimously. Okay, so uh, I'm going to put it to council really or to committee. It's uh, two forty-seven. We did not finish our item from this morning. Uh, we still have uh, Indigenous housing to get to, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls to get to. And uh, we have got a time specific for traffic bylaw changes at 3.45 p.m. And we've been uh, asked if perhaps we could um, uh, scoot that forward to another meeting. Um, and we still have amendments to fire rescue services bylaw. Yeah, Mr. 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 Chairman. Update. So uh, I guess what I'm looking for is, uh, is there an order in which you would prefer to do this? Do you want to finish up the business from this morning? Uh, so that we're done and then we're free and clear for the rest, or do you have a preference? Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me just take taking a look at my inquiry and that it's tied to the report on, uh, on the Hope Mission Project update. I would like to deal with them to and move it to the next meeting, given the, you know, we have to prioritize here, and you're, as you correctly say, some of these things are bigger than what I've, what I've got on the table here. Minor mechanical and structural questions that will take a bit of time to get into. So okay. I, I just certainly should move my inquiry and uh, tied to the whole mission report uh, to the next meeting, if that's amiable to everyone. It is to me. Um, I'll just seek unanimous assent. Uh, anyone uh, in opposition to that? No? Thank you very much. Okay. And um, we've also got the vehicle noise enforcement as well. And we've got speakers for uh, that as well. So um, I think that if uh, there are no objections, we'll just continue with the item from this morning and then start hammering away at the next items as we can. Okay. Uh, we are now, Mr. Mr. Chair, sorry, I just want to double check. I, we had received an email asking about overflow for next week. Is that still happening? Are uh, we considering that? Well, yeah, we can overflow. Um, if, but I know that we do have requests to speak. And so, uh, the, there's, it's, it's like, there's requests from speakers to overflow, but also speakers who would like to get it over with today. Yeah. The reason I ask is that if we're, if we're planning on using overflow, then I don't think I would necessarily move any items off like if but if we aren't planning on using the, that overflow time then 
I could, like, for example, I would be happy to move the fire rescue one to a future meeting because I think our speaker is going to ask for some opportunity for engagement. But if it's coming up next week anyways, then the, then there's a week for them to maybe do some of that engagement. So I'm just not sure if we're planning on extending this meeting to next week yet. Well, next Tuesday is a half day, and uh, it's probably not going to be too heavy. We might We may actually have an extra hour or so on our hands. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't know if uh, all members of the committee have responded to that email yet. So uh, maybe maybe I'll just wait to see uh, if we have the results of that. Because if yeah. we are using next week, then I could just let our agenda flow. Okay. Well, if uh, if anyone has any suggestions um, as we move forward, just uh, sort of get them together, and let's just finish up with six one, and uh, then we can uh, determine some more things. Because. Uh, we will have a break coming up as well, and it would be nice if we could get maybe two items in before the break and then have that discussion. If that makes sense, everyone, uh, let's move on to item 6.1. And uh, it's questions of administration, if any. So I'll give you a second if you wanted to get your name up on there. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone with questions for administration, uh, which leads me to believe that uh, everyone is ready for a vote. Are there, does anyone want to make any, uh, um, I'll just look for one more time if anyone wants to speak. You can speak up if uh, you're not getting on the e-scribe. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's, uh, my understanding, if I remember the motion was it was designed to move questions and, and a further discussion up to council. Yep, that's right. Why nothing's happening right now, so that we would yep. have a chance to ask questions in, correct? That is correct. So okay. I just want to make sure that everyone uh, yep. no, feels I like had an opportunity. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, Councillor Nack, go ahead. Sorry, just as a, a point of order, uh, this was, I think, the mayor that moved the motion, and he is not here. D is it? I'm not actually sure how it works. Does he have to be here, being that he moved the motion, or are we able to vote on a motion by somebody who's not? currently in attendance or maybe he is here and I missed it I'm actually I should probably know that rule but I don't know seeking guidance from the clerks maybe well I'm not quite sure we've ever come across this one before I do know you can you can put a motion on the floor and not vote in favor of it and once it's on the floor it does belong to the body and seeing as this is a recommendation okay. to council I think it would be fine for committee to make that recommendation as the final approval will be happening next week Perfect. I, I'm, I'm guessing, it, I'm fine with it. I'm happy to support it. I just wanted to make sure we were following the rules. So uh, if that's acceptable, then uh, that's great. That was what I wanted to check on. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. Okay. And uh, does anyone want to speak to this motion before we uh, send this to council? No? Okay. Well, we will have another chance to, uh, to wax poetic if uh, anyone chooses uh, at another date. Um, but otherwise, I think we're ready for a vote. Yes. We have all the votes. And please display the vote. That is unanimous. Thank you to everyone who came out. Well done. And uh, we will now uh, celebrate for a brief two seconds and move on. So um, we are now moving to item 6.2, Indigenous Housing. And I understand that there's a presentation available um, as, and uh, we might as well go for it, I guess, if it's, if it's short and will help inform the discussion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think it will. We'll, we'll try to uh, shrink it as we go a little bit. There's, about, I think, about half a dozen slides, but we'll uh, try to be as quick as we possibly can. Uh, just quickly introduce our delegation on this one this afternoon. Uh, Jackie Ford, branch manager, branch manager of social development. Uh, Crystal Kajenner is also our director, also here, our director of affordable housing and homelessness. And I believe Rachel Putt is here as well. And we have a colleague from the law, from the uh, from law, uh, Jennifer Liddell. Um, just quickly, uh, a presentation on the current state of Indigenous-led affordable housing in Edmonton. While progress has been made to advance affordable housing projects over the last uh, couple of years, 
especially permanent supportive housing, as committee is well aware. We do know that indig Indigenous-led affordable housing is a demonstrated need within the affordable housing supply in our city. Uh, research from other jurisdictions provides some examples of how municipalities can incent the development of Indigenous-led projects and leverage funding opportunities provided by other orders of government. The city is committed uh, to advancing on reconciliation with Indigenous peoples through programs and projects, advocate for and developed in the spirit of co-creation. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Crystal Kajiner. Thanks, Rob. Uh, good afternoon, members of Community and Public Service Committee. Um, I'm here today with Rachel Putt, who is also the Program Manager for Policy Planning and Homelessness with my team, and her and I will be delivering the presentation together. Edmonton has the second largest urban Indigenous population in Canada. Many Indigenous peoples move to cities from neighboring communities in search of education, jobs, health care, and safe housing. Unfortunately, the core housing need for Indigenous people living in Edmonton is more than double compared to non-Indigenous people, and with First Nations um, rates more than triple. In addition, over 60% of people experiencing homelessness identify as Indigenous. The overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples within these statistics is shaped by the traumatic loss of land, language, culture, and families through our shared colonial history. The City of Edmonton is committed to changing these statistics. Next slide, please. Administration is aware of 931 housing units for Indigenous people in Edmonton. Most are a mix of affordable and supportive housing owned by First Nations housing corporations for their members and Indigenous nonprofit organizations. Non-Indigenous organizations also deliver housing units dedicated to Indigenous households through partnerships with Indigenous operators or through an intake process that prioritizes Indigenous applicants. Over 60% of the units are Indigenous owned and operated. You'll note this number is uh, two units higher than what was in the council report. Uh, that's because we've caught an error. Enoch Cree Nation actually owns 22 units of housing in the city, not 20. And an additional 132 units of Indigenous led affordable housing are currently under development or seeking funding and or land. This unit count does not include projects that are in the very early stages of development. Next slide, please. Indigenous specific affordable housing is funded by various programs at, at the provincial and federal levels. In 2018, the government of Alberta launched the Indigenous Housing Capital Program to increase the supply of affordable housing for Indigenous peoples through the construction and or through construction and planning dollars. Originally, this program was funded for $120 million, but was relaunched in the mid-2020 with a budget of $32 million and updated requirements for eligibility. There have been 58 project applications submitted to the provincial program since its launch, and funding has been approved for two construction projects, one of which is in Edmonton. There are three Edmonton-based projects that have been submitted to the program we launch in 2020 as well. Funding decisions for these applications are expected in 2021. The federal government also provides support for affordable housing through the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation using a mix of funding grants and loans to deliver $55 billion over 10 years as committed to the national housing strategy. It includes seed funding, planning dollars, and low interest loans for Indigenous organizations, First Nations, and other Indigenous groups seeking to build off-reserve housing. More recently, the Rapid Housing Initiative also committed $1 billion in funding across Canada through two different streams to expedite the delivery of affordable housing units especially for those impacted by COVID-19. The first stream expedited funding to municipalities and the second stream opened up or was open to indigenous governing bodies and organizations as well as provinces and the nonprofit organizations on a project by project basis. The city is aware of at least one indigenous led affordable housing project that has applied for funding under the project stream. And now I'll turn it over to Rachel. Thanks, Crystal. In order to provide a scan of what is happening to develop Indigenous housing in other municipalities, administration developed a survey that was responded to by 14 cities. Most municipalities identified a commitment to reconciliation and strategy documents. However, actions developed from these strategies varied. Some municipalities are in the process of identifying and understanding the Indigenous housing needs in their regions, while others have specific approaches to encourage Indigenous housing development through the provision of specific funding sources. For example, 
The city of Winnipeg has dedicated funding for Indigenous housing, which resulted in a mix of 267 new and repaired units between 2005 and 2019, while the city of Toronto is working to develop an Indigenous housing strategy. Next slide, please. Currently, the city does not have an Indigenous-led housing strategy, although administration does work with Indigenous housing organizations to advance affordable housing developments under the Affordable Housing Investment Program. Additional support to proponents is provided by way of letters of support for funding applications to other orders of government and assistance navigating development processes. In late 2019, the Affordable Housing and Homelessness Section created an Indigenous Housing Liaison Role to assist Indigenous organizations in developing affordable housing. Next slide, please. Ultimately, culturally appropriate, supportive, and affordable housing that is delivered by Indigenous people is an identified need in Edmonton to end homelessness. Administration has identified some opportunities to increase the number of Indigenous-owned and operated housing units in Edmonton. In keeping with the spirit of the Indigenous framework, the Affordable Housing and Homelessness Section could pursue the development of attainable, Indigenous-led affordable housing targets, accompanied by a funding program that is co-created with Indigenous providers to address development needs in Edmonton's context. Within our existing funding programs, there are also different ways to prioritize Indigenous-led projects, such as introducing a weighting within the Affordable Housing Investment Program that awards points to Indigenous-led applications. These opportunities and others as identified by our Indigenous partners should be explored to determine which approach would best reduce barriers to development in our community. That concludes our presentation and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, we will shift over to speakers now and uh, I saw some people hopping on and off, so we'll just see is uh, Aaron Barner here from the Métis Nation of Alberta. Nope. Okay. Uh, Dave Ward from Niganon Housing. There you are. You have five Good minutes. Afternoon. Time is yours. Go ahead. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the great work of the City of Edmonton's Housing Department and the staff that have contributed to putting this much needed report together. In 2020, I had the privilege of providing a presentation to Mayor and several leaders about the good work Niganan Housing Ventures has undertaken at Ambrose Place. I have provided a copy of that PowerPoint to administration for your review, and in there you'll see what uh, I heard online through Aaron through your session with uh, a few other leaders in our community about the cost savings that Ambrose Place has generated. And there's multiple layers to that cost sa savings in the justice, policing, and obviously health system, um, and obviously the reduction of uh, Indigenous people being home impacted by homelessness. Some of the key points within that presentation um, outline some of the research that's validated the importance of this investment. Uh, Niganan is an Indigenous governed, Indigenous managed, and a significant percentage of our frontline staff are of Indigenous descent. descent. This benefit of uh, uh, this this, the benefit of this investment is not only to our for our community members, but it will continue to con be a critical part of our organization's success in the future. As an Indigenous person working in the housing sector and uh, for an Indigenous organization, the issue of homelessness has a deeper connection due in part to our lived experience and to the sector's colonial structure, which has collectively resulted in a dis distorted co concept of home. Niganan aims to improve the situation. Over the last six years, um, sorry, we have six years of experiencing one of Canada's premier supportive housing projects right here in our backyard with very little celebration. From time to time, we're referenced for cost-saving purposes, but certainly not for the level of growth that we certainly need to serve our community members. With six years of positive funding relationships with mental health and addictions from Alberta Health Services, Homeward Trust and Disability Services, our PDD program. Um, referencing this and why, why it's important, it's important because it demonstrates what we can be, what used to be used against us for years. And that was the historical rejection that highlighted capacity as an excuse. We are committed to working with our partners to ensure that this is no longer a reason why they can't grow our portfolio. It's also important to consider Niganan's mandate. And please see the PowerPoint and do in part to the information outlined in the report are, are in, uh, about uh, Indigenous groups who own, operate housing in Edmonton. Most of the providers on the list serve a very specific population and few, if any, based upon, um, sorry, and few, if any, besides us, have a specific focus on supportive housing and homelessness. 
Please consider this when finalizing the details of the Indigenous housing strategy. What I have learned uh, what, and what needs more research. From previous housing research uh, work I've been involved with, it's, it takes approximately 250 units in order for an affordable housing provider to have the revenue needed to operate and sustain the property management and property reserve funds for an affordable housing initiative to have the stability that's required. That doesn't include the support services, but the stability to ensure that the building, the units are available to the people in need. As you can see from the list of Indigenous housing providers, the only one that has anywhere near that volume right now is the Métis Urban Housing Corporation and Métis Urban Capital Corporation. We strive to achieve this level of sustainability. Right now we have Ambrose Place with 42 units, Belvedere with 42 units, and we run three group homes with three units per group home with a total of nine. So we have a total of 93 units that Niganan Housing Ventures is solely responsible for which we are currently renting uh, the housing units. And in order to make the revenue cycle through the sector, we endeavored to have a small partnership structured with Métis Urban Housing, our capital corporation, and we rent uh, one of their houses for our PDD program to ensure that uh, the resources can circle through the sector. Um, you know, recently we, we, we had a project open, Belvedere Apartment Building. It's a permanent supportive housing facility, our supportive housing facility now that the lit uh, literature is changing. And it focuses, it's another 42 unit that provides a level one, uh, a level of care within the um, supportive living sector. Um, this, so we, we opened up in October, um, there was delays until November, and we weren't able to secure funding for supports for the facility until December. And I'm proud to say to the group here today that as of March 1st, the building will be full and our commitment to Homer Trust is that 50% of the individuals housed there will be come from Edmonton's by names list. And uh, we've certainly achieved that so far. Um, we also have uh, programs that are specific to the population we're serving. There are a youth, youth indigenous program that has a research project attached to it and our family reunification initiative. Um, in closing, Yep, go ahead. In closing, I'd, li I'd like to close by speaking to the four sites that the city has identified for supportive housing. My understanding is that one of those four sites is intended to serve a similar population to whom we serve at Ambrose Place. It forces me to ask why Niganan Housing Ventures has yet to be formally engaged in a conversation about this project. We hope that the city's housing branch and council will support our interest in owning and operating this future site. A recommendation I would humbly like to suggest is that we need to create a space that brings together Indigenous housing bodies to collaborate and support each other in our mandates and our unique work. Please consider all of the Indigenous organizations listed in the document and specifically their mandates. Great. Um, thank, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we'll now go to the, uh, Bob Black, who I understand has been waiting patiently. Uh, Sansei, uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, Your Worship, uh, Mayor Iveson, if you're on board, uh, members of council. While I appear today as an interested citizen, my practice at MLT Aikens is primarily focused on Indigenous law. My great-grandfather was an honorary chief at Muskogee's, and my aspiration is to do honour to that legacy. I'm grateful for the relationships that I have informed with my Indigenous brothers and sisters, and my life has been enriched by them. I'm a deeply proud Edmontonian and Canadian, but we have a black mark against our collective conscience due to hundreds of years of systemic racism against our Indigenous citizens. Put plainly, our Crown has not been honourable in meeting its treaty obligations. We know that the scars that are left by this are deep and they're intergenerational in their impact. But we're at a watershed moment in Canadian history where our citizens are holding our nation to account in creating a more just and equitable society. I want to sincerely congratulate and applaud council and administration for showing showing the need uh, to recognize, sorry, for recognizing the need to show leadership in this area. I also want to congratulate Niganan uh, for its uh, its accomplishments. I'm inspired by what you're achieving. At the home of uh, the second largest indigenous urban population in Canada, Edmonton has an opportunity and I would submit a responsibility to lead an affecting change. But there's lots to do. I'm proud to be involved the Tribal Council on the affordable housing initiatives within city limits. 
I've been involved in both design activities and in capital and operating cost reviews. The numbers are really tough within the context of existing programs. It quickly becomes an exercise of limiting scope and inspiration. There just isn't enough capital and operating money support to support doing things that are truly effective in creating change. The challenge will not be solved with band-aids. We need enduring and sustainable solutions. It's not enough to simply place roofs over people's heads and hope that healing and change will take place. We need homes, homes where culture and community can thrive, homes where multi-generational community can lift its members up, homes which resonate with the beauty of indigenous culture and which reinforce cultural pride, homes where ceremony can take place, homes where people can live with dignity and respect, homes where services can be clubs clustered to help heal and advance people, homes operated by indigenous old groups for the benefit of their people. We cannot simply warehouse people and hope. The city's got a vital role in this. Yes, an important part of that is to advocate to senior orders of government. But more than this, I would respectfully submit that the city must lead in a number of things that within its mandate, including selling land below market value to indigenous affordable housing led groups, uh, Secondly, granting municipal tax concessions to indigenous owned not-for-profit housing groups. And third, by dedicating capable resources within administration to help expedite the development of much needed homes. All right, thank you. Uh, we will um, and Stevenson from Right at Home Housing Society. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Anne Stevenson from the Right at Home Housing Society. I want to thank administration for this very clear and informative report that sets out a number of important considerations for supporting Indigenous led housing solutions. Our organization has benefited immensely from working closely with and learning from Niganan Housing Ventures, uh, just an incredibly capable organization that we're, we're honored to work with. Through conversations with Niganan, we've identified some important nuances in how city initiatives are structured to support Indigenous-led organizations. That's really based on Right at Home's own experience and how we've grown as an organization. So the first consideration I wanted to raise was creating the conditions for organizational autonomy. Right at Home started as a small community action group owning just one duplex that housed eight individuals. And we now own and operate close to 30 uh, properties providing homes for over 1,800 Edmontonians. And it's this very model of owning and operating that has been key to our success, our success and our ability to grow as an organization. So being an owner operator has allowed us to build our equity by carefully saving any surplus revenue and having a range of real property assets to leverage as collateral. Having this equity is a, is a prerequisite to accessing first, well, every single uh, capital grant uh, funding that's out there right now. Uh, so it's absolutely essential to have that equity uh, to increase the number of units that, that we own and operate. Being an owner operator of a diverse portfolio also offers considerable financial resiliency for our organization as we can cross fund our various projects as the needs arise. We can be more responsive and adaptive to the community needs of those that we're, we're working with. So the opportunity to build equity and establish financial resiliency is not afforded to Indigenous led organizations under operator only models. So we believe it's absolutely essential that Indigenous-led organizations have the opportunity to own and operate their own housing. A second point, sort of again drawing from our experience as an organization, uh, relates to organizational capacity. So again, as nonprofit housing providers, we, we generate revenue, uh, we can maintain our buildings, um, but, but we're often only doing that. You, you get stuck in the day-to-day -day of, of managing, dealing with the, the issues that come up. Uh, we, as at Right at Home, are incredibly lucky to benefit from a generous endowment that provides us with roughly $50,000 a year in unrestricted operational dollars. 
Um, and so even though as an organization we were breaking even, um, this, this additional operating dollars really allowed us um, to, to grow into the organization that we are today. It was a huge game changer in terms of providing us with staff resources to move beyond day-to-day operations and focus on strategic opportunities in fund and project development initiatives. And again, this has further added to our ability to pursue opportunities and expand our portfolio. So based on our own experiences, there are two suggestions we'd like to make in terms of how the city can support Indigenous-led housing organizations that that are sort of variations on the themes that have been presented in, in the report. So the first is to ensure that any land that is being uh, given to housing providers by the city at below market or, or uh, you know, for a dollar, um, we would just highly recommend that a designated proportion of that be earmarked for Indigenous-led organizations. And that gives them the opportunity to have that land equity uh, and to, to build and be owner-operators of, of that housing. We would also suggest making uh, community investment operating grants available to Indigenous-led housing organizations. Currently, housing organizations face barriers to accessing those grants because our operating budgets tend to be quite large, you know, over $2 million a year. Um, but still, that, that small $50,000 that we had, uh, you know, can be a real game changer for those organizations. So just in closing, you know, this morning, Jamie Miller noted that um, during the discussion of Edmonton's Indigenous framework, that the best solutions come from the community. So empowering Indigenous-led organizations, I think, is the single most important thing we can do to meet the housing needs of Indigenous people in Edmonton. These efforts will work towards decolonizing our approach to housing and live up to our talk of reconciliation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And... uh... I see that uh, Aaron Barner has rejoined us, so the floor is yours. You have five minutes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, um, It's kind of funny waiting all day to talk, and then my microphone crashed on me there at the beginning. Um, So uh, my name is Aaron Barner. I'm the uh, lead negotiator, senior executive officer for Métis Nation of Alberta, uh, which includes overseeing the operations of our two housing companies, Métis Urban Housing and Métis Capital Housing. Um, they, it is a wholly owned affiliate of the Métis Nation of Alberta um, with a board of, uh, of directors uh, representing our, our six, um, six regions within the province. In total, we have 300 single-family homes in Edmonton, another 90 units in our Boyle Renaissance Tower, an additional 40 units in our Seniors Lodge, and we also have an eight-unit family reunification um, um, program in a building in, in Edmonton. Province-wide, we're over just over 900 units. Um, I'm really happy that we're looking at this issue, and, and I was able to listen to some of the discussion earlier this morning on the uh, on the Indigenous framework. And that work needs to con- to really move forward. It needs to, and it has impacts, um, you know, on housing as well. And I'll share an example of something I'm dealing with right now, and. Um, uh, in, in regards to property tax. So we pay about $800,000 a year in property tax and we're trying to work through exemptions and, and different things. Um, and we went and then we had a, we had a hearing in Calgary and, and we lost. Um, Edmonton was making similar arguments and, and they're quite, they're quite disturbing actually when you, when you step back and you look at what these arguments that are being made are. Uh, one of the things they're saying, they talk about when you want to go for property tax exemption, is are your properties restricted in any way? And the argument that's being put forward by the uh, City of Edmonton and by the City of Calgary is, yes, ours are restricted. Um, we restrict the, you know, uh, our property to Indigenous people. So, okay, what other restrictions are there? Well, you got to be low income, right? Um, so what I'm being told, and we never went ahead with the hearing with the city because we lost in Calgary. And the argument that you're restricted because you're renting to low income indigenous people, um, they won on that in Calgary. And I don't want to go there in Edmonton. I think it's, it's wrong. I think that copter legislation is the intent is to be inclusive, but when it starts to further marginalize, um, you know, people that really are, do need help. We, we have, uh, probably 4,000 people um, on our waiting list to be in, a, in, our, in our affordable and subsidized housing. 
uh, that we count our, our waiting list in people, not applicants. Um, you know, so that's not the number of applicants, that's the number of people. In order to be on our waiting list means you qualify and you need subsidized housing and you're currently not in subsidized housing. Right now in Edmonton, we have 64 vacant units. And the idea being that anything we save in property tax, we put into getting those homes rent ready for our people. Those homes aren't, are, aren't vacant because we don't have a need for them. They're vacant because we don't have a budget. We don't have a budget to, to operate it. We're funded through our subsidized arm from, uh, through Alberta Seniors and Housing. Um, the budget's actually being, is going down. It's not going up. Our needs are going up. The budget's going down. We also uh, run uh, an affordable housing program where we're uh, at least 20% below market and we have no subsidy at all on there. That's, that's done on, on, uh, on just the revenue we're able to generate through rent there. Um, so I find it, I, I find that, you know, when I see, you know, the leaders that we have on, on this, in this meeting, on this call today saying and doing all the right things, I think that's wonderful. But when in practice, I, you know, I'm actually sitting there as an Indigenous person you know, it, it's tough to, and, and having grown up in affordable housing, and I know it makes a difference in someone's life, you know, it's tough to have people say that I'm just doing my job. Well, you know what? At some point, people just got to stop doing their job and stop making these arguments and have a place to turn when, if you're, if you're, if you're saying that, you know, we hit all the boxes off, except for we were restricted to low income Indigenous people, there's something wrong with that scenario. Um, so I'll leave that and there will be follow up. And I, re and I'd, re I'd request that, that, um, you know, you direct your, your staff from your affordable housing and your indigenous, uh, uh, relations department and property tax to be able to collaborate on, uh, on this and, and help me with a solution. Um, overall, I think, you know, with affordable housing, um, there's more to be done, um, I've uh, I led negotiations uh, on a national uh, Métis Nation housing accord um, that is, al is allowing us to do stuff with people that we have never been able to do before. We we're now uh, doing down payment assistance, um, emergency home repairs, uh, um, uh, uh, other uh, sorry uh, rent subsidies as well for people living outside of our property. I recognize I'm probably at my five minutes now, and you're going to tell me this if it's. My were, were my polite sounds from my throat. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate it, uh, and really uh, appreciate your words. I also grew up in affordable housing. So, um, questions for the speakers. We've got Councillor McKean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And <clears throat> I won't get to those tax questions right away, but I'm certainly open to the discussion. I would say, Aaron and Bob. I wanted to start with Dave Ward, though. Um, uh, Ambrose, Dave, there you are. Hey, Dave. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for being here. And, and of course, uh, was a little bit, um, I don't know what the right word would be, but to hear that you don't think you've been honored, uh, is heartbreaking to me because I think Ambrose place is one of the most amazing places in Edmonton. It's such a great success story that needs to be uh, told to all Edmontonians and maybe across the country. So please understand, and I think that is quite well understood on council. Uh, you happen to be be in my ward, so I've, I've I probably know more than most. But I just wanted, you know, please go back and tell Corolla that that we love her and love all the staff there. You're doing amazing work. Um, Thank you. I wanted to ask you. So we've talked a little bit. You like to me, there should be ten more Ambrose places in Edmonton in the next five years or something. That's what we should be looking towards. How come you have not been able to expand? What have been the barriers that you've run into? Yeah, thanks for the question, Councillor. Um, you know, I, we ask ourselves the same question, but you know, we also recognize, you know, we're only six years old. You know, and I often have a conversation with Corolla about the evolution of our organization and um, our partner right at home, Cam McDonald, and I had a lunch earlier this fall and we talked about, 
you know, uh, the steps that they went through in their growth uh, pattern to success and stability. And, um, you know, over the course of the last two years, Corolla has made some really big uh, decisions about investing in uh, upping our staff, upping our the talent that we have, uh, the bench strength to be able to uh, meet the requirements of the sector and to support the evolution and the conversations that are taking place in the sector. We, we're a big part of Homer Treston's uh, engagement strategy to inform how those projects are going to be developed. Uh, we're sharing blueprints of Ambrose. We're having the architects come and do tours. Uh, you know, you know how much we host folks here, um, Councillor McKean, um, and, and it's our responsibility operating under natural law to be honest, to be kind, and to share and to build strength in each other. And we follow the, that uh, those laws critically in how we do our work. And uh, that that, despite how much of a, a load it is to share that knowledge and not have uh, the growth taking place that we, you know, we've been engaged with Grand Prairie and Lethbridge, and uh, we'd love to have an Ambrose place in every one of those cities to help the Indigenous community foster their capacity like we have, and to have them stand on their own two feet to serve their own community members. So, um, you know, whatever we can continue to do to strive to strengthen our bench strength, to meet every funding requirement, to to have an Ambrose 2 and 3 and 4, and we all know that there's 10 required here in this city, we need, uh, and I had a good conversation in the previous presentation I did with the mayor about um, a level four uh, need of care. People that are actually in secured uh, facilities that are supported by uh, agencies like ourselves, that we don't have that here in Edmonton. And w we know because the people that end up not working out here don't have another option besides Ambrose Place. You we need to yeah, you remind me of how gracious you've been in all the tours I've taken and Corolla one time rolling her eyes a little bit at another tour which was taking her away from her work for a couple hours but but you have not you you um as I understand it from our conversations um this has to go beyond beyond symbolism you would Niganon's aspirations are to own and operate facilities. And the ownership would allow you to build up the capacity and the equity then to expand on your own. Yes, is that, am I got Absolutely. that right? I think the, the other part to consider there is that, and I mean, we all are impacted by this economic uh, downturn and the pandemic, but um, you know, program dollars become very limited in the, an environment like this. And so all of the program, programs you've identified in your list have organizations, except for the Métis, of course, that have more, uh, a limited amount of units that really um, concern me about their sustainability over the long term. So we really need to start to do some research on that. What is that benchmark? What is that threshold? And how do we help each of these organizations get to that level? I'm out of time. I might come around again, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. And just a quick note of time management. It's 328. We've got, uh, oh, Councillor Nack uh, dropped his name off the list. To, was that intentional, Councillor Nack? Yeah, Councillor McKean was asking the questions I was going to ask, so I'd be happy to let him finish off. Perfect. So we've got a couple of options. Um, I don't think that we can finish this in two minutes uh, or even seven minutes if we bumped into the break. Uh, it looks like uh, Mayor Iveson has a suggestion. Well, uh, I've I've got to run, uh, so I was going to move the recommendation um, just for starters, um, and then I'll see if I can get back for the further discussion. But I appreciate the direction it's going, and would like to involve um, partners here further as we think about growth of the portfolio, especially as um, and this is just speaking to it quickly. Um, uh, as we continue to advocate to the federal government for a second round or wave of the rapid housing initiative uh, and making sure that even the ones we're now developing under the first wave uh, and any more that come through the uh, the grants that are still pending, and I'm, I'm confident there'll be some more, but that if there's several billion more, hopefully in the federal budget, uh, that we can set about doing some work. And I absolutely think, and I don't know what the right target or, or methodology for, you know, RFI, RFEI um, uh, looks like uh, transactionally to get there. But but the, the spirit of the, consistent with everything else we've talked about today, I think uh, um, would be well served by uh, helping to grow organizations who are already doing uh, extraordinary work. 
um, uh, as that portfolio grows. The property tax question is a little more complicated because it represents potentially a subsidy by all other taxpayers of affordable housing activity and all residents uh, do draw city services, which are paid for by city taxes. So I don't have an, a quick answer to Mr. Barner's point today, but I, I think some of the larger questions and the larger, uh, and, and that'd be a separate question before a separate committee with a separate application. So I don't want to prejudice that process uh, around the taxation question. I, I think I think we'll get further by focusing on unit growth uh, on, a, on an advantageous granted basis. Uh, to grow capacity uh, in organizations to be able to cover all their costs and obligations, including property taxes, ideally, except where they're deep subsidy, and then grow from there. So, so um, that's those are just my quick reactions to the comments. And uh, um, but I understand we're at time here, and I'll try to hop back on, but I've got to get on another call here for the next half an hour or so. So, anyway, I'll leave it there. Uh, just with gratitude to everyone who's doing great work on this Thanks. critical partner. Uh, to our goals to end homelessness and achieve reconciliation. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Iveson. Um, so just uh, for a little bit of housekeeping, we have our break now. At 3.45, we come back to talk about bicycle safety, uh, passing protocols, that's time specific. Um, after that, we will bounce back to Indigenous housing because I think there's going to be more questions for either speakers or administration. And then uh, we will move on to item 6.3, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. So, sorry folks, it's a bit of a yo-yo today, but uh, this is what happens when we, when we get multiple time-specific requests. So, we will take a quick break. We'll be back at 3.45 p.m. sharp to talk about bicycle safety, then come back to the issue of Indigenous housing. Thank you.
I've, I've got that. Yeah. So as if it's as said, if it's if it runs over, then I have I have no concern whatsoever about hold. This is this is minor compared to, to those to those issues. Okay. Well, it's all important in the functioning of a good city. <laughs> yes. But. All right. Well, very very kind of you, and thank you. We are now at three forty-five. So um, uh, for those about to rock, I salute you. Uh, otherwise, let's do a roll call. We've got uh, Councillor Knack on deck, I see. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Councillor Zadek. Here. In the house. Uh, Councillor Nickel. Present. All right. Subdued, but strong. Uh, I see we've got uh, Councillor Henderson. Hello. And uh, am I missing anyone? Uh, we've got Councillor McKean. Councillor Hamilton and Councillor Carmel is here as well. If I've missed you, please let me know. We want to recognize and celebrate you. No? Okay. So let's move on. Uh, our time specific is 6.8, traffic bylaw changes. Uh, I understand there's an information report and then some speakers. Well, Mr. Chairperson, uh, we do have the report as presented. We do not have a presentation. Okay. Uh, we have um, Ms. Jessica Lamar, our Director of Safe Mobility, as well as members from the Edmonton Police Service to answer questions following the present. All right. So we've got all our superstars on deck. We will move to speakers. Uh, Aaron Schooler. Hi. <clears throat> can you see me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you just fine. You've got five minutes. The floor awesome. is yours. Thank you so much, everyone, for letting me speak today. Uh, I'm Aaron Schooler, uh, the co-chair of the Alberta Cycling Coalition, born and raised uh, Edmontonian. I uh, used to be a sem semi-professional cyclist and uh, commute to work uh, year-round. Um, now now I ride still with my daughter in the chariot. Um, the Alberta Cycling Coalition is a volunteer-run group um, led by a steering committee of five members. Uh, we started in the fall of 2018. Um, right, right after the time uh, the 15 cyclists were hit on the uh, Shore Park Freeway. Um, we strive to be the communal voice and advocacy group on behalf of uh, bike riders across Alberta, um, specifically uh, related to traffic safety. Um, when we first got started, we created a white pages document um, that included uh, seven recommended, recommended changes to the Traffic Safety Act um, to try and make uh, roads safer. Uh, for cyclists, uh, the number one kind of most important uh, item for us was quantifying the safe passing distance. Um, we do recognize that separated bi bicycle infrastructure is the best way to increase uh, cycling safety by increasing the distance between um, vehicles and cyclists. Although um, understand that uh, bike lanes don't don't take you everywhere you need to go, um, and the current uh, wording in the Traffic Safety Act. Um, simply requires uh, vehicles to pass in a safe manner, although what's safe to uh, a cyclist is completely different than what's safe to uh, a driver. Um, so we, we hope to uh, strive to change that subjective law and uh, provide uh, an objective measurable uh, minimum distance to it. Um, our work at the provincial level is on, uh, ongoing. Um, we do recognize the importance of educational pamphlet, uh, uh, education and uh, we created some educational pamphlets um, in partnership with the City of Edmonton, City of Calgary, and AMA. Um, we COVID-19 has uh, slowed our, our, our work with the outreach um, of these pamphlets. Um, the pamphlets were specifically targeted to uh, traveling uh, together safely on the roads, um, with both targeted to motorists as well as cyclists. Um, we, we have had support at the provincial level um, from the previous government, although with the change uh, in Government uh, from the election, uh, we've been rebuilding those relationships. Um, we did have uh, Emily Isik from Calgary uh, table our petition um, at the provincial level and uh, provided a private member statement. Um, we do hope that our next steps, uh, that their next steps will include um, the recommended changes to the Traffic Safety Act. Um, we, we have also focused, focused at the municipal level to, to um, on the backs of what Calgary has done to try and have some bylaws implemented. Um, we do think uh, that um, we, we do recognize that uh, laws like this are, are more effective at the provincial level, um, although it does speak volumes volume um, if the two two largest cities uh, implement these bylaws. Um, 
specifically the EPS, uh, it didn't mention in the report, but uh, there are proximity measurement tools that uh, police forces across North America have used um, called Code Access. And um, we do ask that the, the committee um, support the implementation of this charter bylaw and uh, change the culture on the roads uh, to make roads safer for cyclists. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we will now move on to Andrew Ritchie with Paths for People. Hello, good afternoon, members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, yeah, as I was already said, my name is Andrew Ritchie, and I'm here today representing Paths for People, which is a nonprofit organization striving to make Edmonton a more multimodal transportation city and a friendlier place to walk, roll, glide, and cycle. Last year, when the original motion was brought forward regarding safe passing distances, Pass for People was eager to voice our support, uh, enshrining a clear passing distance for all users of our transportation system via bylaw makes for a safer, more comfortable, and more efficient experience for all users. Our roadways are primarily shared spaces that should be safe to use for every mode of transportation. Most cyclists can tell you their close call story when a vehicle passed too closely, putting the cyclists in an uncomfortable and even dangerous spot. Some cyclists will have more than one close call. Myself, I've had many close calls as a lifetime cyclist, as a commuter, but also in my time as a bike food courier. Um, for three years, I lived in Toronto and I worked as a bike food courier there. And I had many uh, negative experiences and close calls with drivers and even fell from my bike once and received a chronic injury. But despite all that, the, I would share that the general experience of being passed by drivers in uh, Toronto was safer than it was in Edmonton. And I think a factor of that is that Ontario does have a safe passing requirement and this contributes to a safer commute and experience for everyone on the road. Some people have stories that just that aren't just close calls, these stories result in serious injury or death. And mandating a safe passing distance is a way for us to, word, to move towards vision zero and mitigate the loss of life within our transportation system. Based on the number of stories we hear from our members across Edmonton regarding close calls, it's clear that when we are driving, we don't always realize how close we may get to other road users like cyclists when passing them. This bylaw change will be an opportunity to educate those who drive and convey how dangerous close passing can be. Now, cyclists, of course, have their part to play too. When we're biking, we already must ensure we are visible on our roads. This includes having tail lamps and reflectors as outlined in the Traffic Safety Act's vehicle equipment regulation. And to our understanding, a bylaw amendment mandating safe passing would keep all modes accountable. The key thing to note is that out of the two types of transportation, driving is inherently a less vulnerable form of transportation. In regulating and building our transportation system, we need to ensure that more vulnerable forms of transportation, like walking, rolling, and cycling, receive higher levels of protection to adjust for their inherent vulnerability. Overall, this bylaw will shift the culture on our roads, mandating an explicit minimum passing distance, makes it clear to all users that caution must be exercised when passing one another on the road, bringing drivers and cyclists, as well as those who use both, up to speed on how to safely share the road will positively impact our transportation system. And most communities in Canada uh, already have a minimum safe passing distance as outlined by provincial regulations. And in the absence of this direction uh, from the province, the city of Edmonton needs to amend our bylaws and continue advocating, I think, to the province as a means to create a safer system. So Paths for People, we urge the city of Edmonton to introduce the amendments to the traffic bylaw to require a safe passing distance between vehicles and cyclists. We also encourage the city to communicate these changes effectively to Edmontonians to assure we achieve a safer transportation system for all our users. Thank you so much for the time to speak today. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for proving the maxim that cool guys have mustaches. Uh, we'll now move to Christopher Chan. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Chan. I'm executive director of Bike Edmonton. Our organization has over 1,500 members, and we support anyone who is interested in cycling through our nonprofit community workshops, education, and partnerships with community organizations. 40% of cyclist deaths are from rear end crashes, uh, likely resulting from unsafe passing. According to a 2012 survey by the NHTSA, 
A motorist driving too close was the most frequently reported action that made the person on a bike fear for their personal safety. This lack of safety has a discriminatory impact on people with lowered risk tolerance, namely women. We know that before Edmonton's downtown bike network opened, about 30% of people cycling downtown were women. That jumped to 38% after the, after the network opened. Studies show that a lack of safety is more likely to discourage women from cycling. We've heard it ac- anecdotally too. People who have gone back to driving because they had one too many close calls, sometimes even while pulling their children in a trailer. In our goal to make the city an equitable city with opportunities for everyone, we must make sure that our decisions reflect that. The vast majority of drivers in Edmonton already give at least one meter when passing. So this law wouldn't actually require a shift in behavior for most drivers. In American studies, usually about 80% of drivers give at least three feet, even without a law. But in places with a safe passing law, the drivers give bicycles even more space. Those places include the majority of America, 42 states have safe passing laws that mention bikes, and 33 require at least three feet to pass. Some require four or five feet or to change lanes entirely. In Canada, six provinces, everything east of Manitoba, already require at least one meter to pass bikes, as well as Whitehorse, Yellowknife, Saskatoon, and Calgary, and probably other cities too. The fact that this change doesn't really require a shift in behavior for most drivers is part of why it was completely uncontroversial in Calgary and should be here too. No one spoke against it at committee and no one spoke against it at the statutory public hearing in Calgary. It passed unanimously at both committee and council and even councillors Chu, Farkas and Meglioka, not known for their support of bike lanes, all supported this bylaw in Calgary. 60% of Calgarians were also in favor of the chain and over two thirds of those change, and over two thirds of those were were strongly in favor of it, with only twenty five percent of Calgarians unsupportive. Calgary police appreciated that it took the subjectivity out of the current law, similar to how we don't allow parking within five meters of a fire hydrant or one point five meters of a driveway, rather than leaving it vague. It's easier to understand and enforce a quantifiable law. But this isn't really about enforcement. The goal isn't to punish drivers, we're not looking for for a whole bunch of tickets to be issued, but rather to educate so that there's clarity and a shared understanding between road users so that we can all move about our our city in safety. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I've heard a rumor that they actually do support bike lanes. It's just an electoral tactic, but I can't prove that. Uh, Jaden Bodoin. If you're still around, Jaden. Yes. Hello. Hopefully right. you can hear me. We have five minutes. The time is yours. Uh, excellent. I don't think I'll use all of those five minutes. Um, um, basically, I just want to communicate. And from what I've heard, it sounds like, um, you know, as most of the provinces east of Manitoba um, have these kind of regulations, Calgary passed it. Um, I just kind of want to lend my support to saying that I think uh, in addition to, you know, supporting Vision Zero and those types of things, it's very important um, to kind of, even if, you know, like you said, the goal isn't to penalize drivers or issue tickets and that sort of thing. But I think there is a very strong message that gets sent when these types of regulations are passed. And um, just some of my background, um, I commute up 97th Street, basically from the Royal Alex up to the military base every day. Um, so I've dealt with a fair amount of, um, drivers, you know, yelling, get off the road and that sort of thing. But, um, I think, as I said, this sort of motion, um, does a lot to kind of solidify in people's minds that this is behavior, which is, um, or I should say behavior, which, um, let me rephrase that again. Um, this is how you encourage positive behavior. Um, and like I, you said, um, It's not necessarily to issue fines or that sort of thing, but I think it sends a strong message just having it in policy that um, this sort of thing is, uh, you know, something we're going for. Um, I'm not sure where the province stands on amending these types of regulations. Um, I would like to see and I would hope that um, as Calgary had passed a similar bylaw and if Edmonton passes one, um, I hope that would show the province also that there is that demand and there is that uh, initiative to um, kind of just put that, um, 
to put that motion forward. Um, I'm kind of surprised that that doesn't exist already, though. Um, I mean, at least Edmonton has been really great over the past few years in kind of making multiple modes of transportation um, more accessible to people, especially with the downtown bike network and things like that. Um, but there are still a lot of cases. I mean, personally, myself, I've had close passes and things like that. Um, and I'm not, I don't think that those will entirely stop, but I do think that it, um, as I said, it sends a positive message. So, um, that's kind of my, that's my bit. So thank you for letting me speak. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, you only used half your time. So with that, well, we've got we'll to <laughs> questions uh, from uh, council members, and we've got Councillor Henderson up. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, Mr. Schuler. I know you've been waiting for this report to come back for a while, so maybe I'll just I'll go to you for questions. Um, uh, this is mostly around um, being able, around clarity, which is what we don't have right now. We've got a deeply ill-defined thing that probably is as, much a disadvantage to drivers as it is to cyclists because what safe is is right now open to an, everybody's interpretation correct so this would give clarity to everybody is that fair to say that's the major that's the major benefit exactly yeah it, we're just asking for a clarification of the ex existing law yes um and i so I'm, I'm thinking it's probably two parts one would be a bylaw that would align with calgary's and two is to join calgary and advocacy with the province those are the two things you'd like to have from us that would be great, yes. Um, and is it fair to say it's, it's a few months since we've had a chance to talk about this, but one of the things I think the Calgary folk were hoping was that we could join them in this. So there's a desire from them to be able to go together to the province, which would help their case, correct? Of course, it, uh, it's, it's, it goes in line with the um, uh, Bicycle Infrastructure Design Guide project that they've been spearheading, yes. Yeah, yeah. so... So, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'll maybe have a chance to ask our administration this too, but I know you've been working on this for quite a while now. So really in simple terms, the two things we're looking for is that we would join Calgary in coming up just with a simple definition, which would be similar to what already exists in most of the province as step, step one. And step two would be advocating for the province to do something province-wide, which ultimately will help with clarity for all, for all, for all road users, correct? It's, of course. It's, it, this isn't really about enforcement. This is about just being able to help people understand what truly is safe. Yeah? Of course. Yep. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll keep it simple because I know that the time is tight and I'll ask some questions to the administration when we get there. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for our speakers? Nope. Very good presentations. Thank you. You're uh, more than welcome to stick around for questions of administration, which I believe are happening right now. Councillor Henderson? Uh, sure. I will... Uh, I'll start all over again. Um, so, Ms. Lamar, I'm guessing you're the best person to talk to here. Um, how um, I'm guessing this is completely aligned with our Vision Zero stuff. I know when I originally put this inquiry forward, you, you it was part of your thinking already to look at issues like this, correct? That's right, uh, Councillor Henderson. As well, it does align with the bike plan that was recently released and does support both Connect Edmonton and the city plan in our active transportation goals. Uh, so if there was to be a motion passed out of this, which I would encourage committee to do uh, so we don't lose it, what would be helpful is probably, again, my two parts. One would be um, to ask you to draw up a bylaw, um, and the second piece would be to, uh, to do some advocacy with the province. Is that fair to say that would, that's probably the best way to move this forward? Uh, yes, we'd be looking at the charter bylaw uh, changes for the safe passing distance, and we could look at, at uh, advocacy work, you know, either if that's on behalf of city council, perhaps through the mayor or administration um, proceeding on that front. I'm just curious to know what kind of communication, if any, we've had with Calgary on this, uh, where we're at. Is that, is that um, uh, have, we, have we had any chance to talk to them yet or to align our thinking or our work with theirs? Uh, Councillor, we did do work with uh, with Calgary when we were working on the design guide, which of course has been submitted. Um, there was a recent touch point uh, sort of around the implementation of the bylaw, which is still relatively new to Calgary. Uh, but other than that, I think the outcome of this will help us determine what some next steps could look like. Right. And, and just to confirm with you, the main, the main advantage of this is not necessarily to do heavy enforcement on it. It really is about creating some clarity around what truly is safe. It's probably more useful as a as an information tool, as an education tool, than as an enforcement tool. Would that be fair to say? 
I think that's a really important um, assessment for this, which it does create a great opportunity for us to have a more clear conversation with everybody on the road. Um, you know, overtaking maneuvers, which is what cars do when they move around um, bicycles in particular, uh, there's there's a lot of gray area there that we could really clarify so that all road users are in a more safe environment together. And, and right now we probably don't really have a tool except to say do be safe, which is not probably terribly helpful. Because one person's idea of what's safe is very different from another's. You know, it's one of the things that I've recognized for pedestrians, interesting enough, not so much with bikes, is their impression of what a safe intersection is and is very different. It feels different if you're the pedestrian than if you're the car. The car feels perfectly safe but and doesn't realize that the pedestrian doesn't. Um, so that's part of what would help create some clarity around this, correct? Yes, I think what we're talking about here is, you know, um, helpful optional recommendations moving into very clear expectations um, which is an important shift for safety great thanks well thank you i'm hoping that committee will uh, move this forward with a motion i obviously am not in a position to do so thank you all right thank you i believe uh we may have some movement on a motion uh councillor knack uh, well, first, I was just going to ask a quick question. Uh, just, I, I think there was someone from EPS, and sorry, I've lost the uh, who's all on the screen from EPS on this. Uh, sorry, uh, Inspector Keith Johnson, Traffic Services. Is here. Oh, thank you, Inspector Johnson. I just wanted to get your take on on the value in having um, a bylaw that would essentially provide clarity. We heard that, I guess, in Calgary's examples, it sounded like Calgary Police Service was happy to have that clarification. Do you have any? take on that as well from EPS? Well, yeah, like, uh, you know, first of all, thanks for, thanks for having me today. Um, you know, you know, clear expectations for all, all road users, how to best share the road is, is of course important. And, and one of the things as well, I mean, there's a variety of, uh, of issues, you know, whether it's, uh, everybody sharing the same space or speed differences, size differences, clarity of signals, congestion, road design. Um, you know, there's always a good analogy that a 90 pound person in a, in a uh, smart car uh, has a much better chance against a 250 pound person on a fat bike, for instance, right? Uh, one of the issues here is that the EPS, you know, doesn't officially have any position on this other than just creating what the facts are, but uh, instituting a, a bylaw does immediately increase the public expectation that enforcement will take place. Uh, that's uh, one of the, uh, not necessarily, I wouldn't really call it a concern, but that's just a fact that would take place. Uh, it potentially increased the call volume on to both 311 and our non-emergency line after an alleged, you know, uh, offense uh, took place. And the main thing here is, and I know I mentioned there is some technology a gentleman mentioned earlier, but enforcement is based purely on a subjective visual assessment. And it requires an on view and a real time observation of an offense as well, because a lot of times, um, you know, a lot of it is subjective. Even if you have that one meter, it is subjective. And and the only uh, in speaking with my uh, Calgary police uh, colleagues, um, you know, there has not been a ticket issued. Uh, I know they were having plans to work with uh, the Calgary Transportation was going to work with Calgary Police in regards to uh, whether it's some form of educational plan. Uh, but as far as the only thing that I've seen, whether it's from uh, Scotland, for instance, where they set up a uh, plainclothes officer on a bicycle and would, uh, uh, if it became within the two meters or one and a half meter, depending on the volume of road, is that they would be pulled over and, uh, and then given some educational material. Uh, in Alberta, you know, any form of, uh, you know, I hate to call it a sting or an entrapment, but anything along those ends, courts don't like them. And it does create, especially in the current environment we're in, it does create uh, potential, you know, public relations issues with that. But as far as, uh, you know, I'm sorry I'm taking so long here, but the main issue here is, is that traffic enforcement is always the number one two concern of citizens of Edmonton when we survey, sur when we, uh, survey them. And if uh, a bylaw is put in place, I fully understand why it would be put in place, but it does create that expectation for enforcement that we may not be able to meet those expectations. Mm -hmm. no, that's fair. Yeah. And I, I think uh, Councillor Anderson was touching on a little bit that, you know, some bylaws are there more to like say, hey, here's the expectation. And yeah, I, I would 
I would imagine similar to Calgary, you wouldn't be rushing out to hand out tickets for something like this if it existed. I don't, I don't know if that would be a valuable use of time or resources, uh, but more to have as a, as an educational piece. Okay. Uh, oh, thank you. Those are, uh, those are my questions. I, I was fine. I don't know if, uh, I was fine with moving what Councillor Henderson had suggested, unless you had wording already, Councillor Kett, you, it sounded like you said that there might be wording. I don't have any wording. I just, uh, uh, I thought that uh, perhaps the issues that uh, Councillor Henderson raised could easily be drafted into a motion. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm happy to move a motion, I guess, that would essentially say that, uh, that a draft bylaw be created uh, similar to the City of Calgary's, and that uh, we continue... Uh, and, and that we work with the city of Calgary on ongoing advocacy to, because it would make more sense to be provincially mandated. In yeah. This case. Yeah. And that makes sense. And uh, we'll get a more particular uh, wording. Uh, I think probably fairly soon. Are there any other questions for administration? No. Okay. Well, I'll, I will make one comment and that is uh, that, uh, Oh, there we go. We've got the wording. Do you want to read that in, Councillor Nack? Sure. Let's see here. Uh, so it says the Community and Public Services Committee recommend to Council that admin bring forward a charter bylaw to establish, min min establish minimum safe passing distance for motorists passing cyclists based on alignment with the City of Calgary's approach as outlined in the February 17th report and that the mayor on behalf of city council advocate to the province to establish province-wide minimum safe passing distances for motorists passing cyclists in support of mutual vision zero goals. Very good, thank you. Um, okay, any debate on that? Not seeing any, do you want to uh, close on this, Councillor Nack? Oh, we've got uh, no. Councillor no. Henderson jumping in. Yeah, just very quickly, I was, I was interested, in, I think in the point that was made that it might be useful um, uh, uh, and I don't know if it needs to be part of a motion for, for administration to work with the City of Calgary on a joint advocacy effort. I don't know if that's a third part or if that could happen anyway, if that needs to be added. Councillor Henderson, I would consider that as a part of our ongoing partnership okay. with the City if of it, Calgary. Yeah, if, it's, if it's, it's included, then that's fine. It doesn't need to be added to the motion. Thank you. I just thought that was a very useful uh, way to go as well. Thanks. All right, good point. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Benga, go ahead. Thank you. Um, again, uh, it's good to do, uh, know all these statistics. Uh, my question uh, for uh, Inspector Johnson is, uh, uh, we had the Calgary experience already and keeping in mind uh, uh, that they did not issue any tickets uh, and also the enforcement challenges, is there any quantifiable uh, way to say that uh, this has actually worked? Uh, no, uh, uh, Councillor Banga, I can't, uh, I can't, I don't really have any available data. I was given some survey information from Calgary Transportation that, uh, uh, that I'm sure Jessica may be able to, if she's able to answer anything further. Uh, but in regards to that, I know when the bylaw was instituted, they did have plans on it. But again, uh, the subjectivity, because I guess from a policing standpoint, it's either it's either you're uh, uh, issuing the ticket because the actual offence occurred, and then a lot of times then it transfers over, as you know, that it transfers over to Alberta Justice and a prosecutor. And is it in the public interest that can they have a, a conviction on it and I believe in speaking with Calgary Transportation is that if any ticket is issued it must be issued with the you know with a clear expectation that the uh, you know not necessarily uh, educational piece but if we're actually going to issue a ticket it's something that we're very confident in uh, so uh, that's that's the best I have for you other than the other option was I mean it, this is a very emotional topic either you're very for it or very against it and from a policing standpoint it's purely what the facts are and what the evidence has shown and a lot of times uh, subjectivity does come into play but that's always part of many things when you go to court it's based on your experience and your distance and your and your vision and your experience uh, sorry and I already said experience so a wide variety of uh, factors come into play when uh, traffic court uh, uh, it takes place so in uh, your understanding uh, 
I am all for the for the safety and vision zero, but in your understanding, is there any obligation on the on the person on the bike uh, to uh, stick as uh, close to uh, I guess the the curb as possible, or uh, or is it solely dependent on the uh, I guess uh, obligation is all on uh, on the driver of the motor vehicle. Uh, just to, I guess, generally answer that when I, when I spoke earlier, I mean, there's a challenge, uh, there's a challenge in the different types of transportation that utilize the same space. And, uh, and, uh, we, we all know that, you know, roads are narrow, roads are wide and, um, it's the sharing of the sharing of the spaces is, is where we're having, uh, uh, this issue here. And as I previously stated, you know, uh, I'm, we're fairly early in this from a policing perspective, so we don't have an official position on it. But as I said, you know, as an inspector in charge of traffic services, so I can cover all aspects of traffic, uh, everything from collision, sorry, from commercial vehicles to impaired driving to traffic enforcement to major collisions. I fully understand the the educational piece on maintaining those minimum distance because I think it'll give a really good opportunity if uh, uh, if it moves ahead because a lot of drivers don't know that you're able to cross a yellow line in order to uh, safely pass a uh, bicycle. Uh, but again, you will receive different comments from drivers uh, based on their emotional side of the argument is that they'll say, well, I don't want to cross that yellow line because I may get into a collision. Well, the whole point is, is that it's it's important that we be reasonable in this sense uh, and ensure that I believe a large per, uh, percentage of the drivers, you know, do want to create safe spaces and we want to share the space. Uh, but as I said earlier, uh, subjectivity is part of this. Uh, but again, um, I fully understand why a minimum capacity distance uh, bylaw would help with the education for drivers and bicyclists alike. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Uh, looks like that's all. Um, a few comments from me, just that uh, it's a great conversation. It really drives home the fact that ro roads are for cars, but they're also for people. And uh, we've been seeing a massive increase in folks on bikes sharing the road with vehicles and uh, the more clear the rules are for everyone the more we can drive calmly and safely cycle calmly and safely and uh, we'll be building a, a city that's uh, good for everyone uh, which is really the goal uh, end the war so they say all right so um with that let's vote We're missing Councillor Paquette and Zadok. Well, it, uh, it doesn't want to accept my vote, so I will say yes. Thank you. It, yes for me. Thank you. That's all the votes. All right. Please display the vote. And that is carried unanimously. Forever hold our peace. Okay. So uh, let us now... And by the way, thank you very much, everyone, for your hard work. This is phenomenal. Uh, and thank you, for everyone, for coming out to speak. Let's now bounce back to uh, Indigenous housing. Um, a few questions for administration. Uh, we can start a list, but while uh, we're waiting for that, I'll just uh, start us out, I guess. Oh, no, we've got Councillor McKean, I saw. Go ahead, Councillor McKean. I'm happy to defer to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Um, I did want to ask administration. Um, I'm, I'm not clear on your next steps. And I guess what I was hoping for was perhaps a strategy to further the goals of increasing the number of Indigenous owned affordable and supportive housing projects in Edmonton. Do you have any thoughts on whether or not a strategy could be developed i think councillor you're uh, you're you're bang on actually um that really is on the radar screen for us to you know as this gels that we do need to pull these these different pieces together in a coherent strategy basically so yeah and i want that's certainly yeah, where I, we want to go yeah i i think the strategy has to be sort of multi-pronged we heard today from speakers talking about um making land available 
perhaps even some tax concessions. So maybe even our discussions around urban reserves might be relevant. I'm not sure. But all those um, uh, things could be on the table. Um, so, Mr. Smythe, would you need a motion uh, coming out of committee about uh, bringing back a report on a on a strategy to to as I said um, see Indigenous housing project ownership increase in Edmonton, Councillor? I think that would be that would be relevant. I, mean, I think that would give us that much more traction to get this body of work going. Um, the only only uh, other comment I would add is this is not a simple piece of work. Um, I think we have to reflect back on the Indigenous framework, the roles the city plays as a listener. So we certainly want to, you know, the speakers weighed in and with lots of really rich ideas. So I think there would be a fair bit of consultation and discussion with community um, to, uh, to do this piece of work. So, I mean, I, uh, Ms. Ford and I were just talking offline a little bit, thinking that maybe um, first quarter of, uh, of 2022, we, we could bring back the strategy for Council's consideration at, at that time. Yeah, no, I think that's fine. I, I know you guys are awful busy right now and doing fantastic work. And I just, the, the comments I've heard on this, and I hate, I hate the R word, um, but, you know, that there may be some sy systemic colonial um, barriers that we don't even recognize to, to, to participation by, you know, I, 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 I will keep coming back to Nigan on just because I know them the best, but um, you know, if the strategy, you know, was certainly out there to do a listening, uh, further listening and, and, and recognizing what it is about the current system um, uh, that is preventing uh Organizations with their expertise and cultural understanding, I think it's really important. The other, the other question that I really wanted to hit on today was, I think we have five supportive housing projects that we are aiming to have done by the end of the year. It's four or five, isn't it five? Uh, Ms. Kajinner? Yes, Councillor, it's five. And, and my reading of, of the literature was that we we're only aiming to have one of them be Indigenous. And, and Go ahead, sorry. Uh, no, no, that's not correct. Um, so as you are aware, we're under really um, constrained timelines around these projects being developed. Um, and so what, what Homeward Trust is doing is um, identifying one right now for Indigenous, dedicated to Indigenous um, uh, clients. And they want to start that engagement process very early and do a very early RFP process to basically determine who that operator will be so that they can start, um, include them in the design of the facility. But the intention is that all of the sites will be open um, through a competitive process to Indigenous organizations. So it, it's more like it's certainly possible that an Indigenous organization will be operating more than one of the sites. So I'm trying to try to do this without having to come around again. My understanding would be that uh, organizations like Nigadon would like to be more than operator. They would like to become more engaged and involved, be able to build up equity. So they've been an operator. They're offering advice all over the place. They've done so much for me in the workshop and other things we've held. So that, that, that concerns me. Um, I'm going to have to come around again, Mr. Chair. I apologize uh, just to talk a little further about what the strategy might look like. Thank you. Well, we'll see. Okay, Councillor Knack. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess I was almost going to wait to Councillor McNeil finish, but maybe just one quick question that might then help inform whatever the motion finally comes up to. So uh, a group like Niganon that's where they're doing that work, um, have we, and maybe this would be part of the strategy work, you know, are, are there opportunities for us to consider having a group like that have access to the same type of funding we allow, you know, home ed to access, you know, and I know there's, there's debt management questions as a city, how much we would allow, but I'm curious if that would be explored or is there a more direct relationship with a group like home ed, uh, which is one that we have a little more uh, control on. So I don't know. I'm just curious if there's been conversation like that or, or if that would be part of the uh, strategy work. Crystal, can you weigh in on that? 
Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, Councillor Knack, like the, an the answer is certainly like any and all of the above. Um, I think you're, you're correct in identifying that's why a strategy is necessary. And to Councillor McKean's comments, I think, you know, there are barriers to um, being successful at funding um, processes that exist currently. Right. And so, uh, and, you know, I think Anne from Right at Home also hit on this as well as Dave, um, both are, you know, getting coming overcoming that hump to accessing more funding often requires having equity. But if you don't have, if you can't get more funding, you often don't have equity. So it's a bit of a cyclical challenge. And so I think um, a dedicated and a lot of funders, including ourselves and other orders of government, look at equity as an important strategy for mitigating risk and ensuring that projects will be successful. So I think to help overcome some of those barriers, there needs to be a dedicated strategy that looks at ways of supporting organizations to grow um, in a, in a, like a thoughtful and careful and strategic way, but that also potentially changes some of our existing expectations around um, risk and appetite for risk so that we can be more mindful and supportive and um, meet organizations where they're at and help them be successful in their goals, including, you know, which in this case would include um, Niganen and many other uh, Indigenous organizations' goals to grow their housing stock and be owners themselves. Oh, great. Well, I, yeah, I, d I don't think I have any more questions, and I, I think that that's uh, the motion idea is the right approach. So I'll let everyone else ask. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, Councillor Henderson, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just a little bit curious, and I don't know if we have anybody on uh, right now that can answer these questions uh, around some of the tax pieces on this, because there's something interesting to me there that hadn't occurred to me before. I know we certainly do have forms of affordable housing that are considered tax exempt under Copter. I've never totally, I can't totally remember why some are, are considered eligible and some aren't. But if we've inadvertently created a situation where, um, where and I, I, you know, where, where copters ruling out groups like this because they're trying to actually work with a specific, a specific uh, population that really needs support, I'm not sure that was the reason for, for uh, I'm not sure that was the reason for suggesting that exclusivity was a was was one of the conditions in copter. Now, it's not our rule; it's a provincial rule. Um, they're, they're provincial regulations, but I'm wondering if there's some more work. I, I know copter was open. I know they were looking at at it for a number of other reasons. It's that's been a two or three or four year long project. I don't know where it's at right now, but if 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 it is inadvertently, I think being discriminatory, which it sounds like it may be, ironically although it's trying not to be. I'm wondering if that's something we need to look at. Sorry, that was a really long question, but it's a complicated, complicated. Um, Councillor, uh, I, I believe we do have someone here from taxation, uh, Cameron Ashmore, on the more general question. And yeah. then, we'll, then we'll go into the more specific one, uh, maybe after Cameron weighs in. So Cameron, did that make sense as a question? Yeah, it's a, it's a long answer, Councillor. Um, but let me start with where we're at on the copter. So with affordable housing and supportive housing, the opening part of the copter got really off track by just define what it is. And therein lies the rub. When yeah. you get into the, the tax issues, even defining what it is becomes very, very difficult. So from what we can tell, um, the province kind of got sidetracked by that issue and never came back around to it and deal with the actual meat and bones. And copter as of right now um, we haven't heard anything recently about any additional amendments coming down the pipes so that's where it was left um, but really I, our advocacy on copter was give us some very clear rules that we can follow so that way we can make sure that we're we're fully capturing what you want exempted um, copter has a number of different very complicated tests associated with it so you're your right counselor some organizations would meet those tests some organizations would not meet those tests one of the tests that mm -hmm. is relevant is whether or not the use of the property is restricted in any way and that can include restricting it on the basis of race gender or any other type of restriction right. um, and that's one of the the complicated factors in copter that that weighs on any individual application on an exemption yeah, and that, and that's for all of copter. That's just not this, that's just not in the housing question. So I understand why that's there. This seems to me as an unintended consequence of something that's there for good reasons, which is why I raise it as something that might be, you know, if the com if the copter conversations are happening right now, they're not. We have to wait anyway. It's not within our power because the only other way for us to do this would we could only 
we could forgive the city portion, but they would still pay their their education portion. Um, and the irony of that, that, that once again, the, the city is stepping up and, and paying for something that really is provincial jurisdiction is sticks in my craw a bit. Um, but so the real, the real issue here would be to try and do some advocacy around clarity on this particular issue of whether discrimination was meant to apply to something like affordable housing and rule it out as, as part of the coffee discussions. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely fair, Councillor. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Um, uh, Mayor Iveson. Thanks. Um, I appreciate that line of questioning, Councillor Henderson. That was that was really helpful um, uh, for me. So uh, I, again, I'm, I'm struggling with how to resolve that today because uh, that's a tax policy question and a housing policy question, and, and that's a bit out of scope from from what's before us here. Um, I, I think the bigger question for us today is uh, is around um, receipt of information and what could happen versus giving some specific direction today. So I'm, I'm happy to withdraw receipt of information to make room for a more uh, specific um, uh, empowering uh, and or directive motion, um, uh, but uh, I'd, I'd need some wording for that too. So. Uh, if we want to go in that direction. So just to say, I'm happy to withdraw receipt of information if we want to do something more assertive. And then I think Councillor McKean was going to maybe make a suggestion there. So I'll, I'll stop and we can go to, uh, or I'll, I'll withdraw receipt of information. We can put it back if that's where we land, but <coughs> open up room. Uh, I don't know. Do we need a, you know, a, a vote on that or is that just a matter of uh, just need consent of the assembly to, to allow the withdrawal. Any objections? Not hearing any. Withdrawn, sir. All right. Uh, Councillor McKean, do you have any uh, suggestions for the mayor? Well, I want to ask a couple of more questions, if I might. Okay. Jenner. Um, so we have a bunch of housing agencies who do affordable housing in the city. Do they typically then, there's grants from various orders of government they, they uh, are able to attract do they end up with ownership of that uh, project then in the end? Uh, yes, typically. Um, if a nonprofit housing agencies in Edmonton apply to all three orders of government for capital grants to construct affordable housing, and they also um, seek private financing as well as a funding source. So, and in the, the Homer Trust is often an enabling agency so far as grants, yes? On the operating side, certainly, yes. Oh, on the operating side, okay. But a Homer Trust is also the owner of some of the projects, yes? Yes, they also ha um, have a development company arm that owns or holds assets owned by Homer Trust. Well, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I just think, uh, Madam Clerk, if you can assemble something. I can't make a motion, but I think the mayor was hinting. Uh, you know, I think uh, for administration to bring back a report in a year's time with a strategy on growing um, the number of in Indigenous owned affordable and supportive housing projects in Edmonton, uh, looking at um, barriers uh, that exist in, in current systems as well as opportunities um, through advocacy to other orders of government, tax policy, urban reserves, and other options as part of the strategy. And Mr. Mayor, I've just threw that, I threw a lot at the wall there, um, and I don't know if the clerk stepped up, and I'm, I'm happy to, hear your much more astute wordsmithing on motions. Uh, but I, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, thank you for your gracious latitude uh, on this issue, but I know this is near and dear to you as well. So thank you. Yeah, clerks. Sorry. Yeah, I go, go, go ahead, Mayor Edson. Yeah, clerks have proposed, let me just read this out, that administration prepare an Indigenous affordable housing strategy in the interest of reconciliation and city plan goals for a rebuildable, inclusive, and compassionate city. 
The strategy should include using engagement with Indigenous partners to identify existing gaps, inform program design, and develop targets, and return to committee with recommendations for programs that aim to prioritize or incentivize the development of Indigenous-led uh, affordable housing projects in Edmonton. Uh, and I would just uh, change between prioritize and incentivize the word or to uh, and or, because I think it might be both, um, uh, but, uh, but I think this covers the spirit of the conversation uh, and allows it to start to, to be actualized um, even before the report. You know, start going in this direction and, and report back rather than prepare it, but don't do anything before you come back a year from now, which I think would be a lost opportunity in, in what will be, I think, a fairly transformational year of, of housing portfolio growth. Uh, in this country and i think the indigenous housing providers here today and others um uh, have to be a part of that and we need to help so that's all i'll say but i think uh, hopefully that's satisfactory to Councillor mckean uh but uh, happy to happy to move that okay thank you uh any debate on this i would speak to it briefly at the right time uh mr chair Okay, well, before you speak to it, I'll just uh, say a couple of quick words then. Um, I understand that Q1 2022 is actually still an accelerated uh, response. It would be nice if it was faster simply because I see this also as an opportunity for um, investment in our city and some economic growth, some jobs. Uh, so that would actually be helpful and also um, to help us mitigate more of the same impacts that we see every winter. Um, by Q1 2022, we're going to be right back in the, in the thick of it again, uh, which is frustrating, but also it is good that we're seeing this movement. Uh, the last thing I guess I would say about this is that uh, uh, it's very important that we are very cautious with, uh, with money and with how we fund things, absolutely. My one concern here is that we are also dealing with uh, lives and sometimes... Um, as we have heard so many times, perfect gets in the way of good. And uh, I think there probably is a bit of a stomach among the public that things aren't perfect as long as we can make them good, especially in this arena. So thank you for this. Go ahead, Councillor McKean. Thank you. And I uh, thanks uh, to the mayor for putting that motion forward and some of the other stuff that I threw at the wall, I think can and will probably be looked at anyways whether it's taxes or urban reserves, which are coming up in another report. Um, I just want to thank our speakers and who I've talked to at different times over this issue. Uh, but it particularly, uh, if you don't mind, Dave, Dave Ward and representing Corolla at Ambrose Place. I know there's been a certain amount of frustration on their part, feeling like they couldn't uh, get a ride on that runaway train. And, and I'm hoping that this, um, provides further opportunity. They do amazing work. They do the creator's work there uh, day in and day out. And, um, you know, we, we, this, my ward has been haunted by homelessness and it started to spread out all over the city. And, uh, you know, full, one of the reasons for the one year delay on this is because our administration has been working flat out and done tremendous work. You know, Jackie and Crystal and Rachel Putt. It was so good to see Rachel on this today, by the way. I know you'll be embarrassed for me mentioning your name, but can't help it. Uh, you've been doing tremendous work. And, and, and we want you to focus on those five projects. And hopefully uh, you'll be able to involve some of the people that were speaking here today in those five. Um, but I, I, I'm just so proud of of this city council and this administration for the work that has been done in a really expedited matter. You know, I've been telling the media recently that this is historic, the amount of work that has been done this quickly under Mayor Don Iverson's leadership and with 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 um, the work of people like, uh, well, all of you, but Michael Walters, I always have to mention him because he's done really good work on this too. So. I'm really proud of you guys, and I think this is just another step to make our our uh, 
affordable and supportive housing goals a little more strategic and nuanced and fair and just. And uh, Dave, I'll be bringing another tour through there soon, I'm sure. So be ready. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Uh, see no one else, so let us go ahead and vote. Yes. Councillor Zadig? Yes. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Common sense rules the day. That is unanimous. Thank you very much and thank you for all your work. That is phenomenal. Couldn't be more proud of all the uh, folks that uh, Councillor McKean just listed, including Councillor McKean. Okay, so let us move on now uh, to the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls National Inquiry Item 6.3. And uh, I understand there is a presentation available and we also have uh, folks registered to speak. So we'll start with administration and then move on. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for this item, we have uh, Jackie Ford, branch manager, social development, and joining us as well, some of her staff, uh, Jimmy Miller, our director of indigenous relations, and Jenny Kane, our director of safe and healthy communities, both in Ms. Ford's uh, branch. Report, report uh, before committee this afternoon provides an overview of the city's approach to responding to the national inquiry's calls for justice. As noted in the inquiry's final report, and I do quote here, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis women, girls, and 2S LGBTQQIA people in Canada have been the targets of violence for far too long. End of quote. The calls for justice outline the actions needed to address a variety of issues impacting the lives, lives of Indigenous people. Pass it over to Jackie to continue the presentation. Thank you and good afternoon uh, committee members and councillors. Uh, to give some context to this uh, report, the National Inquiry was launched by the federal government in December of 2015 and work formally began in September of 2016. The final report was published on June the 3rd, 2019. The mandate was to investigate and report on the systemic causes of all forms of violence, including sexual violence. Underlying and underlying social, economic, cultural, institutional, and historical causes contributing to the ongoing violence and particular vulnerabilities of Indigenous women and girls in Canada. A national action plan was to be developed by June 2020, but has been delayed. At this point in time, we do not know when that report, the final report will be, or the action plan will be uh, released, but we are hopeful that it is this year. Statistically, we know that Indigenous women in particular face challenges and barriers in urban life at a disproportionately higher rate as a result of poverty, historical trauma, and violence. Currently, and as the Indigenous population in Edmonton continues to grow, it is absolutely imperative to acknowledge the multitude of issues identified in the calls for justice and respond in a meaningful and impactful way to ensure a safe and healthy city for Indigenous women, girls, and 2S LGBTQQIA people, as well as their families and communities. Now I'll now turn it over to Jamie. Thank you, Jackie. So, given the breadth uh, of this issue, uh, how can we make an impact as a municipality? And really, the only answer is that it has to be a collective effort. Within a municipal space, we know that there are key partners and stakeholders within the Indigenous community. Uh, we know that there are key institutions and governmental partner partners. We also know that there are key Indigenous governments and representative organizations that need to be involved in this effort. So externally, we understand that there will be numerous intersections with the calls for justice. Administration will need to be aware of and in some cases involved in the efforts and priorities of Indigenous governments, organizations, partners, 
the Edmonton Police Service, Orders of Government, Regional Municipal Partners, and Community Organizations. Discussions with other orders of governments will be essential and will continue as we move forward. And of course, the most important partners of all being the Indigenous women and girls and LGBTQ2S plus communities that face these disproportionate uh, numbers, uh, statistics of violence and discrimination. Next slide. The National Inquiry Final Report identifies 231 calls for justice. These calls for justice span all Canadians. It, there are calls directed specifically to police institutions, to orders of government, as well as to all Canadians, and calls relating specifically to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities. A preliminary review by administration found that 120 calls for justice are directed to all governments. And so we are currently undergoing a more detailed review to confirm which ones are specifically applicable to a municipality such as Edmonton. We also understand that there are calls for justice to all Canadians that we also need to look closely at. The work required to address the calls for justice cannot be done in isolation. Relationship building with critical Indigenous communities and stakeholders to ensure local solutions are developed will be important moving forward. When we think of our Indigenous framework and asking our city staff to take on the roles of listeners, connectors, partners and advocates, we know that this will be foundational in our municipal responses to the calls for justice of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry. And so what you see on the screen before you are some examples of key areas where work is underway within the corporation. And of course, these are not meant to be exhaustive or comprehensive, but again, a starting place for um, where work has started and where we, can, where we can continue to build on what we've started to do as a municipality. So in terms of implementation, um, we do plan on developing an implementation plan that is in alignment with the Indigenous framework as well as with other city strategic documents such as the city plan. We also know that we have critical pieces of work within the corporation such as our gender-based violence, gender violence initiative and the Safe Cities initiative. We need to, I think, understand and embrace some of the complexity with this work. When we talk about the systemic issues of racism, discrimination, the experience of colonization, poverty, historic trauma, these are not things that we can address in isolation as a city. And so that's why uh, I focus so much on those partnerships that we need throughout the community as well as with other institutions. In terms of establishing short, medium and long term actions, um, we will be reviewing where we can make some short-term gains in addressing the calls for justice, but we also recognize that addressing systemic issues is not something that can be done overnight. We also will continue to pay close attention to the development of a national action plan, the provincial action plan, and the work of the Alberta Joint Working Group on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. We also understand that there are impacts related to the economic recession and impacts of the pandemic are also things to keep in mind as we go forward. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to Jackie. And uh, I believe we have uh, members of the public who are uh, registered to speak and we can hear from them now and take your questions after. We do indeed. Uh, first up is April Eve Weiberg from Stolen Sisters and Brothers Action Movement. And you have five minutes, uh, and the floor is yours. Tatsai Kakio, Mayor Iveson, Council, and my fellow community members. My name is April Eve. I'm joining you today from the unceded Treaty 6 territory here in Amiskwishi, Wiskahigan, Edmonton, Alberta. I'm a proud mother of two brilliant and beautiful children. I'm an Edmontonian and member of the Mixu Cree First Nation Treaty 8. I'm an MMIWG family member, survivor, and founder of the Stolen Sisters and Brothers Action Movement, 
which is a local grassroots movement taking action and addressing the human rights crisis of missing, murdered, and exploited Indigenous people since 2007. I would like to acknowledge all of the family members, survivors, and advocates like my friend Muriel Stanley Venn that have helped us get to this point. I do not speak for all Indigenous people or MMIWG advocates. We do not all have the same opinion, nor do we have to. Our feelings and experiences vary. I'm an expert of my own experience and survival. It holds value. In my lifetime, I've overcome poverty, abuse, addiction, racism, homelessness, and sexual exploitation. At the age of 17, I became homeless in Edmonton. At that time, I reached out to local agencies and social services for help, but I was turned away and told I was old enough to fend for myself. Later on, I was targeted, groomed, and sexually exploited. I suffered for many years. Fast forward, by the grace of our creator, I was self-liberated from exploitation and rebuilding my life back in Edmonton. During that time, I started volunteering in community and after learning more about the crisis of MMIWG, the first Stolen Sisters Awareness Walk was born and the first walk, and it was the first walk in the province of Alberta, specifically raising awareness on the disproportionate number of missing, murdered and exploited Métis, Inuit, non-status and First Nation women and girls. The movement itself is entirely grassroots and therefore is not funded nor seeks any type of funding from business or government. The crisis of missing, murdered and exploited Indigenous people is bigger than any one factor. The National Inquiry's 231 calls for justice is complex and extensive. Like the National Inquiry, it was created as a response to the targeted activism by Indigenous people who became tired of the injustices and lack of empathy and support from Canadian society. All governments, federal, provincial, municipal, and Indigenous must work together to take action to address the key areas of concern, substandard human rights, inadequate child welfare, addictions and trauma treatment, media representation, health, wellness, safety, security, and justice. We need action, immediate and concrete actions that offer, offer realistic solutions to end the violence and injustices to end the legacy of genocide against Indigenous people once and for all. I have a vision that one day Edmonton will have proven itself through a healing journey of genuine reconciliation and hard work to be known internationally by becoming the safest and most welcoming city in Canada for all people, regardless of race, gender identity, age, culture, or faith. Here are some ways a city can implement and adopt the calls for justice into action a public awareness campaign that demonstrates how everyday Edmontonians can affect and maintain change to help transform systemic and societal values that have worked to maintain the colonial violence for the city to implement and adopt international human rights standards for Indigenous people by legislating the TRC's calls to action and the National Inquiry's calls for justice. A one-stop Indigenous hub for Indigenous people to learn about and access services and supports Public service announcements that promote the rich and diverse culture of Indigenous people, our strengths, successes, and contributions to society. Ban the display and sale of hate symbols in Edmonton, for example, the Confederate flag. Condemn all acts of racism and anti-Indigenous behaviours. Promote and support awareness projects like Edmonton's Okisakau Angel Way. Provide free, inclusive, culturally safe, and loving spaces for family members and survivors to continue to share their truths. Let's make history. Let's all put our hearts and minds together to be a part of the change. As Edmonton prepares for the 2021 nominations for mayor and council, it is important to acknowledge that the time for talk is over. We need action, immediate awareness and action within every sector, every system, by way of unprecedented policy and legislation reform. Our hearts cannot bear to lose another stolen sister or brother. I hi, Kanana Skompton. Thank you for your time. I wish you all wellness and safety, all my relations. Thank you, April Eve. Uh, my heart is beating outside my chest. All right, we'll now move to Rochelle Ben. Hello all, thank you um, for allowing me to speak today. Um, Councillors, mayor and fellow advocates, other um, uh, community representatives that are here. I was just noting that uh, we have three J's. So Jamie, Jenny, <laughs> uh, 
that is great. So yeah, I thank you. Um, so I'm thankful to be here on Treaty 6 territory, homeland of the Métis. I'm a proud Métis woman with deep, deep Métis roots on both my mom and dad's side. I'm the daughter of Muriel Stanley Venn and Albert Venn, both from east of Edmonton. I'm not a family member of missing or murdered women, and I honour those, those family members that uh, are in that situation. I work at an Aboriginal organization, the Institute for the Advancement of Aboriginal Women, or IAW for short, has worked on this topic for 25 years. I'm currently an active community member, participated in many city initiatives, and um, I'm the co-chair of the Alberta Joint Working Group on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Um, the previous discussion that was happening um, was really close to some recent work I've done on the expert, I was one of the members of the expert panel on affordable housing. Um, so all of the, the discussion previous was, was uh, very interesting and I think in line with a lot where the province is going as well. Um, uh, current initiatives we have are poverty reduction strategy, leadership skill development programs, employment and training programs, support services for women leaving federal correctional institutions, and a violence prevention program. I'm going to talk a little bit about some important po points on the uh, final report on the National Inquiry and, um, and then talk a little bit about some suggestions. Um, so the final report was released on June 3rd, 2019, um, and I was there. It was released in ceremony to governments and family members uh, were there to receive um, and, and pass over that knowledge. Um, it was very um, moving ceremony. Uh, the report includes comprehensive and final findings of fact. IAW was a party with national standing and presented a final submission of the changes needed. Our board has prioritized our recommendations and we continue to work on the implementation of those recommendations. This information has been shared uh, with Indigenous Relations and uh, so we work very closely with them. Um, the cause of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is systemic racial and gendered rights violations perpetrated historically and maintained today, designed, designed to displace from land, social structures and governance and to eradicate the existence, their existence, and it is called genocide. There is no accessible and reliable mechanism within the Canadian state to seek recourse and remedies for the violations of Indigenous women and girls' domestic and international human rights and Indigenous rights. The Canadian legal system fails to hold the state and state actors accountable. Indigenous women and 2S LGBTQQIA people have been displaced from their traditional roles in governance and leadership. This is particularly true in the development and delivery of services. And there are four general ways in which their experiences, uh, the witnesses told, were rooted in colonialism, both historic and modern forms of colonialism. These four pathways continue to enforce the historic and contemporary manifestations of colonialism that lead to additional violence. So when their historical and intergenerational trauma, social and economic marginalization, ignoring the agency and expertise of Aboriginal women and girls, and the lack of willingness to change. And just one point around that, witnesses widely acknowledge that governments and institutions failure to implement the many well-known and well-documented recommendations that advocates, community organizations, and government commissions have already demonstrated a lack of concern for the violence endured by Aboriginal women and girls. So the 231 calls for justice are legal imperatives. They aren't optional. Um, the proper prioritization and resourcing of solutions by Canadian governments must come with real partnerships with Indigenous people, 
that support self-determination in a decolonizing way. Calls for justice are to all governments, and its interpretation of these calls, all governments, refers to federal, provincial, territorial, municipal, and Indigenous governments. Services and solutions must be led by Indigenous governments, organizations, and people. Mm -hmm. um, so just some of the, um, the uh, suggestions that I had. The National Inquiry final report noted there is currently no means to enforce human rights violations. So I've been involved, Racism Free, Edmonton, the anti-discrimination work that's being done now, there is no, no recourse to enforce those human rights violations. So uh, that's, that's a suggestion and a, and a note that has to be taken forward. Great. Um, okay. I am sorry we're way over time. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We could listen to all day. Yeah, no problem. The clock doesn't Yeah, no problem. Okay. So uh, those are our speakers. I don't see anyone on the list for questions. Um, going once, going twice. What I would uh, ask uh, both speakers is um, if you have the text of what you wrote, would you mind sending it to counselors' offices and to administration? because they were filled with incredible suggestions and ideas. Would that be possible? Sure thing. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so we will now move to uh, questions of administration. And I'm not seeing any names come up on the board. Um, if I'm missing someone, give me a little wave or just hop in and use your voice. No? I, had okay. a, sorry, I just had a really quick question while we're here because uh, Ms. Miller and I were part of a meeting with uh, uh, through FCM um, with uh, some of the people that are working on this federally. And I just was curious to know if you've heard, I haven't heard anything more from that. And I'm just wondering if we've managed to maintain that connection or... Because uh, I know they were very interested in what we were doing and in working together with us on it. So I, I'm just curious to know where that would have gone, if anywhere. Uh, thank you, Councillor, for the question. Um, so actually, um, I would say it's not specifically through FCM, but there is a national group of municipal Indigenous relations uh, folks. And so I do participate... Um, bi-monthly on a national call with uh, staff from municipalities across the country working in Indigenous relations. And we've actually, in the last two months, formed a MMIWG subgroup um, where each municipality is given an opportunity to talk about how their municipality is going about addressing the, the calls for justice and the issues in their communities. And so... Um, you know, you may have seen in the news recently, for example, cities like Lethbridge, even, um, you know, cities like Vancouver and others. Vancouver's obviously, you know, been, been I would say, you know, a, a leader in some of these conversations around MMIWG, but we also see smaller municipalities like Lethbridge and others that are, that are also developing these plans. And, and I would just add that, um, you know, we, as a city of Edmonton, we, we have these wonderful partners like Rochelle and grassroots organizers like April, who uh, we have good relationships with and we talk to frequently. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to building off of the work that we've started with them and keeping that going and also finding new, new programs and things we can do together because I really think that we need to promote Indigenous women and girls in leadership and in mentorship opportunities. And that's something that really excites me and, and I think is a place where we can make a big difference as a city. Um, but of course, you know, as we, as we go along, um, we will also be implementing the Indigenous framework and so there will be these department specific action plans and so we will be having these conversations at department levels as well on how we can consider um, the issues of MMIWG in those department plans as well. Uh, great, thanks. I was, I, was, I was really more curious. My, my memory of, of, you know, SCM was really just the conduit in between to try and allow a connection between the, 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 the federal, um, the people that are working on the federal response and municipalities. So I wasn't expecting anything to go back through there, but 
but I think there was a real interest. I think it was expressed by the federal party that was there on on our input into what they should be doing as well as, as knowing what we were doing and how we could coordinate. So that's great to hear that that's happening. That's really just what I wanted to check on and see if anything more had happened with that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Um, I have a few questions of my own. Reading the report, um, I know that we had a, a number of the, these items of the uh, 120 calls directed to all governments that we are actually already working on at the City of Edmonton. And I'm wondering if there's some way to communicate that, to make a list, to show what our commitment is and what our efforts are surrounding uh, these uh, calls for justice. Thanks, thanks, Councillor. That's, that's a really good point. And actually, that's something that's come up as well in the development of the Indigenous framework as well, is that we do have these partnerships and we do have these programs that we work on together. And how can we be sharing that and, and communicating that uh, to city staff as well as to the community? And so I think, um, you know, having more opportunities to, to gather together, um, to bring people together to do perhaps annual check-ins and annual reports to council is, is something we're looking at with both MMIWG responses and the Indigenous framework. Um, but I'm certainly open to also, um, you know, hearing from Rochelle as well, ways that, that we can work together to um, talk about the great work that we're doing together, for example, on the Safe Cities Initiative, um, Indigenous Women's Safety in the City programs and things like that. Yeah, I think it's an opportunity to show, uh, show the commitment we already have, uh, but also to uh, sort of benchmark it in, in some ways, and in many ways, actually, and also show where we can where maybe we're lacking and we can fill those gaps uh, quite easily that uh, maybe our minds weren't on it, but then we realize, oh, wow, that's something we can actually do. Um, so that would be my suggestion. I don't know if that's uh, from the sounds of, sounds of it, that's something you'd like to do. Yeah. Okay. Of course. So uh, my next question, and frankly, it's just part of uh, good communication. Uh, so, my next question then would be um, uh, how are like following along that, how are we actually going to move forward now? We've got this report. I'm not sure if you need any direction or if you're going, if this is self-directed work that administration is already engaged in. So we are working away at uh, what we're calling an implementation plan counselor. So I would say that, um, you know, if you give us an opportunity to, to go away for a little bit, um, do our work, particularly with these department teams, as well as with our community partners like Rochelle and others, um, we could come back with uh, a follow-up maybe in, uh, f you know, later in, in 2021 to, to give you an update on this, this information report and the progress we're making uh, with, That's our, with our plan. That's great. If the clerks want to draft that up, I'm happy to make that motion. Um, and uh, so while we wait for it, I'll speak to a uh, conceptual motion that is forming uh, to introduce it. Um, this is a serious issue. This is actually a stain on Canadian society. Um, and it's been here from the start of our history. And there are people who get upset about these things. Um, and Councillor McKean doesn't like the R word. No one likes the R word, but sometimes if something appears to be uh, racist, it's okay for us to call it out. If we don't, we can't recognize it. We can't do anything about it. And part of that it isn't even mean-spirited. It just comes from a lack of understanding or a lack of knowledge. And this is an opportunity for us to expand that so that people understand the true history of their place and not have to feel ashamed, but understand that there's work to do because of it. Um, and this is a constant, constant, uh, conversation that we have, um, and a constant requirement to explain to people that because we are focusing on this does not mean that we are not focusing on other issues. It doesn't mean that other people's, uh, needs, frustrations, fears, angers aren't heard. They are. Um, but this is an issue that is desperately needed. Um, I do come from a family um, 
I do come from a family where we have been impacted by uh, the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women. And that kind of pain cannot be adequately expressed. What I will say about that is that if a person, if a, if a political leader is not operating from their heart, if their heart is not involved in their politics, if their heart does not bleed for the suffering of others, they have no position in that chair. And they should not be here. It's that simple. There are atrocities that are beyond imagining that have happened in our history that we have not heard about, that have been whitewashed, that have been swept under the rug. And what we are doing here is we're bringing daylight to dark places, and in that way we can transform. And that's a good thing. We should be celebrating it. And I celebrate the work you've done. Thank you so much. And uh, I see we've got uh, the motion on, on board, so I will read it in. That administration provide an update on the response to the call for justice outlined in the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls National Inquiry final report and the development of an implement, implementation plan uh, to come back in the third quarter of 2021. And uh, at this point, because it's up on the board, if anyone has anything to say, uh, now is the time. Okay, well with that, oh, Siri had something to say. I will turn her off uh, somehow. There's nothing to stop here. Check the <laughs> There's nothing to stop me, apparently. So, uh, <laughs> you know what? Sometimes I need that validation. So uh, with that, let us vote. And uh, because I had to close my device, I will vote uh, uh, with my voice, yes, and with my heart. And uh, um, as we wait for the votes to come in, I will mention that uh, Mayor Iveson sent his regards. He's uh, very uh, saddened that he had to leave. He had a pressing appointment uh and uh he thanks everyone for their efforts uh your vote bot has gone down madam clerk or mr <laughs> clerk so i'm a yes thank you and Councilor zadik yeah i'm also a yes <laughs> all right That's all the votes please display the vote and that is unanimous okay so that gives us just enough time, perhaps, uh, to get to vehicle noise enforcement pilot program results. And, uh, but we will have to um, bump item 610 uh, if anyone wants to go ahead with that. I'm actually wondering, we had a registered speaker, so I don't know if I could just move to refer it to a, another council meeting. That gives them a chance to maybe engage with the speaker and uh, see if there's an opportunity to. Oh, you had a speaker. I did not. I was not aware of that. Okay. So, so I'll move to. I think probably refer it to a, a future committee meeting, which opens up that option to. Okay. Yeah. That that sounds good. Are there, is there any objection to that? With apologies to a speaker who's probably been patiently waiting. Mr. Chair, if the intent is for administration to be able to do some more work on this, I would suggest that it be referred back to administration to return. Otherwise, the report stays as is and then continues on to the next meeting. Is that the motion you're making, Councillor? Sorry, that's what I, that's what I uh, mentioned. Uh, sorry, I, I must have not said it there properly. So, yeah, the, the intent was so that they could go and reach out to the, uh, the registered speaker, who I know sent a sort of last-minute note and uh, had some questions that I felt, uh, that felt were answered as best they could have been. So it might just be worth giving them that chance. Okay, very good. Uh, I guess we'll vote. I'll just vote. Uh, with an audible yes yes so uh, andrew you're moving it to, uh, to another meeting or referring back to do what uh to primarily just to engage the speaker so i think this could just be a referral to the next committee meeting okay. uh, and then they can provide a verbal update no thanks yeah okay so i'm a yes 
Okay. And I think that's all the votes. Display the vote, please. And that is unanimous. And so our last item is the uh, vehicle noise enforcement. And uh, there is the possibility that we may have to extend if that's okay with folks. If not, uh, I'm not sure what our options are, but. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I cannot extend past 5.30 as I have several meetings this evening. Okay, yeah, I've, I'm actually overlapping a meeting right this second. Uh, so, well, we've got 15 minutes. Uh, I'll, I'm happy to get some uh, recommendation from committee. Well, if, if there are a number of speakers, I don't know if it'd be wise to begin. So I, I'm wondering if we can refer. We have to go to 6.45 to finish this, or yeah. 5.45, sorry. Uh, while I could, I've heard others can't. So I think it's probably best to move it to um, uh, the next Although I'm hearing we're already pretty tight, but we can make it time specific. Yeah, we can make it time specific. Um, I think we've probably got an hour of work on our docket. Uh, so we should be able to make it work. Mr. Chair, I'll just apologies. caution that the next meeting is a half day meeting and we've referred um, 6671 as well as 610 now. Yeah, it's starting to pack up. Uh, Okay, so we've got two options where we refer this not to the next meeting, but the meeting after. Uh, we, uh, we send it up to council or we uh, just go ahead and extend orders today. Those are our three options. On a point of privilege uh, or order, Mr. Chair, you, yep. might, you might also hear from speakers, I don't know how many you have, and then requisition it to council. Um, I'm happy with that. If ever, if uh, everyone else is amenable, yes. Okay, good. Uh, any objections? All right, let's rock and roll. Uh, thank you, Councillor McKean, for the wonderful suggestion. Um, we uh, let's see. There is an information report, but I I've heard that it's very brief. I think, Councillor, in the uh, limited time, we should go right right to the speakers. We can skip Fact over that. the presentation. Let's do that. Okay. So, first up, uh, the very patient, Bruce Clark. Yep. Um, you can hear me? We can hear you. Great. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to the excessive noise issue on behalf of the residents of Brandon Green. Next slide. What makes excessive noise an important issue for the city? Well, one of the key focuses of the city's strategic plan is to make its central core a more livable environment, thus encouraging citizens to live there. The positive impacts are the reduction of urban sprawl, providing a walkable environment, and huge savings in infrastructure, just to name a few. Excessive noise is a main discourager for citizens deciding to live in the central core. We know many people who have shunned away from moving downtown due to this issue. And we are all aware of the large body of research regarding the negative impact of excessive noise on the mental health of citizens. Next slide. What are then the essential takeaways from the report? Well, we consider the 335 noise-related violations charged under Project Tensor to be significant. And we'd like to thank Sergeant Bates for his diligence in effectively implementing this project. We note that the enforcement of equipment-related issues was not an effective deterrent. And the shift to enforcement by peace officers is a meaningful step forward. Unexpected challenges were experienced uh, also with the noise monitoring equipment. And one of the most important takeaways from this project is the improved collaboration among the various enforcement groups. Next slide. Here is the unfortunate result after all of this well-intentioned effort. Grand and Green rev residents have not observed any improvement in the incidence of excessive noise in the past year. In fact, some residents believe 
The noise last summer and fall was worse than previously. Next slide. This brings us to the question, so where do we go from here? And the residents of Grand and Green offer the following comments and recommendations. First of all, it's important to note that we do not disagree with any of the report's next steps. Our ex expectations are threefold. Make excessive noise a high priority issue. Number two, set a firm timeline for resolution. Number three, make the result measurable for all to see and hear. Next slide. We wish to reiterate our position that traditional enforcement is not the long-term solution. Similarly, education of these motorcyclists and motor motorists is a difficult undertaking. And we urge you to continue with the implementation of fully automated noise enforcement. This seems to be a long-term cost-effective solution. If we can put a man on the moon, we can make fully automated noise control equipment work. And we trust that city administration will continue worldwide jurisdictions, <clears throat> will include worldwide jurisdictions in the review of other municipalities' tactics. For example, our research indicates that the Paris, France suburb of villeneuve de Rois is currently testing automatic noise radar equipment. Well, we further recommend implementing the EPS Community Solutions Accelerator Program to this issue. We are aware this program resulted in a 97% decrease in liquor store robberies in those stores that participated. Next slide. We also suggest considering the initiation of regulations and or legislation to prohibit changes to vehicles and the sale of parts that deliberately increase noise. We know this is already being done in other municipalities, and we encourage and support interjurisdictional collaboration when necessary. Our final comment is a recommendation, and we feel it's our best one. We urge City Council to establish a, an excessive noise task force that includes members of the City's Citizen Services Department, enforcement officials, <clears throat> and concerned citizens to develop and recommend a once and for all solution to the excessive noise issue. And the good news, Grand and Green residents are volunteering. Next slide. Thank you very much for your time. We think we're making progress. Let's move to a timely resolution. Thank you. We do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Uh, Pamela Heichel. Mr. Chair, Pamela was not able to stay. Okay. Uh, Mark Wilson. Hello. 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 Thank you, uh, thank you, Councillors and uh, committee members for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Mark Wilson. I operate a shop on Treaty 6 Territory here on White Avenue. Um, I have served on the executive of the Old Strathcona Business Association and currently serve as the president of the Garner Community League. Um, while I'm not speaking on behalf of those groups, uh, I, I'm providing feedback that I hear on a, a regular basis. By far the single biggest complaint uh, I hear from area residents, uh, customers and neighboring business is, is noise. Um, the noise hurts businesses in our community that are already struggling uh, due to the pandemic, especially those of our neighbors who are relying on patios. Um, with the success of our extended sidewalk program in the area, we find more people are enjoying the avenue with the increased pedestrian areas. Um, no one wants to enjoy a meal with a car revving feet away from where they're sitting. Um, and, and in the before times, uh, we would often hear our customers expressing frustration with the ear-splitting noises they enjoyed the Saturday afternoon or evening here on the avenue. Uh, also with the noise comes stunting and speed related issues. In a pedestrian friendly area such as ours, the loss of vehicle control from this behavior could have devastating consequences. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen the videos circulated online from last summer with vehicles drifting and stunting out of the United Cycle parking lot, narrowly avoiding collisions with onlookers and other vehicles on Gateway Boulevard. Uh, for our community residents, it's causing folks to lose sleep at night uh, or impact their enjoyment of uh, sitting outside during our annoyingly short summer months. 
the noise in our community, uh, and this is not an exaggeration, is nonstop in the evenings and weekends. And I see via the magic of social media that this is not just an issue in central Edmonton, it's an issue across the city. Uh, Tensor and the noise pilot have, have improved the situation. I see via local car enthusiast forums that it has gone some distance in modifying some behaviors. Also interesting to note uh, from looking at these forums, and while only anecdotal observation, uh, it seems that many in these groups who are upset about noise enforcement aren't resident to Edmonton. They are residents of bedroom communities surrounding the city, so a lot of the people who are upset aren't even residents of the city. Um, it does seem that noise measurement and noise bylaw solutions have had challenges in both implementation and enforcement, and at times made it difficult to obtain successful prosecutions uh, due to the subjective nature of noise. Also, the delay in ticket processing has also reduced effectiveness. 60 days to resolve an issue means that the noise violations can continue in the intervening two months until they're required to show an inspection. Additionally, due to COVID, a number of the court dates have been pushed back to 2022, uh, further reducing the effectiveness of the current uh, method of enforcement. Um, I appreciate that all the work that has been done on this pilot, uh, but it seems that relying solely on the noise bylaw and automated enforcement still isn't reducing the noise violations to a, to a more reasonable level. I'd hazard the uh, Venn diagram of noisy vehicles and non-street legal vehicles as a single circle. Um, by pursuing noise control by equipment violations under the Highway Traffic Act, the legislation surrounding that is clear, it's likely easier to enforce, and less objective probably in the eyes of the courts. Um, and I did note that via the City of Calgary website that the option of seizing plates exists until such time that a non-compliant vehicle is made roadworthy. I would suggest that the cost of a tow and not being able to enjoy one's ride until such time that it is made street legal would be more of an incentive for ensuring compliance. While I realize this may be a bit more drastic uh, and heavy-handed measure, this approach may be more effective even if applied over a short term uh, in order to achieve long-term goals. That's all I have. Great. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And uh, our last speaker, David Jenkinson. Hi there. How are you? Good. How are you? Fine, thank you. Um, thanks for letting me talk. Uh, I was on this morning, and I wasn't sure if I'd be able to make it back for the afternoon, so I sent an email to the city clerk that I believe she sent to all the councillors, but I'll just sort of update it real quick. Um, I live on Saskatchewan Drive, just above Queen Elizabeth Park Road. Uh, I've lived there since 2000. I own it. And uh, the amount of noise is just amazing uh, of people racing down the hill. Um, I'm just going to see my notes here. Um, Every spring, I call the city or I call uh, the, the police department, and they say, Well, it's sort of a 311 issue. So I call 311. They say it's an EPS issue. Um, I've spoken to Councillor Henderson about it several times via email, and he's, he understands. I think he has a problem near his, his house, too. Uh, he and his assistant, Jerry, they're really good at getting back to me, but I think their hands are sort of tied with um, um, what to do there. Uh, let's see. Um, I, th I think we need visible enforcement, uh, either at Endo Steel Park or Tommy Banks Way. If there is an EPS car or a peace officer car, I think it's sort of like, you know, when you go past a speed trap, if you see a, a speed vehicle, you're going to slow down because you don't want to get a ticket. And I think word would maybe get around to the van people that they're going to get trouble for what they're doing. Let's see. Um, it's, it's it's almost impossible to sleep uh, if, if you can't really have your windows open in the summertime um, and it's hot to have them closed. Uh, as uh, as someone told Councillor McKean recently, um, you know, at least it's winter time now, so I can I won't hear the racing. Uh, there have been a few near misses and a few little accidents on Queen Elizabeth Park Road. One car hit the guardrail once. One car what a year ago went over and had to be pulled out. And uh, the racers, will, they'll cut off. Everyone who's driving a normal speed, they'll get cut off by the racers. Um, let's see. Also, then, with resale value, I've spoken to two, not that I want to sell right away or anything, but I've had two realtors say that the amount of noise coming that I hear in my place would be detrimental to selling. Uh, and lastly, uh, I agree with the last speaker, White Avenue is just horrible. I, I, I can't go on White Ave without earbuds or earplugs. And I have friends who visit in the city, visit from other places, and they say, it's really noisy here. What's going on? And I can't imagine what it's like for a little kid. You know, you know as, as the gentleman is speaking about uh, diners, 
like just all of a sudden this horrible rev and and it's it's absolutely horrible um i think that's about it just uh i love edmonton i'm not leaving but uh i really need your help thank you Thank you. A good summation of the frustrations. Well, that takes a time. Uh, I believe that uh, we may have a, a a motion to refer. Can we ask questions quickly? Uh, you know what? If we can have a motion, we to won't have a otherwise. Of this, of right. not, not of administration of the speakers. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was just we're at five thirty, but uh, I, I understand. But you know. Um, I mean, oh, I'm happy to extend. We've made, it, we've, made it, we've made it a year and a half for this report to come back. I think yeah, absolutely. dignity of allowing the speakers a quick set of questions. I just have a couple of quick ones. All right. You know what? I will move to extend uh, for five minutes. Uh, any objections? No? Okay. Go ahead, Councillor. Uh, I, I have to leave, Mr. Chairman. My uh, meetings have been booked for a while, and regardless, we've had all day. I'm sorry for the speakers. I understand. I yeah, understood. Uh, Mr. Wilson, uh, I'll just go to you quickly because I think, um, I, you know, when we did enforce from this summer, and it took us a while to get it going, the important point is, I think you said, is we did actually, it didn't make it perfect, but it improved it. Yeah, no, we yeah. did notice, we did notice some early reduction. Uh, however, uh, very quickly they would post the positions of the of the traps onto their onto yeah. their onto their groups, so they knew how to avoid it, or they got past the trap and then just simply sped down White Avenue or 109th yeah. Street. So it continued yeah. on even though that enforcement was there. Yeah. So, because, and I'm interested in one other thing because we have asked questions about this before, so it's interesting you have information that Calgary's doing it. I mean, it, the, the, the Traffic Safety Act says it very clearly that, that modifying your muffler to make noise or make flame is illegal. Um, so I have always wondered why we cannot pull the vehicles off the road. I've been told the Act doesn't quite give us that power, but you're saying Calgary's doing that? It, uh, there's, on, their, on their website, there's an indication where they say they can take away a plate if the, if the vehicle is not street legal. I imagine it works the same, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know, but I imagine it's the same way the uh, commercial... Uh, uh, vehicle enforcement program works if the, if the if the vehicle isn't street legal or is in in not yep. roadworthy then it gets pulled and that's always been my reading of the act but, but our lawyers have said something different so i think it might be worth figuring finding out what calgary's doing on that one uh thanks those are my two quick questions i you know and i want to thank you for coming i know we keep on asking you to come back on this this has been a 10 year long crusade that um that that you've suffered through so uh we're gonna i i think there's some good news in this report and there's some frustrating news in this report. We'll get a chance to come back and talk about this and ask questions of, uh, of administration and council. So thank you. Thanks uh, committee for that extra time. I just, there were just a couple of things that I wanted to get to. Oh, absolutely. And a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to our speakers. Uh, really sad that we've got to cut this discussion in half, but we're grateful for your submissions. And of course you emailed to us, which is fantastic. So yeah. we'll go over that as well and administration will also receive that. Um, Thank you, councillors. At this point, uh, I think we're about done. I just want to give a very, very uh, special thank you to administration for all the hard work uh, represented today in our many discussions. I want to thank the public for being so engaged, and I want to thank uh, my uh, fellow councillors for uh, your attention and your presence today. I think that this was a huge team effort citywide, so go team and uh, go have dinner. Uh, sorry, oh, Mr. Chair, I just think we need to requisition it yeah. up to oh, council. I'm not requisitioned it yet. Oh, oh, I, I will say re requisition. I ask for notices without motion. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I, I just need to say, one other person needs to say requisition, so requisition. Requisition, Zadik. There you go. And it is done. All right, so uh, any notice of motion without customary notice? Not hearing any. I did not get any. Uh, uh, no private reports. Um, no motion spending. We are adjourned. Have a good